This is Audible. Surviving the Evacuation, Book 14, Mort Vivant, written by Frank Tail, narrated by Tim Bruce. The story so far, day 258, the 26th of November, The New World, The Celtic Sea. There's no finesse in the truth, Mary said, and this truth is a hard one to hear. She added the handwritten copy of the radio report to the pile of papers and maps littering the cabin's small table. What shall we do? Kim asked. Do? What can we do? Mary said. They reported half their fishing boats returned with empty nets. Well, I know nothing of the sea, so don't know if a poor catch is due to the weather or if it's a harbinger of something worse. As for this recent attack by the undead, what help can we offer? This ship is overcrowded as it is, with no room for more passengers. We don't have any ammunition to spare. If what happened to us in Dundalk is a guide to the future, we'd be using the rifles as clubs within three days of reaching France. No, if Elysium is untenable, it'll have to be abandoned. And they have enough small boats to do it. The best thing we can do is continue to France. Though the undead attacked again during the night does worry me. Kim said. After finding those dead zombies in Dundalk, I thought this nightmare was over. I thought the zombies were dying. No, I was sure they're dying. They are dying, Mary said. It simply won't happen overnight. What's that expression young Bran uses? Hurry up and wait. That's a lesson for us all. Now, where's that map of Greece? The door opened. Knock, knock, Annette said. Good try, Kim said, but next time have a go actually knocking and do it before you open the door. Where's Daisy? Oh, she's with Mirabelle, Dee Dee and Ken. They're writing subtitles. Subtitles for what? Mary asked. The last two episodes of my show don't have them, Annette said. They're translating from the Japanese. They know Japanese? Kim asked. Not really, Annette said. But they've seen the show a bazillion times. They know it by heart. And do you think translating a cartoon about vampires in a boarding school is the best use of their time? Kim said. It's not a cartoon, Annette said. It's anime. There's a difference. And they volunteered. I didn't ask them. And we've been working for hours, all of us. We needed a break. If that's how they want to spend their time off, who am I to stop them? Anyway... We finished going through the notebooks we found in Dundalk. And what did you find, dear? Mary asked. First, that we didn't find all the books, Annette said. I think Thomas took some away. That's what I'd do. Thomas? Kim asked. Thomas Allen Murphy, Annette said. That's his name. Tam's from the initials. I called Dundalk and spoke to Siobhan. It's the same guy that travelled with him. I know, I know, she added. You said we should tell her face to face. But when we get a chance to do that? We're on our way to France and she's in Dundalk with the Admiral and Sholto. It might be weeks before we see them again, and I thought it was important that someone look for Tam's other notebooks. And why do you think it's important? Mary asked patiently. Tam and his people were waiting for reinforcements, Annette said. They wanted to make Dundalk a fortress. Obviously they didn't and they left by sea, but the notebooks I found don't say where they were going. That's why I wanted Siobhan to look for more. If we can find out where they went, we could look for them. That's a better idea than Tasmania. Tasmania? Kim asked. Now you've really lost me. Haven't you heard? Annette said. It's the sweepstake. And you've lost me too, dear, Mary said. What sweepstake? Down in the engine room. You're not meant to go down there, Kim said. And I wouldn't have, but I was trying to find Katrina, Annette said. You know, Katrina, the cat? Hmm, maybe Tabitha is a better name, but she's not really a tabby. Anyway, they've been betting on where we'll find other survivors. Tasmania has the best odds because of how Australia had its own evacuation. Maybe so, Mary said. But it's too far for us to travel by sea. 
I doubt we find another plane any time soon. No, we could get there, Annette said. The new world could, I asked. We'd have to reduce the weight a bit, leave some people behind. But we could reach Australia. And how would we get back? Mary asked. No, our future lies in the Mediterranean. We'll send an expedition across the Atlantic so the Admiral can fulfil the oath she made to her people, but we'll find our new home somewhere warm and somewhere far closer. And you've been working out where? Annette asked, picking up a map. We've been working out which islands would be worth investigating, Kim said. That will enable us to plot a route, and thus we can calculate how long it will take and how much fuel we'll need. But we're going to find Bill first, aren't we? Annette said. Of course, Mary said. Too often on Anglesey, we were reacting to disasters with barely enough time to think, let alone plan. We shall not repeat that mistake. So now, while we have a little time, we're getting a head start on the work. Yeah, OK, Annette said. And that's why I came here. You see, it was those notebooks of Tam's. Most of them are about the people who've died. It's seriously dark stuff. A lot of it's kind of depressing. That got me thinking that we sort of do the same. We never talk about the people who are alive, you know. So I thought that's what we should do. Put together the stories of all the people who are alive. I thought you were writing a history book, Kim said. Yeah, and that's what this will be, Annette said. A proper history of all of us. I started with Bill. He was easy. That got me thinking about the other people on the plane. Chester wasn't too difficult because he told me some of his stories about life in the Tower of London while he was staying with us on Anglesey. All I know about Mr Higson is that he's a good pilot and better baker. I don't know anything at all about Sergeant Khan or Private Kessler. Kim nodded. Annette wanted reassurance that Bill was OK. Salmon Khan is a very experienced Marine, Mary said. One of the Admiral's best. When Sarah Herlock returned with Chester from Birmingham, I asked the Admiral for a most reliable military professional to watch her. She gave me the sergeant and said he was worth an entire squad. Private Kessler might be a more recent recruit, but she's just as competent and reliable. She was with Major Lewis in Belfast, part of the expedition who went to collect the fuel tankers from the airport. Oh, yeah, I remember, Annette said. That's when the Major died. OK. But since you wanted guards for her, you can't have trusted Soraka Locke. He didn't, Mary said, and I doubt he ever will. She was Lisa Kempton's deputy. I'm still unclear as to the extent of Locke's involvement in the apocalypse, but suspect it was considerable. According to Thaddeus, Kempton helped finance Quigley's operation, providing planes and other logistical support where using military or government resources would have been too noticeable. In return, Kempton had been given the contract to mass produce the vaccine. Of course, that was before it caused the outbreak. No, I can't say I trust Locke. When I spoke to her, she offered no remorse nor even regrets. However, actions speak louder than words. She helped those people in Birmingham. I believe she's changed in the last ten months. But you still had guards for her, Annette said. The guards were to keep her safe. Not to stop her escaping, Mary said. I was worried what the general population would do, what type of revenge they might seek. That's why I offered her a sailing boat and supplies, so she could go wherever she wanted. But she didn't want to leave. Or she wanted to go back to Belfast, Annette said. Maybe that's why she didn't want a boat. Possibly, Mary said. She's seen what the world has become, and how few people are left. I think she wants to make amends, though she is the kind of woman who'll never admit as much. No, I don't trust her. I certainly don't like her. But she isn't a threat to us, or to Bill. The opposite, in fact, since she's as well trained as Sergeant Khan and as experienced in surviving the horrors of our world as Bill or Chester. With Mr. Hexen, they have an excellent pilot and exceptional mechanic. I'm sure he can repair a car or a truck. In fact, I wouldn't be surprised if, when we reach France, we find them waiting for us. Yeah, maybe, Annette said. Except they haven't called in. 
It's been five days we've not heard from them. They have a sat phone. They should have called us by now. They had a sat phone, Kim said. They must have landed far from the coast, out of range. And that's confirmed by the fact the satellites haven't found any sign of them yet. But wherever they landed, they would have headed towards the coast, Annette said. They should be in range by now. As you say, it's been five days, Kim said. The phone's run out of power and they have no way of recharging it, no. I'm not worried. You're not? Nor should you be, Mary said. Worrying never does us any good. Now, earlier you said you were looking for your cat. Did you find her? Oh, no, not yet. Perhaps you should continue your search, Mary said. I just saw Commander Crawley walk past that window, and he didn't look as if he was in a good mood. Go on. Annette hurried away, leaving Mary and Kim alone. And there's no point you worrying either, dear, Mary said. Easy to say, Kim said. She picked up a map of the French coast. It's such a long coastline. We don't even know where they crashed. Now we've left Belfast, now that we might abandon Elysium, and the Admiral's certainly going to leave Dundalk. If we don't find him, if he sets off on his own to return to Ireland, he won't find any of us there. I know, dear, Mary said. I know. Chapter One The Crash Five Thousand Feet Above France Outside the plane's cockpit, the snow-covered landscape was an irregular geometry of tall trees, flat mounds and curving hills, zipping by impossibly fast. Can we land on snow? Bill Wright asked, rubbing the stumps of his missing fingers. His leg, which had never properly healed after the break sustained at the beginning of the outbreak, throbbed in time with a vibration from the plane's engines. He could blame the altitude, the speed, but the real cause was fear. They were trapped in a plane that they couldn't steer, flying over France where there were no known friendly faces, let alone runways. He could call it a landing, but the reality was that a crash was a certainty in their imminent future. Land on snow, he is hoping. Scott Hickson said. Now that we've dumped the fuel, we're flying on fumes. In twenty minutes, we'll drop like a rock. Look for a road, a motorway, anything. I can only see snow. I can't tell what's beneath, Bill said. Wait, there's smoke. Two degrees to the left, do you see? Hickson snapped his head to the left, before returning his darting gaze to the instrument panel. Yep, sure, looks like smoke, the middle-aged Australian pilot said. His tone was calm, but his face was a rigid mask, except for a vein throbbing at the side of his weather-beaten face. With snow blanketing the landscape from here to the horizon, a fire has to be deliberate, Bill said, peering at the thin plume rising from the horizon. It has to be people. Not necessarily, Scott said through gritted teeth. Can you see the fire? No, there's still too much daylight. I think there's a river, some buildings. Might be a... No, it's gone. Or we have. We've flown past. Was it a town? Scott asked. Possibly. The tree cover was too dense for it to be a city, Bill said. But I definitely saw smoke. Can you bring us down here? Here and now? You sure? We'll have to come down soon. But we'll only get one more shot at this. We can't change our minds this time. Like you said... We're coming down soon whether we want to or not, Bill said. Then hold on, Scott said, flipping a series of switches on the control panel. Hold on, he yelled through the propped open cockpit door. The plane juddered. The plane shuddered. The plane shook as Scott dipped the nose. Outside, the snow-smoothed drifts swiftly turned into jagged peaks uneven valleys and far, far too many trees as the ground neared quickly. Too quickly. Far, far, far too quickly. Not yet, Scott muttered. Not yet. Bill saw trees and snow, and a lumbering figure that was immediately lost to sight. Now, here we go, Scott said. Bill gripped the edge of the seat, 
preemptively gritting his teeth as the pilot dragged the nose up. The window filled with clouds bisected by a distant blue line on the far horizon. No, 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 no! Scott intoned. His invocation began as a mutter, but rose to a scream. Before Bill could ask what fresh disaster had been thrust upon them, the rear of the plane clipped the ground. It was thrown forward, then up and back as the aircraft slammed into the snow. As they ploughed through the field, a kaleidoscope of white ice and brown dirt sprayed across the windows, mercifully obscuring the view of the trees they had no way of avoiding. Without sight as a distraction, his brain filled with the sounds that in turn filled the dying plane. Rivets popped, bolts snapped, panels clattered loose. A screeching grind bounced around the cockpit. From the cabin came a prayer, a yell, a muted scream. The roar of the engines abruptly died, replaced by a rending screech as metal was torn asunder. Then, as quickly as it had begun, the wall of sound collapsed and the plane shuddered to a creaking halt. Bill exhaled and allowed himself to relax into the seat. I got broke a tooth. Still, it could have been worse, he said, a lot worse. Cockpit window hasn't broken. Is it a stupid question if I ask whether there's any chance this plane will fly again? Scott? Scott? Bill twisted in his seat, wincing as a flash of pain shot from his neck to his leg, but that was instantly forgotten as he saw the pilot. Scott was slumped in his seat. His head lolled to the side. Blood dripped across his forehead and along his nose. Scott? Did you hear me? Bill asked, fumbling with the harness's release. Scott? Free, Bill pushed himself over to the pilot's chair. Scott! The pilot groaned. You're alive. Good, Bill said. You have a cut on your forehead, but it doesn't look deep. And now he was out of his depth. He looked for a med kit, caught sight of the familiar white cross on a red background emblazoned on a metal door, opened the narrow locker, and found it was empty. Hold on, he said. He had to shoulder barge the buckled door to get into the cabin. Into the remains of the cabin. The tail section had been torn free, revealing a view of snow-white fields beyond the ruined plain. Everyone okay? he asked. Or is that a stupid question? It's a question I get asked far too often, Chester Carson said. The large Londoner unbuckled his seatbelt and stood up. The plane groaned, tilting to starboard. At least we're not on fire, Soraka Locke said, running a hand through her close-cropped greying hair before checking her palm for blood. We're alive, U.S. Marine Sergeant Salman Khan said. Private? Private Amber Kessler, report. Yeah, I'm fine, Amber Kessler muttered. The pilot's not, Bill said. He's injured, bleeding. Did anyone pack a first aid kit? Yeah, Khan said. The grizzled marine unclipped his pack from the seat next to him and fished out a small grey plastic box. It's just the essentials. Give it to me, Locke said. Unless your medical experience extends beyond policy documents, Mr. Wright. Bill stepped aside to let the Irish woman pass, then continued down the narrow aisle to the ripped open rear of the plane. Could be worse, he said. A frigid wind whistled through the broken cabin windows. Though not by much. Sergeant, can you and the private check outside, see if we can spy a farmhouse or something? We saw some smoke just before we landed, but... I don't know how far we've travelled since then. I sir, Khan said. On your feet, private? Time to earn our retirement. The young Californian groaned, but she followed the sergeant down the aisle and out into the snow. Bill turned back to the cabin. When Scott said he'd stripped the plane for weight, he wasn't kidding. The pilot had removed all but ten seats the doors to the overhead lockers, and even some of the panelling. Locke stepped out of the cockpit. Mr. Higson has a concussion, she said, 
I don't think his skull is fractured, nor do I think there's a spinal injury, but I can't be certain. He will have to be carried, and we should be cautious as we move him. So he can't walk? Chester asked. Not for at least twenty-four hours, Locke said. That's twenty-four hours of complete rest. Then we need a stretcher, Chester said. Maybe a sedan chair. We need an extraction, Locke said. Have you called in our position, Mr. Wright? She used his name, as if to emphasize how much was wrong. Bill patted his belt. I'll find the sat phone. You make a stretcher. Back in the cockpit, a neat bandage had been wrapped around Scott's head. The pilot's eyes were half open, but only the straps kept him in the seat. I've been in worse situations than this, Bill said. We all have. We're all alive, and that's down to you, Scott. Thank you. Now, where's that phone? After the last call, he placed the phone in the webbing pouch next to the seat. It wasn't there. He found it at the bottom of the control console, wedged in a gap where two panels had come loose. The screen was cracked, and the aerial had snapped off. He tried the buttons anyway, but the screen stayed dark. Any reply? Locke asked, stepping back into the cockpit. What? No, Bill said, turning around quickly. He'd not even heard her approach. The phone's broken. But you called in our position before we crashed? Locke asked, bending down to peer beneath Scott's seat. Not exactly, Bill said. I placed a call just after we crossed the coast. That was about twenty miles from the sea. Scott dumped the fuel, brought the plane in low, and was about to land when we saw a mass of industrial pipework in the field. He brought us back up again. That was the dipping and bucking? Locke asked. I thought that was turbulence. Ah, yes. She picked up Hickson's weapons belt. Bill eyed her. Why do you want that? Why do you think? She said. This is hostile territory. More immediately, I need the knife to cut the seats into a sling with which we can move Mr. Hickson. Unless you have a better idea for creating a stretcher. What? You think I had something to do with the crash? It had crossed my mind, Bill said. Really? Perhaps you should cross it off until you can explain why I'd want to be a passenger on a plane that I intended to crash. You're in my way. I need the harness from the co-pilot's seat. Bill stepped aside, and back into the cabin, where Chester was cutting the belts from the passenger seats. Have you found anything we can salvage? Anything we can use? Bill asked. The bag or two we each brought with us, and that's all, Chester said. But since that's all we'd be able to haul through the snow, it wouldn't help if we'd packed an arsenal. Of course, he added, that leaves the question of where we're carrying it. I'm on it, Bill said. He continued down the aisle to the gaping hole where the rear of the plane had been. Leaping to avoid the jagged steel shards jutting out of the ruined cabin, he jumped down, sinking calf deep into the drift. The cold sent a jolting bolt straight to his brain. As quick as he could, he kicked his way out of the snow and over to Sergeant Kahn. Was Private Kessler? Bill asked. Kahn jerked a finger behind him, but kept his gaze on the distant tree line. One wing had been sheared in two just beyond the engine mount. Kessler stood on the portion of wing still attached to the plane. Bill couldn't see the wingtip, but in the snow, Fifty meters beyond the private was the plane's tail section. From the muddy gash gouged through the snow and frozen dirt, both the tail section and the rest of the plane had spun after they'd broken apart. His gaze tracked backwards, following the dark scar, until it disappeared, marking the point where the plane had first hit the ground. Just beyond that, he saw movement. Zombies, he said. Wait. No. No, it is zombies. About three hundred meters away. Seen them, Khan said. They're moving slow. Haven't seen us yet. We've ten minutes. Did you pack any ammunition? Sorry, Bill said. I didn't plan for this. I expected we'd land in Belfast, where we'd have had an escort back into the city. How much do you have? Not enough, 
Khan said. Have a few hundred rounds, the private has half that. She saw something glinting through the trees due north of here. Possibly glass from a window pane, possibly not. Night is a couple of hours away, whether we move or stay. We need to decide now. Due north? Bill looked back towards the slowly approaching undead. The zombies wouldn't have seen them. Not yet. Not as long as the zombies in France were the same as those in Britain and Ireland. Above the living dead, the clouds were thin wisps. If a satellite was overhead, it might be able to spot the wreck. But the sun was low on the horizon. Night was only a few hours away. Without a working phone, he couldn't even call Sholto to give an approximate location. It's a hard decision, Khan prompted. We move, Bill said. I'll get the pilot. Zombies are heading towards the plane, Bill said. The snow is slowing them, and we've got about ten minutes before they're close enough to see us. Kessler saw what might be a building due north. We're going to move. Of course we are, Block said. We can't stay here. Chester, give me a rifle. The large Londoner hesitated. You're physically stronger than me, Block said, and I'm the better shot. Remember Birmingham? Fair point, Chester said. He handed her the weapon. Locke ran to the rear and jumped outside. Do you trust her? Bill asked. I guess so, Chester said. But ask me again in a week. Locke had knotted strips of the seat's fabric into short ropes and combined it with seat belts and wire to create a far sturdier sling than Bill could have fabricated. Despite that, it was still flimsy, likely to fall apart within an hour. But if they hadn't found shelter by then... Scott would be dead, the rest of them soon after. He and Chester maneuvered the pilot through the ragged hole at the rear of the plane. Kessler and Khan took the way to the stretchers, first Chester, then Bill jumped down to the snow. Where's Locke? Bill asked. She's gone ahead, Khan said. More hostiles approaching, he added. A lot more. Bill took the lead with Kessler and Chester carrying the pilot, and Sergeant Khan guarding the rear. Even with his persistent limp, Bill was easily able to outpace the stretcher. The deep snow had saved their lives, but it reduced their speed to a slow, sodden trudge. Would the zombies manage any faster? He didn't look behind to check, but kept his eyes scanning the tree line ahead. He couldn't see the undead, he couldn't see any buildings either, nor could he see Locke. Was she really innocent of involvement in the crash? He knew little about the skills she had, the training she'd received, except that she'd prepared for the end of the world. It was well within the bounds of possibility that she knew something of planes, though presumably not enough to fly one herself. Chester and Bran had reported that she'd moved virtually silently during the battle in Birmingham. So, yes. It was possible that she'd sneaked out during the night and so had the opportunity to meddle with the plane. The only reason why, of course, was if Kempton had a redoubt somewhere in France, due southeast of Anglesey. He smiled, bitterly. That was a grim twist. If Locke could suggest a safe refuge close by, then they'd know she wasn't to be trusted. If she couldn't, then they could trust her, but would likely freeze to death. It was a dark quandary, a distraction from the cold. As he scanned the trees, he realized it had distracted him from the undead. Zombie, he said. There, movement. The tree line, two hundred yards. Private? How good are you with that rifle? I'm getting better, Kessler said. Then let's swap, Bill said. As the private stepped aside so Bill could take hold of the crude stretcher's equally crude straps, he saw Scott's face. It was pale and lifeless. With a pilot beneath him, Bill couldn't see the ground, and he didn't want to keep his gaze fixed on the dying pilot's face. When he looked up, he saw the zombies slip in an icy drift, falling face first, and then Bill almost slipped. He looked down, 
trying to spy the ground between the straps and the pilot's feet. Hold your fire, Private, Sergeant Khan calmly called from close behind. Let it come to us. Check your surroundings. Never focus so intently on one foe you let another creep up behind you. How many do you see? Kessler pivoted left and right, then repeated the motion, this time more slowly. Just one, Sarge, just the one. Can you take the shot? Uh, no, I don't think so, not yet. Then wait, Khan said. We have all the time in the world. That was hardly true. Bill had only the vaguest notion of how long hypothermia took to set in. Would they find shelter before they froze? Would the undead catch up with them before then? Should they have stayed on the plane, sent a scout ahead? They'd acted without thinking, without planning. The end result out here would be death. The pilot would be first, assuming he hadn't already succumbed. Scott didn't appear to be breathing, but nothing could be done while trekking across the snowfield. No, there, Scott's lips moved. Bill turned his gaze away, instinctively searching for the zombie, and spotted it in time to see it fall to the ground. This time it didn't get back up. Kessler's rifle was only half raised. Bill assumed Khan had shot the creature until he saw Locke step out of the trees. She waved them on, and turned around, aiming her rifle back the way she'd come. The straps joined the cold, biting deep into Bill's hands. His gloves were made of loosely knitted wool, ideal when wielding a blade, where the fabric could absorb the gore, next to useless in this frozen hellscape, where they were already saturated. His thigh-length jacket was waxed and lightweight, but not warm. His legs were covered in denim, his top in a t-shirt and jumper. There were threadbare clothes to be discarded after a battle on the motorway near Belfast. Kim had found him a complete set of hard-wearing gear, Gore-Tex trousers, a waterproof coat, a wicking-wear shirt, all designed for this very weather, and presented as a gift complete with wrapping paper and a neat red bow. There had been a moment of panic when he wondered if he'd missed some anniversary, which had only made her laugh. The outfit was in his bag, and with her on the ship. By now it would be in Belfast. No, he corrected himself. It was still only a few hours since the boat had left Anglesey. They'd still be at sea and his clothes would be in the bag in the cabin. At least his journals were there, too. After the trouble they'd caused, he'd been inclined to leave them in Wales, but that wasn't fair on Annette and Daisy. The journals told their story as much as they told his. As they approached the tree line, Locke raised her rifle again, this time firing behind them. Bill didn't hear the suppressed shot, nor the zombie fall, but it was enough to make them hurry. The trees were planted in an uneven line on a shallow slope that marked the edge of the field. Locke stood at the top of that slight rise. Beyond her, the ground dropped away to a narrow ditch on the other side of which was a far steeper incline topped with a stone wall. There's an old farmhouse the other side of that wall, Locke said peremptorily. It's shelter. Best will find. It'll do, Bill said. Locke raised the rifle aiming behind them, but then lowered it as Khan took the shot. I have to say I'm impressed, she said. With? Chester asked as they slipped their way down the slope. With the silences you made on Anglesey, Locke said. Ah. The ground at the bottom of the incline was slick, then wet, as Bill's foot broke through the thin ice and into the freezing water beneath. Careful, he said through gritted teeth. There's a stream here, only a few inches deep. But they managed to get Hickson up the other side without further incident. You can tell we're not in Britain anymore, Chester said. Why's that? Kessler asked. The stones are cemented together, Chester said. You wouldn't see that in Wales. 
As Locke ran ahead, and leaving Khan to watch their rear, they hauled the unmoving pilot onward. The farmhouse was a one-and-a-half-story ruin. The reflected gleam Kessler had observed came from a window built into the eaves. That was the only glass on view, and the most intact part of the roof. The ground floor windows had been boarded up, and long enough ago for the wood to bow and buckle in the damp and heat of many successive seasons. Locke's footprints led through the ajar door, but those were the only marks in the snow. Derelict, but no graffiti, Chester said. Does that matter? Kessler asked. It tells you how remote this place is, Chester said. You don't tag a place where the short list of culprits barely stretches into single digits. Can't be more than a couple of farms within walking distance, certainly no towns. We must be well off the beaten track. Locke came back outside. It's empty, she said. Then lead the way, Bill said. The interior was no more inviting than the outside had been. A mouldering sofa squatted in the centre of the main room. Candle stubs littered the floor, the hearth, and every flat surface, with scores more lodged in the tops of empty wine bottles. Why, a lot of wine bottles, but none have labels, Chester said. You think we might be on the edge of a vineyard? A vineyard is not the same as a bottling plant, Locke said. Here, let's put Scott on the sofa, Bill said. Little light made it through the cracks around the boarded-up windows. He took out his torch, pressed the button. Nothing happened. He gave it a slap and the beam came on, adding his light to Locke's and Kessler's. The room took up most of the ground floor. An arched alcove led to a kitchen. Rather, it led into a room with a broken ceramic sink. There were no white goods or appliances, nor could he see any light switches. The fireplace and chimney had been built in the middle of the house, with the hearth open on either side of the dividing wall, so that it could serve as a cooking fire for the kitchen and a source of warmth for the living room. In the corner, a staircase led upstairs. Beneath it was a door that, when Locke opened it, showed a cobwebbed cupboard. He propped his torch on a shelf built into the chimney stack. Did you check upstairs? Chester asked. Yes. Locke said, half the roof is gone, but the remaining floorboards appear intact. We don't have to worry about the roof collapsing. She crossed to the pilot and checked his pulse. He's alive. We can make him comfortable, but nothing more. Then start a fire, Bill said. There's some matches in my pack. Those cupboard doors will do for firewood. Private, can you collect some snow in those wine bottles? We can have hot water to drink, if nothing else. And what will you do while we do that? Locke asked. This is good farming country, but this is an old building, Bill said. The new farmhouse can't be far away. We might find food there, maybe even a map or two. Chester, fancy a stroll? Chapter Two Blood and Snow Somewhere in France Feels like sandpaper, doesn't it? Chester said, as they stepped outside. But you have to be alive to feel. Dry boots. Dry boots, my kingdom for a dry pair of boots, Bill muttered. Across the snow-coated farmyard, he could see the trees and wall, though not the crashed plain. More pertinently, he couldn't see Sergeant Khan until he realized a moving branch was actually the Marine, waving the all clear. The clouds aren't too heavy, Chester said. That's good. They'll see the crash plane on the satellites. But the sun's setting, Bill said, with less than an hour until dark, meaning that the earliest the satellites will spot us is tomorrow morning, Chester said. That's the earliest the satellites will be able to take pictures, Bill said, but they won't start the search here. We didn't crash as near to the coast as I'd like. That begs the question of exactly where here is. Beyond the snow-covered yard, in the direction opposite to ditch, wall, and crashed plain, was an old barn in worse repair than the house. The eastern wall was halfway through a slow collapse that had already brought down the roof. 
A steel joist jutted out of the snow. In turn, a wooden beam propped up that joist, marking where the farm's owners had attempted to stave off the inevitable effects of time. Someone didn't want to let the place collapse, Chester said, but not someone with the time to do the job properly. He dug his heel into the snow, dragging it back. Dirt, not tarmac, not concrete, not even gravel. A sofa and candles. This was someone's little nest. Not where they lived, but where they retreated from the world. But how far away is the world they were retreating from? Bill said. Did you pack much food? A few flatbreads, a couple of tins of mandarin segments, Chester said. It was a snack in case we ended up trapped for the night between the motorway and Belfast Harbour. You? I brought my lunch, Bill said. Still haven't eaten it, though. They reached the front of the barn and its two-door metal gate. The gate was chained closed with a padlock far sturdier than the door's hinges. Where the chain was still taut, the brackets on the left-hand door had rusted away, allowing the gate to collapse, leaving a two-foot-wide gap between it and the wall. I left my torch in the house, Bill said. Do you have one? Hang on. Here. Jester shone the light inside sweeping the beam across fragments of collapsed roof, broken timbers, rusting corrugated sheets, and— There, stop, Bill said. No, no, go back. To the left. There. It's a body. Bill pushed his way through the narrow gap. As Chester followed, his light moved from the corpse. Bill blinked momentarily, unable to see. His foot crunched on a broken tile. When Chester returned the light to the body— it hadn't moved. Dead, Bill said, stepping closer. Yes, dead. Two bodies. Two men. Boys, really. Neither could be older than twenty, and were probably at least two years younger. Both had not quite matching streaks of red and white in their hair, and faces that barely needed to shave. Calf-length leather jackets were buttoned high up to their necks, with skin-tight grey trousers tucked into black boots. Long hair was an unusual sight, at least compared to the cropped and shaved fashion of Anglesey, and whether they'd found the jackets in the same wardrobe, or they'd taken months to scavenge, they'd wanted to dress alike. It's murder, Chester said. I'm sorry? Bill said. Well, it was no accident, Chester said. They were shot in the chest, not the head. The cut on that lad's arm, and that slash on the other guy's leg. Those wounds came from knives, not clawed fingers. I can't see any weapons on the ground either, so they didn't kill one another. Someone cut them here. Then they shot them. He knelt down. They were facing their killer when they died, but their hands weren't tied. I don't know if the cuts came from torture or a fight, but it was murder. Trust me. He stood, and shone the light in a sweeping loop around the bodies, settling on a pair of bags. Both were light blue with red flashes and fluorescent stripes. Two backpacks, Bill said. The killer left the bags. He stepped around the bodies and over to the backpacks. There's a broom handle here, and a length of metal with cloth wrapped around the end. No one would have survived this long without a better weapon than that, Chester said and they had time to get bags, to get matching clothes, but not an axe or gun. They must have fled in haste. They were already dressed, and the bags were close to hand. They grabbed them and ran. Are you sure it's murder, not an execution? Bill asked. Is there a difference? Chester asked. I'd like to think so, Bill said. Chester shone his light on the bodies, then on the ground around them. Yeah. I'd say murder. It's hard to be certain when you're standing in a ruin, but I don't think there was a fight. Not a proper one. Not a fair one. Not if they didn't have weapons. Someone cut them because they wanted to. Only then did they use the gun. Bill picked up a bag. Still full, he said. Shine your light over here. Thanks. There's some clothing, a paperback, a can of... Not sure, there's no label. A hunting knife, a few more clothes, here. 
he passed the bag to Chester and picked up the other for himself. A can? Either the killer didn't need the food or they didn't even bother to search the bags, Chester said. Whoever they are, they're well supplied. It just gets better and better, Bill said. It gets worse, Chester said, shining the light back on the thin bodies, settling when it landed on one of the young men's hands. Look at the fingers. No rodents have gnawed on them, no insects have found them. They died after the weather turned cold. Hard to say when that was. A week? Two? I doubt it's much longer. It's safe to assume that whoever killed them is still in the neighborhood. And if they're close, they would have heard the plane, Bill said. Brilliant. They took the bags back to the farmhouse, where Locke had already lit a dozen candles. We're back sooner than I expected, she said. I take it there's more bad news. The barns are ruined, Bill said. Inside are two bodies, both human. They were both shot, and after the weather turned cold. These bags were left behind. We're going out again to see what's beyond the barn. We'll be back when it gets too dark to see. The cemented stone wall that ran above the ditch continued around the old farm. Occasional patches of crumbling concrete marked a half-hearted repair. Between two of the sturdier attempts was a twelve-foot-wide gap. Might be a road, Chester said, again digging his heel into the ground. There's something hard beneath the mud. Might be tarmac. Could just be ice. If it was a road, it led a meandering route through deciduous woodland. It wasn't dense enough to be called a forest, but the trees were planted too randomly for them to be farmed. We'll give ourselves ten minutes, Bill said. See what we find. Finding nothing would be something, Chester said. I don't like that we found two bodies here. Statistically, it tells me that there must be other victims nearby, otherwise it's just too much of a coincidence. We saw smoke just before we brought the plane down, Bill said. That would be somewhere to the northwest. I did think we might head in that direction, see if we couldn't find the people who lit the fire. Now, though, I'm not sure. The shadows lengthened as they crunched through the pristine carpet of snow. That's it, Chester said after five minutes. The shadows are gone, the sun's behind the horizon. Hang on, Bill said. There, in the distance, that's a fence. Can you see it? Ahead of us? No, not really, Chester said. Greta told me to get some glasses before we left Anglesey. I really regret not listening to her. Bill took another step, then another. He frowned, squinting into the distance. Can hear something. Metal grating against metal. After another thirty feet, all became clear. Ahead was a sturdy, twelve-foot-tall chain-link fence, intersected by a rusting seven-bar gate. The gate was held closed by a chain and padlock, pushing against the gate, causing the chain to grate, for the undead. How many? Chester asked. Twelve, Bill said. They must have heard the plane. The fence explains why there are none by the farmhouse. The gate's chained? Chester asked. For now, I don't know how long it will hold. Right, Chester said, as he drew the machete from his belt. Then let's get this done. Wish I had my mace. I'll take the right. Have you got the left? Sure. Bill swung the machete back and forth in a slow ten-degree arc, warming up his muscles as he stepped forward towards the undead. There were twelve zombies, eight in the front rank, four behind. Their clothing was a muddy rainbow of browns and beige, dotted with the occasional flash of a rain-cleaned button and the glint of a zip. None appeared recently turned, and they looked no different to the undead in England, in Wales, in Ireland. The receding skin around mouth and eyes, the collapsed noses, the open sores dripping black pus onto the trampled snow beneath the gate. Bill swung the machete up, as arms reached forward. The zombies, seeing their prey approach, pushed against the gate. Wish I had my pike, 
Bill said, as he gauged the distance, looking for an opening. The gate's hinges creaked. It wouldn't hold for much longer. Chester roared, slashing his machete in a savage cut that severed an arm before bringing the blade up and down again on the unflinching creature's head. Well, that's one tactic, Bill said, swinging his own machete in turn. He aimed for the nearest elbow, but twisted the weapon, pushing the arm out of the way with a flat of the blade, before another twist brought the edge down to crush the zombie's skull. The undead on either side shuffled left and right, trampling the dead creature beneath their feet, while the zombies behind scrummed forward, trying to push their way into the gap. The hinges creaked again, and again Bill swung, batting the hands away, cutting into necrotic skin and rotten bone. When he mistimed a blow, the blade skittered across a skull and down onto the metal gate. He stepped back. His hands were numb. His arms ached, but that was barely noticeable over the rising pain in his neck. Only seven zombies now remained. Two-handed, Chester cleaved through bone and diseased brain. Bill stepped forward, swinging, slicing the blade into an undead woman's temple. Black gore arced upward, but the blade stuck. As the zombie fell, it took the machete with it. Bill stepped back again, reaching for his belt. He had his sidearm, but he didn't dare risk a shot. Even at this closer range, not when sound would only summon more of the undead. He drew the long, narrow hunting knife, but Chester stalked along the gate, slashing once, then twice, then a third time. The last of the zombies fell. Phew, Chester muttered. Sometimes it feels like it'll never end. Bill tested the gate. It'll hold. Can you see any more? Zombies? Yes, two, Bill said. They're stationary by the fence, twenty yards from here. And only twelve here, despite the noise the plane must have made going overhead, Chester said. Though there are the zombies who gathered around the plane, Bill said as he climbed over the gate. He retrieved his machete. I'm not going to read anything into it. I'll be back in a moment. He carefully picked his way across the snow. His last two zombies appeared different. He couldn't immediately place why, until when he was ten feet away, they finally turned towards him. Their clothing was brighter, less faded, though their faces were ravaged by unnatural decay, making it impossible to mistake them for living people. The lead creature, still sporting a bright yellow silk scarf around its neck, lurched unsteadily from foot to foot. The other creature shook, shuddered, but had barely shuffled an inch before Bill turned his full attention to the nearer foe. Its arms swung by its sides, its fingers curled into fists, its mouth sagged open, and Bill swung the machete into its head. As it crumpled to the ground, oozing red-brown pus from its ruined skull, Bill stepped back, raising his weapon, but the other zombie had barely moved. Bill stepped wide around the corpse, watching the other creature, waiting, but it didn't move, nor did it collapse. Cautiously, he hacked the blade low into its knee and skipped back as it toppled to the ground. Still, it barely moved but stared at him with its unblinking eyes until he slashed down again, bringing an end to its tormented mockery of an existence. He peered along the road, into the gloom. Night truly was settling. Visibility was dropping, along with the temperature. But he couldn't see any more zombies. He couldn't see any signs, either. As he trudged back to Chester and the gate, he scuffed at the ground. It's a road, he said. No signs, though. He shivered. His hands slipped as he clambered back over the gate. Do you see anything we can reinforce the gate with? Chester asked. The zombie's clothing is utterly rotten. Bill gave the gate a shake and gave the scarf around the dead zombie's neck a glance. Not really. Then we'll have to rob the dead, Chester said. The lads in that barn will have worn belts. 
unless you want to explore further. No, not tonight, Bill said. He shivered again. Feels like a switch has been flipped and my body's reminding me it was in a plane crash an hour ago. No, we're staying here tonight. They trudged back to the farmhouse, where a welcome yellow glow crept around the boarded-up windows. Bill imagined he could feel the heat, and then worried that was hypothermia setting in. As Chester went to strip the bodies of something with which to secure the gate, Bill continued on past the house, to the wall. Sergeant Khan crouched behind a tree, his rifle held loosely in his hands. How bad is it? Bill asked. Bad? But it could be worse, Khan said. There's over a hundred. Under a thousand? I'll get you a more accurate count when they stop coming in. There's too many to fight, but they're gathering around the plain, and almost all are coming from due south. What did you find? There's a derelict house and barn, and a fence ringing it. Beyond the fence is a road, accessed through a gate. We found fourteen zombies there, but I think both fence and gate will hold through the night. I'd say we're safe from that direction. Then we should get out of the cold, Khan said. We can keep watch from the upper floor of the house. Finally, gratefully, Bill went inside, into the warm. Chapter 3 Fireside and Candlelight Somewhere in France As gently as he could, Chester slid the belt free from around the waist of one of the dead young men, and then the other. Up close, he could better see the wounds. Taken with the position of the corpses, his first suspicion was confirmed. They'd been tortured, then shot from close range. I don't know you, he said. Ground's frozen, so I can't dig a grave. I can't offer you words of comfort, or even that you'll be avenged. All I can say is that I'll remember you. It was a pledge he'd made too often. He gathered the belts and returned to the gate. Now that the sun had set, the temperature had plunged. It would be a cold night. Strapping the belts between the gate and the fence took less than a minute. If the undead came in great numbers, that reinforcement wouldn't keep the gate closed for much longer. Other than hope dawn arrived before the undead, there was little else he could do. He trudged back to the farmhouse. Higson lay on the sofa, his eyelids flickering out of time with a candlelight. Kessler was methodically emptying the backpacks they'd found in the barn, while Locke nursed a low fire. Where's Bill and Selman? he asked, keeping his voice low. Upstairs, Kessler said, watching the undead. Good, good, Chester said. And how's Scott? Candlelight caused eldritch shadows to dance across the pilot's face. Is he unconscious? Or asleep? Ask again tomorrow, Locke said. If Mr. Higson wakes, he was asleep. If he doesn't, he was unconscious. Looks like we need more firewood, Chester said. I'll make a start on the kitchen. He picked up a wine bottle candle and walked through the archway. Packed dirt filled the gaps in the floor between rotten concrete. He opened a floor-to-ceiling door and found a toilet rather than a cupboard. The bowl was filled with dirt, from which grew a withered stem. He closed the door and opened an ill-fitting cupboard hanging on the peeling, discoloured wall. It was empty, but the door was made of wood, as were the dusty shelves inside, he scraped the rust from the screw heads bracketing the cupboard to the wall, then began working the entire piece of furniture free. A broken sink mate's kitchen as good a name for that room as any other, he said, propping the detached cupboard next to the fire. No fridge, no electricity, no insulation unless you count dirt. Speaking of which, they filled the toilet with it, presumably after the plumbing was disconnected. Even the spiders have moved out. But, on balance, I can honestly say that I've rented worse places than this back in London. You can't be serious, 
Kessler said. He's not, Locke said. It would have been illegal even for London's already criminal rental market. Ah, you've knocked the nail on the head there, Chester said. The criminal rental market was very different from the legal one. I had to rent from whoever would take the cash and ask no questions, nor ask to see any ID. As you can imagine, the choice of properties wasn't vast. Often they'd been condemned and awaiting demolition. It wasn't so bad the last few years after McKinnery had set up her shop. I had a genuine salary and paid taxes and everything. Now, if you want to talk about criminality, we could start there. You sound proud, Kessler said. Of my past? I'm not, Chester said. I'm neither proud nor ashamed. I won't claim I was anything other than a crook. I know what I did. I know what lives I ruined. I know what I've done in the month since. I know what the world's become and what we'll have to do to ensure our species survives. There's no time for hiding from our past, no point in it. They're all very different people to who we were a year ago. Tell me about it, Kessler said. Anything useful in those bags? Locke asked. A few damp books, Kessler said, in French. She added, placing them by the fire to dry. Fiction, fantasy, going by the covers, they're about vampires. Vampires? Not zombies? Chester asked. Who'd want to read about fictional zombies? Kessler asked. I read a few, Chester said, round about the time all this began. I can't remember where I'd taken shelter. Somewhere in London, I suppose. Can't say they helped me understand what was happening, though. I bet you haven't bothered with them since, Kessler said. I've stuck with non-fiction, Chester said, making up for the gaps in my education. Do you speak French? Me? Kessler asked. No. What about you, Sarka? Enough to get by, Locke said. Not enough to want to read about vampires. Let's call the books Kindling. When they've dried out, Kessler said. We've also got some clothing, underwear, socks, a couple of scarves and pairs of gloves. The scarves, what color are they? Chester asked. Black, Kessler said. Why? One of the zombies down by the gate had a yellow silk scarf around its neck. Well, these are wool, Kessler said. And they're damp. We'll need to dry them out, too. She pegged the scarf on a rusting nail in the beam running across the ceiling. That leaves a box of matches that probably won't dry out, a clasp knife, and some cutlery. What about food? Chester asked. Wasn't there a tin in one of the bags? Four cans so far, Kessler said. None with labels. Is there any bread? Locke asked. Or anything that would indicate they'd access to raw ingredients rather than just what they could salvage from the ruins? Not yet, Kessler said. You're wondering how far they've traveled? And whether they came from somewhere close, Locke said. To put that another way, they clearly didn't live on this farm. So where did they come from? And which way did their killer go? Beats me, Kessler said. The stairs creaked. A moment later, Bill appeared. Everything all right up there? Chester asked. For now, yes, Bill said. We can't see the plane, but there's enough starlight to see the trees. The zombies aren't approaching us yet. They're gathered by the plane. A few hundred of them, but I think we'll be safe here for the night. He walked over to the fire, holding out his hands to the flames. Chester went back into the kitchen and worked another cupboard free. He took it over to the fire, laying it next to the small blaze. We'll need a bit more firewood to last us until dawn. The door to the stairs might do the job, otherwise we'll have to start on the timbers upstairs. Oh, the roof's long since collapsed, Bill said. Everything up there is sodden and covered in moss. We might get more joy from the barn. How are we doing otherwise? Except for any weapons you might be concealing from me, Locke said. We have three rifles, a few sidearms, machetes, and hunting knives. Why would anyone be concealing weapons? Kessler asked. No one is, Bill said. What about ammo? A few hundred rounds of ammunition for the rifles, 
A few spare magazines for the handguns, Locke said. We have the suppressors, of course, without which firearms would be more danger than aid. The, um, the sergeant has a grenade, Kessler said. Does that help? Probably not, Bill said. What about food? Enough for a small meal tonight and a smaller breakfast, Locke said. No blankets, no bedding, very little in the way of medical gear. A few stitches of spare clothing, but it's not suited to this weather. What about those two bodies? My coats were ruined, Chester said. I checked. The boots didn't look much better. This morning we had electricity in a plane, Kessler said, and now we're robbing the dead. Doesn't that say it all? Are we staying here for a few days, then? Chester asked. If we are, I'll go and gather some branches from outside. They should dry out overnight. Best we do that in case the undead cross the stream. No, Bill said. Because of the undead, I don't think we can stay here. At the very least, tomorrow we should venture beyond that fence and gate. That should offer us some protection from the zombies by the plane. Assuming that there aren't even more undead in the countryside beyond, Locke said. What's the alternative? Bill said. Before we crashed, I saw smoke. I think I spied a river, perhaps a few buildings. How long before we crashed? Chester asked. How far away was the smoke? Five miles? Perhaps ten? Bill said. Considering the bodies in the barn, Locke said, is it wise to look for people? I've asked myself the same question, Bill said. Tomorrow we haven't got much choice. We'll follow that road by the gate. Since it's running east-west, we'll go west, towards the coast. That's where they'll come looking for us. As for the people, the smoke, we'll make a decision tomorrow after we've seen what lies beyond the gate. You want to walk a hundred miles? Locke said. In a snowstorm, with Mr. Hickson unconscious. You have a better suggestion? Bill asked. It's academic, isn't it? Chester said quickly, wanting to forestall an unwinnable argument. We'll follow the road west until we find a better supplied property than this. Our speed will be determined by Scott, so until we find some bikes or, if we're lucky, a car, we won't get far. I don't suppose there's any chance of getting that sat phone fixed. Not by me, Bill said. Lock? No, I don't think those devices were built to be fixed. What if you found another sat phone? Chester asked. Or a satellite uplink of some kind. Could you get access to the satellites or upload a message to them? They were yours originally, weren't they? They release us, Locke said. But no, Mr. Tom Clements locked me out of the system just after the outbreak. Who? Kessler asked. She means Shelto, Bill said. And he'll be looking for us, won't he? Kessler said. Yes, but not here, Bill said. Not yet. They'll start at the coast and then move inland. It'll be days before they find the plane. At least there are plenty of people in Belfast now, all with time on their hands to look through the images. The factor which will slow down the search is the weather. I'd say the earliest they'll spot the wreck is about three days from now, and then they'll send the helicopter, Kessler said. Does it have the range? Chester asked. I suppose that depends on where we are. George took some fuel down to London, Bill said. It was in case when they got to the tower they found that some people needed an emergency airlift to Anglesey. Belfast is, what, another hundred miles? The chopper should have the range to get to London. From there it can refuel. Call it eighty miles to Folkestone, another thirty from there to the French coast, and a hundred miles here. I'd say it has the range. It doesn't matter, Chester said. As soon as Nilda learns the planes crashed, she'll take those ships Leon was bringing around the coast and head for France. I doubt they'll risk losing the helicopter by sending it to the tower once they've all left. In which case, Locke said, either we go to the coast, or we have to find somewhere we can wait until the helicopter can be brought to the coast by ship. Since we have no way of communicating with Belfast, we'll have no way of knowing if the helicopter is on its way until it arrives. As such, Staying put anywhere is not an option.
A moment ago I thought you were saying we should stay in one place, Bill said. Then you misunderstood, Locke said. The last call you made you told them we were twenty miles from the coast, yes? And that was an estimate based on flight time. And was that at the beginning of the call or the end? The beginning. And what was the duration of the call? She asked, how long after you hung up before we began our descent? Twenty minutes? We were travelling at around four hundred knots. That's about eight miles a minute. Twenty minutes is a hundred and sixty miles. The margin of error on that is immense, since I don't know our exact speed. Do you? No, but I get your point. We could be a lot further than a hundred miles from the coast. And beyond the helicopter's range, Locke said, it may take far longer than a few days before the satellites find us. We cannot expect rescue, nor can we expect Mr. Hickson to survive trekking hundreds of miles through the snow, nor can we realistically manage to carry him. We're not leaving him behind, Bill said. And again you misunderstand, Locke said. I'm simply trying to point out the difficulty in our situation. Suggesting we can simply walk to the coast where a boat will be waiting for us would be difficult without the undead without the snow, without the danger of some murderous killers nearby. So where do we go? Kessler asked. Where can we go? Did you have a base in France? A bunker or something? In France? No, not really, Locke said. There is a safe house on the outskirts of Paris. Beneath the floorboards are iodine tablets, firearms and ammunition. If Lisa had been stranded in the city during the nuclear war, she would have gone there and then north to where the New World would have collected her. Where in the north? Chester asked. Denmark, a place called Haderslev, on the east side of Jutland, about sixty kilometres north of the border with Germany. Why there? Kessler asked. Because Russia was unlikely to nuke Denmark for fear of irradiating its exit from the Baltic Sea, Locke said. It wasn't impossible, but it wasn't likely. As to why Haderslev... The University of Copenhagen wanted funding for a tidal research center. They chose Harislev. We provided the funding and made a few suggestions as to the site's construction. It is reachable by road, and there are very good roads running north from Paris to Germany and then to Denmark, but we stipulated the addition of a helipad, claiming Lisa preferred flying to driving. It's still a long way, though, Chester said. From Paris, yes, but Lisa rarely visited France, Locke said. She was more frequently in Germany, Poland and Sweden, all of which made Haderslev a convenient location. However, she wasn't in any frequently enough that it was economical investing in a proper redoubt. She had to maintain her public persona. She couldn't hide in a bunker whilst also attempting to save the world. As such, we didn't know with any certainty where she or our teams would be when the balloon went up. She gave a shrug. It's all academic now, of course. Since we don't know where we are, we don't know how far away Paris is, let alone Denmark. For want of any other suggestions, Bill said, we'll leave at first light, head to the road, and then go westward. Let's take a look at the food and see what we can manage for dinner. Cans first, I suppose, since they're the heaviest. Anyone want to place a bet on what we'll find in them? Chester asked. I'll give you better odds on the contents being inedible, Kessler said. Part 2. The Watchtower. Day 254, the 22nd of November. Chapter 4. First Light, Second Thoughts. The Ruined Farm, Somewhere in France. Bill dug his shoulder blades into the chimney's crumbling brickwork trying to absorb some of the dying heat from the fire below. It was two hours since Locke had dragged him from his fitful doze to begin the last watch of the night. He'd thrown a cupboard door onto the fire before climbing up to his drafty perch. From the brick's cold chill, either Locke had gone to sleep or there was nothing left to burn. No matter. Dawn was well and truly on its way. The sky had been brightening for twenty minutes, confirming his earlier fear. For once, that fear had nothing to do with the undead. 
He could already see the wall and tree line, and so far no zombies had reached the farm's yard. No, his fear was over the density of the clouds, and each passing second only brought forward the moment he had to accept the bitter truth. The sky was covered in a thick blanket of dirty grey cumulus clouds, through which the satellite's cameras would never penetrate. A storm was brewing, and that had him pondering the wisdom of moving. The lack of food and firewood, and the proximity to the undead surrounding the crashed plane, made leaving the farm the obvious choice, but they wouldn't get far carrying Scott. The more rest the pilot had, the further he'd be able to move in a day. In fact, in a couple of days he'd probably be able to travel further than they'd be able to carry him during that time. They could split up, of course, but the dead man in the barn told him that the undead weren't the only nearby threat. No. On balance, it was best they travelled together, even if they only managed as far as the next farm. He turned his gaze from the clouds to the plain. He could see it now and he could see some of the undead. Hundreds of black specks surrounded the cockpit and wings, with more around the tail section, far more than he could count. He looked towards the fence and the gate, but the trees were too dense to see whether they too were surrounded by the undead. Yes, it was time to leave, if they could. He eased himself up and went downstairs. Kessler snored softly, her head lying against the mouldering sofa's arm. Locke lay with her back against the wall, her eyes closed. Chester sat by the dying fire, while Khan methodically reloaded a magazine. He paused and looked up. Was there a problem? the sergeant asked. Not really, Bill said. Dawn's arrived. The cloud cover is complete. No satellite will spot us today. Locke opened her eyes and sat up. Kessler grumbled softly, though she kept her eyes closed. Scott moaned. Sergeant, can you get everyone up? Bill said. Chester and I will check the gate. There are no zombies immediately outside, so we have that going for us. It's not snowing at the moment, so there's that as well. If this is the old farmhouse, the new one has to be around here somewhere. Understood, sir, Khan said. It will always tell me it was best to start the day with exercise, Chester said, pushing himself to his feet. Never really believed it, always preferred starting it with a pint of tea and a bacon sandwich. Bill leaned against the tree, watching the undead around the plain, listening to Chester's soft breathing ten feet behind him. The zombies weren't moving, but they were more than he'd thought from the upper floor of the ruined farmhouse. At present, None were traipsing across the fields towards the farm, but it was only a matter of time. He eased himself back from the tree, retracing his steps to where Chester waited. Just as quietly together, they edged across the farmyard. Only when they were level with the house did he speak, and even then he kept his voice low. Maybe a thousand of them. I wonder where they came from, Chester said. It has to be close. That begs the question of what's there that caused so many zombies to gather. I've become used to the satellites and their aerial views, Bill said. Not that the images helped much. They allayed a few fears, I suppose. The uncomfortable silence returned. It had been their unwelcome third wheel since Chester's arrival on Anglesey. It wasn't that they had nothing to talk about, but that any discussion always drifted towards the world before the outbreak and to lives inherently in conflict with one another. Wind's picking up, Chester said. At least it's not snowing, Bill said. Not yet, Chester said. And again, the silence returned. The gate was still secure. Three zombies lounged on the other side, their arms dangling over the gate like farmers taking a moment's respite. Except that their feet were planted in and around the creatures Bill and Chester had killed the night before. As Bill and Chester crunched through the ankle-deep snow, the zombies pushed against the closed gate. Only three? Chester asked. No more, further along the fence? Not that I can see, 
Bill said. Then leave them to me. You go and get the others, Chester said. Drink this, Locke said, an arm around Scott's shoulder. That's it. You're awake, Bill said, the joy in his voice utterly genuine. Scott mumbled something as he sipped at the cup in Locke's hands. Awake, and he has feeling in his feet and hands, Locke said. There's no spinal injury. I can't guarantee he hasn't fractured his skull. How do you feel, Scott? Bill asked. Eh, uh, okay, he mumbled. It was good enough. Can you walk? Can he walk? As fast as we can carry him, Locke said. We'll bring the sling anyway, Khan said. What's the situation? Three zombies by the gate. I left Chester to deal with them. We're good to go? Khan asked. I guess so, Bill said. We'll follow the road westward until we reach the next farm. We'll take a breather there and find some new clothes and hopefully a few cans or packets. On your feet, Mr. Hickson, Locke said, helping him up. There you go. We should move before your body realizes how much it wants to sleep. Glicoma hedrisia, she added. That doesn't, doesn't sound good, Scott said. Is that what's wrong with him? Kessler asked. No, Locke said. It's more commonly known as ground ivy. Then there's Symbolaria mularis, or Kenilworth ivy, or Lactura muralis, which is a wall lettuce to you and I. There are plenty of plants we can eat, even in winter. Plenty that are poisonous, too, Bill said. Haven't you learned a difference? Locke asked. What on earth have you been doing these last few months? Amber, can you take his arm? Lead on, Mr. Wright. It was a slow slog to the gate. Despite a determined first ten paces, Higson couldn't move quickly. He couldn't even move slowly. It was questionable whether it would be quicker to carry him, but a certainty that they would have to before the day was done. They found Chester leaning against the gate, three new corpses added to the pile on the other side. Good to see you on your feet, Scott, Chester said. Higson didn't reply. Can we re-secure that chain if we break the padlock? Bill asked. He didn't say that it would take at least five minutes and far too many calories to lift the pilot over. With those belts? Easily done, Chester said. Which wasn't exactly true, but a minute later they had the gate open and were, finally, heading towards the coast. After ten yards the wind rose. Flurries of ice were dragged from the branches, dumping snow on the ground behind them, each clump sounding like that of an undead footstep. After the fifth, Bill ignored them. He couldn't ignore the cold seeping through the thin cloth and into his very bones. Chester and Locke trudged either side of Scott, supporting him. Khan took the lead, Kessler next to him, leaving Bill at the rear. When the road began to curve, Khan stopped. This road is taking us due northwest, he said. Towards the smoke, you mean? Locke said. That's partly it, Khan said. We're walking into the wind. We're exposed on the road, but the snow is too deep for the firmer surface to offer us any benefit. You want to trek through the countryside? Bill asked. Better that than freeze as we head straight towards the enemy, Khan said. Agreed, Locke said. Bill didn't argue. Lead the way, Sergeant. He did pause to look back the way they'd come. The wind-borne snow obscured their footprints, though their trail was still visible. How far were they from the smoke? Five miles? Ten? Maybe twenty? He wasn't sure. But it was probably too far to walk in a snowstorm. Probably. The chill cut deep, and the snow grew deeper as they trudged a disorderly route between the trees. The going, though, grew easier, as leafless deciduous turned to the sharper-scented green foliage of wide-spreading pines which acted as a windbreak. Ahead, Khan's posture changed. The soldier stiffened as he swung his rifle to the right. He fired once, twice. The bullets disappeared into the trees. Almost simultaneously came two heavy thuds. Bill had his hands out of his pockets and his machete drawn before Khan waved a cautious, all-clear. 
Only two, the Marine said. Zombies? Kessler asked. Aye, Khan said. Bill looked to the right and could see the black smears on the pristine snow, but not where the creatures had fallen. Let's keep moving, Locke said. After another five minutes, a zombie staggered through the trees, right into their path. Its clothing was so stained with gore that the green cloth was almost black. Khan lengthened his stride and drew his bayonet, kicking up snow with each heavy footfall. He pulled the blade back and plunged it forward, just as the zombie lunged, impaling itself on the blade. Khan dragged it free, wiping his bayonet clean on the snow. Can't waste the ammo, he said. Within the shelter of the trees, the snow cover was an irregular depth. Where the trees had acted as a break, it was less than an inch deep. Elsewhere, it lay piled in drifts, often over two feet deep, necessitating frequent detours around the pines. A sense of tranquility washed over Bill. Within the trees, the world seemed small, hidden, secure. He wondered if that was hypothermia. If so, it didn't seem too bad. Abruptly, Locke let go of Scott, reached for her borrowed rifle, and swung the barrel up, firing while Chester was still reaching out to catch the injured pilot. Bill turned towards the trees, looking for the threat. Where was it? he asked. Topmost branch, Locke said, trudging through the snow. A zombie was in the tree? Kessler asked. Not a zombie, Locke said, reaching down. She pulled up a bundle of feathers. A bird? Bill asked. I call it lunch, Locke said. It's an owl. Think that's unlucky, Scott muttered. Food is never that, Locke said. Sergeant, don't you have a grenade? Do you want that as an ingredient or as a method of cooking? Khan asked. A method of shopping, Locke said. We don't have a fishing rod, but a grenade will suffice in a pinch. Khan looked to Bill. He shrugged. She has a point. Eyes open for a river. Bill took Scott's other arm. Once more they continued trudging through the snow. This time Bill was certain they couldn't continue for long. He tried to count his steps as a way of measuring distance but after the fifth time he slipped on the treacherous ice, he gave up. He was debating whether, if they turned around, they'd be able to find their way back, when the trees parted, revealing a ten-meter-wide break before them. It's a road, Khan said, scuffing at the ground. Careful there, the snow's deeper. Might be a ditch. No signs, Locke said, but all roads lead to civilization, eventually. How long's it been since we left the farm? Chester asked. About an hour, Khan said. Is that all? Chester said. Seems like an age. The sergeant checked his compass. West is that way. Come on, Scott. Not much further, Chester said. That was the truth. Whether they wanted to or not, they would stop soon and stood no chance of getting back to the farm. They'd have to shelter in the first place they reached, whenever and wherever that was, which turned out to be much closer than he'd expected. Is that real? Chester asked. I'm not hallucinating or anything. Nope, Bill said. That is very definitely a red lamppost. Right. But there's no house here. Nope, Bill said. The lamppost was incongruously planted at the side of the road. There were no buildings nearby, no signpost, no plaque to say it memorialized something or someone. He trudged on, increasingly slowly, not pausing when they reached another lamppost, nor when they came to a third. It's the edge of a town, Bill said. It must be. Come on, Scott. Not far now. It can't be far. It wasn't. Ahead was a wall, made of yellow brick, it towered two feet above head height. You see those uppermost bricks, the ones stained white? Chester said. It's ice? Kessler asked. Salt, Chester said. They are recently laid and recently baked. 
It's a new wall, can't be more than a couple of years old. And one which runs fifty meters from the road, Locke said. She made a short standing jump. A two-story building, smallish, a house, not a farm. There's a balcony, no chimney stacks. Any zombies? Kessler asked. I can't hear any, Locke said. They followed the wall until they reached a gate that was as new as the wall. Nine feet in height, the gate had a wrought iron facade on a backing of dark stained wood. Mr. Carson, Locke said, this is more your area than mine. You mean, can I break in? No, Chester said. The gate slide back into the wall. That recess there, you see? Entry is via that number pad by the road. There'll be a vertical toothed lock bar holding it closed. Without electricity, the only way in is over the top. Locke grabbed hold of the gate and pulled herself up, balancing with her chin level with the top of the gate. Looks clear, she said, letting herself drop back to the ground. The snow is undisturbed. It's a relatively new house. Martin in design. There's a double garage, but no cars outside. Each time we leave, we'll have to climb over, Khan said. Meaning we'll be staying here for a while, Bill said. He looked back at the footprints they'd left on the road, then the more pristine expanse ahead of them. The weather's made that decision for us. We need a ladder. Kessler, Locke, we'll go inside. Sergeant, Chester, stay with Scott. The three of you guard the road. Bill gripped the top of the wall, but his left hand slipped on the ice-covered metal studs. There was a pressure at his feet as Chester took his weight and heaved him over the wall. The house's front door was thirty feet from the gate and ten feet to the side. The ground floor windows were small and narrow. The upper floor, however, had windows that ran from floor to ceiling only occasionally interspersed with supporting columns. If anything, the ground floor reminded him of a prison, while the upper floor reminded him of a penthouse apartment. No brickwork was visible. The walls were clad in a blue-gray facade that matched the tiles on the roof. Must have cost a fortune, Bill said. It's custom-built, Kessler said. Probably, Bill said. To the right of the front door, and immediately in front of the gate, were a pair of closed double garage doors. Beyond the driveway, where some people might have planted a shrubbery, were a trio of rectangular granite slabs, planted end-on with a topmost face four feet above the ground. Seeing those, Bill doubted grass lay beneath the snow. Locke crossed to the front door, Kessler a few steps behind, while Bill listened, but he could hear nothing but their feet crunching on snow. The door is locked. No keyhole, Locke said. She crossed to the nearest window and tapped the glass. Reinforced. Tented. I can't see in. Around the back, then, Bill said. And double quick. I can feel my muscles seizing up. It must be twice as bad for poor Scott. They followed the edge of the house, passing more narrow windows. Like those at the front, they were tinted with the blinds drawn. The back of the house was different. The property had been built on a slope. While the wall continued around the entire perimeter, the ground dropped away, so that someone sitting on the sun deck had a view of the fields beyond until they met a range of hills in the distance. Alternatively, they could ignore the view and enjoy the thirty-meter-long swimming pool. Now, snow covered the pool nearly as high as the mottled blue tile edge. There had to be ice beneath the snow, but to what depth it was impossible to tell. The rear of the house was made mostly of tinted glass. On the upper floor was a balcony that extended over the terrace, providing a sun deck above and a rainproof shelter below. It was snowproof, too. Barely a sprinkling had gathered on the stainless steel recliners and the bones lying on one of them. The skull had been pecked clean. The ribcage was still covered in the tattered rags that must once have been clothes. The small teeth marks on a broken rib spoke of the fate of the skeleton's other bones. Next to the chair was an ice bucket with an open bottle of champagne inside. Suicide, Bill said. 
at the beginning of the outbreak, Locke said. Probably had the right idea, Kessler said. Behind the recliners was a sliding glass door. It was closed but unlocked. Bill stepped inside. The room contained three chairs facing one another, so he decided it was a sitting room. Against the interior wall was a box-like shelving unit with nine squares, only three of which were occupied, and those with identical green vases. It's the Semain, Kessler said. What's that? Bill asked. The style, the design. It's this sort of minimalist way of focusing your life, Kessler said. Do you mean the house or the vases? Bill asked. Both, everything, Kessler said. The designer was from Vienna, Magdalena de Semain. She came up with this idea of how your home and lifestyle were interconnected, sort of like if you were happy with your home, you were happy with your life. The themes were based on old Austrian palaces, but she scaled them down to the lifestyles of ordinary people. Well, ordinary-ish. She was from Stepney, by way of Los Angeles, Locke said. The woman was a charlatan who preyed on those with more money than sense. Yeah, that sounds right, Kessler said. My stepmom was on her waiting list. Hello? Bill called out. There was no reply. I think we're alone. He walked through the room's only door and found himself in the kitchen. He barely registered the recessed cupboards and the sleek-topped island as he marched to the room's other door. It led to a windowless chamber, a little wider than a corridor. In the center was a chair, which faced a canvas. In the middle of the picture was a splash of red. Above was green. Below was a flash of black. It's the poisoned apple, Kessler said. The painting? Bill asked, curiosity getting the better of necessity. Yeah, it's famous, Kessler said. It's a reproduction, Locke said, or perhaps a forgery. Lisa has the original. Okay. I have a million questions, Bill said, and I'm not going to rest before I've asked them, but let's get Scott inside first. He continued through the gallery room, out the other side, and finally into the hallway. The transparent staircase that probably wasn't solid glass led up to a landing, and presumably the bedrooms. Opposite the stairs was the front door. Like on the outside, there was no obvious keyhole, nor was there any obvious way of opening it, other than the dead digital panel discreetly concealed to the door's left. Bill slammed his palm against it in frustration. Why couldn't this be a normal house? Locke, check upstairs. Private, with me. I doubt we'll find anything so useful as a ladder in a place like this, so we'll have to use those recliners as steps. Let's get the others inside. Chapter 5 how the other half lived, somewhere in France. Chester opened a kitchen cupboard. It's nearly as bare as that ruined farm, he said, taking out the two boxes and placing them on the island next to the eight bottles of champagne. Two packets of rye and spelt crackers. To make it worse, the cupboards aren't made of wood. My first thought was aluminium, but considering the rest of the house, it's probably something far more exotic. There's more bottled water than we could carry, Bill said, closing the defunct fridge, which would be a boon if it wasn't for the snow. Locke and Khan entered the kitchen from the direction of the gallery room. You're empty-handed. That doesn't bode well, Bill said. Are there any clothes? How do you feel about ball gowns and backless dresses? Locke asked. Any maps? Bill asked. None, Khan said. No letters either. Then we still don't know where we are, Bill said. Those red lampposts outside are either another art installation, and this house is in the middle of nowhere, or we're at the edge of a town. I'm going to take a walk up the road and find out. I'll come with you, Locke said. Sergeant, do you have that grenade? Fish are the answer to our food situation, not scavenged cans. The sergeant looked at Bill. Why not? Bill said, though I'll add a fishing rod to the list of supplies we need. She's an odd fish, that Sorica Lock, Chester said, after Bill and Locke had left. 
Poor choice of words, I suppose. He looked about the kitchen. Has anyone looked in the garages yet? I'll go and take a look. You help him, Private, Khan said. I can manage, Chester said. I believe Mr. Hickson could do with a hand and a little privacy for a few minutes, Khan said. Ah, right. Come on, Amber, Chester said. He checked that his machete was loose in its scabbard. Did you always want to be a soldier? he asked, as they made their way through the sliding doors and back outside. Me? No way, Kessler said. My parents dreamed I'd be an artist. Really? Seems like an odd aspiration for their child, Chester said. Artists never made much money. We had money, Kessler said. A lot of money. So much that younger children didn't need careers, just full-time hobbies that were respectable. Oh, yeah, Chester said, trying the garage gates. So, uh, how did your family get rich? We're not going to open these doors. Let's try around the back. Crime? But the legal kind, Kessler said. During the gold rush in California, an ancestor bought and resold spent claims. His eldest son bought up farmland around Los Angeles during the Civil War, while his younger brothers died at Gettysburg. After the war, he bought up land along the railroad, built entire towns, and repeated the gold rush trick up north. When Mark Twain said buy land because no one's making it anymore, he was talking about my family. He really didn't like them. That's who we were, a footnote in history, hated by the great and good, until they found oil beneath the farms in California. That's when they became rich enough to become the great and good. As long as you stretch the definition of good to mean utter indifference. That's a rough legacy to carry. Ah, now we're talking, Chester said. At the side of the garage was a door. Unlike the front door and the gate that led onto the road, this had an old-fashioned key, which was still in the lock. Ready? Ready, Kessler said. He opened the door and stepped back. Nothing appeared. He took out his torch and shone it into the gloom, then knocked his machete against the door's frame. Still no sound came from the shadowy depths. They went inside. It took less than a minute to confirm the double garage was empty of the undead, and empty of nearly everything else. The car's electric, Chester said. There's a rake and broom over here, Kessler said. I can't see any other tools. But if she could afford a four million dollar painting, she could afford a gardener. It's really worth that much? Miss Locke says it's fake, Kessler said. But Lisa Kempton bought the original. Did you... Did you steal much artwork? Me? Nah, not really. Anything famous enough to be worth something is usually too famous to sell on. I did a few burglaries to order where the prize was the art, but I was only ever the wheel man on those operations. It was a case of me knowing the area. They'd have a specialist to take the pictures or statues to make sure that the right objects were stolen. A job like that, you only get one shot to pull it off. Huh. Chester picked up the rig. The handles would. That'll burn. Not sure there's anything else in here that will. Pity. I'll give Scott a few more minutes. So, uh, your parents didn't want you going into finance or something? Not me, but my older brother did, Kessler said. That's how it was in our family. The oldest inherited everything. Siblings got a small trust, enough for a comfortable life. And that's why you signed up. Me? <laughs> I didn't sign up. I was drafted. I didn't think the U.S. government did that anymore, Chester said. By the Admiral, in Cape Verde, she said. Before the outbreak, I went to Africa to, I don't know, to find myself, I guess. Find who I was, what I wanted. Don't get me wrong, my parents were nice people. Okay, no, they, they weren't nice, not really. But they weren't cruel. They had views on what was appropriate. God, I hate that word. Their houses, their clothes, their, their things... They had to be ultra-modern, but their views could be so old-fashioned. 
Life revolved around balls and garden parties and that damned country club. Winners at the ski lodge, summers at the coast. It was all so pointless, regimented. It was hard work not having to work. I'm not naive, or maybe I was. Maybe I didn't know how good I had it. I don't know. But you went to Africa. Yeah, out of revenge, I suppose, or... Well, I don't know anymore. But I went last summer. No, I mean the summer before the outbreak. I lose track of time sometimes. Me too, Chester said. Where in Africa did you go? Kenya? I was a teaching assistant at a school, a good one. It was terrible. It was a nice school. The kids were nice. It was a peaceful, safe, and secure place. There was the job. It made me miserable. It wasn't just that it was hard work. That was a shock, I guess. It was how supportive my parents were. That was the worst. You've lost me. It's hard to explain, Kessler said. I guess it was that my parents didn't mind that I was volunteering at a school halfway around the world. They just didn't care. I wasn't going to inherit, and in our family the inheritance, the tradition, the business, that was everything. As long as I didn't get in the way, cause trouble, create a scandal, I could do anything I wanted. In Kenya, I realized that I had no idea what that was. After three months, I quit and went traveling. In luxury. I'm not talking backpacks and hiking boots. I hitched rides on private trains and private jets until I ended up in Cape Verde. I was going to get a yacht ride home in March. Then came the outbreak. The people with the yacht, friends of my parents, they left without me. I was stranded there. The hotel staff took the food from the kitchens. It was, it was terrible. But then I met Major Lewis. Major Lewis? I don't think I met him. He was on leave. His sister-in-law came from Cape Verde, and he was visiting her family. They couldn't get to the wedding. Too expensive. He'd gone over to welcome them to the family. He was a good person. He died? In Belfast, when we salvaged the fuel from the airport. He was bitten. Infected. I had to shoot him. Ah, uh, I'm sorry. It's the way of the world, he said. It's what it's become, killing our friends. It's what we've learned to do, learn to be. Major Lewis kept me alive on Cape Verde, and got me onto the Admiral's ship. That's how he ended up in the Marines. I don't have to be. Back on Anglesey, the Admiral said I could quit, but what difference would it make? I'd be doing the exact same thing. Fighting to survive? That's it, isn't it? There aren't any civilians anymore. No soldiers either. It's just that some people have been fighting a little longer than others. And I'm still alive, she said. I doubt my family survived. They lived like that woman did in this house. Other people did the cooking, the shopping, the work. Without them, they wouldn't stand a chance. Without Major Lewis, I wouldn't have. Best not to think about it, Chester said. And I'd say that we've given Scott long enough. We'll get a fire going and see if we can figure out how to cook an owl. Despite that I agree with Locke about where we need to look for more food, I do hope she and Bill might scrounge up something a little more familiar to eat. Chapter 6 Footprints in the Snow Somewhere in France Bill clambered up the recliner, leaning against the mansion's gate. At the top, he checked the road was still empty, jumped down the other side and slipped on the slush, drenching his already soaked feet. Boots, food and clothes, he said, as Locke jumped down. That's what we need, and in that order. He sniffed. They've got the fire started. Good. We'll have a warm hearth when we return. Locke unslung her rifle. After you, Mr. Wright. Why does it sound like a challenge when you say that? Because you have an innately suspicious mind, she said. He let it go. Is that painting really a forgery? I doubt Lisa's is a forgery. 
Locke said. Then again, perhaps I'm wrong. It will be impossible to confirm now. And it's worth four million. That is what Lisa paid for the original. Hmm. They crouched on. I'm worried about Mr. Hickson, Locke said. We won't get far with him in this state. And I've already told you that we're not leaving him behind, Bill said. I wasn't proposing to, Locke said. I don't leave people behind. You did in Ireland. In Elysium, Bill said. Only because I thought they were dead, Locke said. Had I known, I... I don't need to explain myself to you. But who else is left? Bill replied. Silence settled for the length of time it took to pass the end of the house's perimeter wall and the next four lampposts beyond. What I was trying to ensure you understand, Locke said, is that we've managed three miles today. That is an optimistic estimate. With warmer clothes and better shoes, and with food inside us, we might manage five miles tomorrow. Even if the weather improves, we'll cover less than ten miles a day over the next week. Meaning, if we continue like this, it will take us at least a fortnight to reach the coast. We can't expect Mr. Tull to wait offshore for that long, nor can we hope to reach the same stretch of coast at the same time. We'll look for bikes, Bill said. Perhaps if the snow melts we might search for fuel and a car, unless you have a better plan. The present, no, Locke said. Considering the density of those clouds, we might consider looking for skis. What I'm trying to say, what I'm trying to make sure you understand, is that unless we reach the coast before Mr. Tull and leave signs and messages at likely landing sites, there is very little chance that we'll stumble across the search party. The further we get from the plane wreck, the less the chance of an aerial rescue. Meaning you want to go to Denmark? No, that would be twice the distance, Locke said. Then what are you proposing? Nothing, Locke said. I have no better suggestion. Rescue is unlikely either here or once we reach the coast. They trudged onward. What about Paris? Bill asked. You said you have a house there. An overnight refuge. Its resources have probably been expended. We'll find nothing there. We'll find food, Bill said. We found food in London, in Belfast. We'll find it in Paris. But I was really thinking about the satellites. Even if they find the plane, they'll have difficulty pinpointing its location in relation to the coast. What they might do is look for a landmark. The Eiffel Tower will be an obvious one. We could— Zombie! Locke cut in. It's dead. The corpse was partially buried in snow. Its head, shoulder and one arm stuck out above the drift. Its head isn't— Bill began— but was interrupted by a guttural groan, and then a cracking creak as the zombie dragged itself out of the ice. It's not quite dead yet, Bill said, swinging his machete in a sweeping uppercut that sliced into the slowly moving creature's skull. It collapsed, the dark gore leaching into the ice. My mistake, Locke said. I apologize. Not entirely a mistake, Bill said. Another few days, it'll be frozen solid. Perhaps, Locke said. But as that would just defer the danger until spring, it's not as cheering a thought as you might think. The Eiffel Tower, or any other landmark, presents a similar problem to reaching the coast. We'd have to reach Paris before the satellite is overhead. Once they've orientated the satellites, they'll move them away from Paris but we won't know whether we arrived in time until or unless the helicopter arrives. That said, if we get to the point where we decide rescue is unlikely, and we are to spend any considerable time in France, I would vote we go to Paris. Why? Bill asked, suspicion returning. The Mona Lisa, Mr. Wright. If there is a piece of art worth risking our lives to save, it is that. There's a house behind those bushes. Shall we see if we can find out where we are? Unlike the mansion of which they'd taken refuge, this home was of a far more traditional design. An L-shaped one-story dwelling with a red-tiled roof and cream-white painted walls. The windows were intact, but the front door was open. So, too, were the doors of the runabout parked outside. My French isn't great, 
Bill said, but does that bumper sticker mean this car came from Lille? Les professeurs de Lille sont l'exception à toutes les règles. Teachers from Lille are the exception to every rule. Locke translated, I don't think it means anything. The driver's side door has been forced open, Bill said. The car was hot-wired, came here after the outbreak, and without much in the back. We'll check inside. You take point, Locke said, as she slung the rifle and drew the hunting knife. Bill crossed the front door and knocked with a machete. He was growing to dislike the blade. Rohinder Singh's design had been determined by what pre-cut steel was available, but the blade was too long for narrow internal corridors, yet not long enough to keep the undead at a safe distance. He knocked the blade against the door again. The hinges screeched as the door jutted open. From somewhere inside came an echoing creak. It was probably just the building settling. Probably, but perhaps not. More alert than before, he stepped over the threshold. From the photographs lining the hallway, the house had belonged to an older couple with one daughter. They'd owned a farm when they'd married, and when they'd had their only child somewhat later in life. In the living room, a cosy den of bright rugs, blankets, and a wood-burning stove, the photographs of the farm were replaced with those of the girl at school, the young woman of college, and somewhere far hotter than France, before finally looking somewhat abashed in the centre of a class photograph, surrounded by mostly smiling children. He crossed to the nearest doorway, quickly scanning one room, then the next. Lounge, kitchen, toilet, semi-enclosed sunroom, master bedroom, bathroom, another bedroom, a third. Empty, he said, finally lowering the heavy blade. If you start with the kitchen, I'll start with the bedrooms. We'll see what's here that we can use. The master bedroom wardrobe provided a pair of walking boots. They were a size too big, but he found socks in the drawer. After the briefest hesitation, he decided to be selfish, kicked off his sodden shoes and dragged off his soaking socks, almost relishing the cold air on his feet. When his hands caught against his drenched trousers, he decided to go the whole hog. Three minutes later, he'd completely changed. The clothing wasn't a perfect fit, but it was clean, dry, and far more suited to the outdoors than the gear he'd brought with him. He laced the boots and left the room, returning to the entrance hall where he found Locke. There's clothes, Bill said, and a normal assortment of the usual possessions. Did you find anything in the kitchen? It's empty, Locke said, stripped bare. Interesting, Bill said. No one touched the rest of the house. There's a couple of suitcases in the back of the cupboard. I'd say the daughter came back for her parents and they all left together. You like doing that, don't you? Doing what? Coming up with a happy ending. It's better than the alternative, Bill said. But if that car out front belonged to the daughter, then who hotwired it? Try to hotwire it, Locke said, and the answer is the same people who looted the kitchen. I imagine they wanted an easier method of carrying their loot than Shanks's pony, but discovered the car's battery was dead. Perhaps. Bill said. No zombies outside, no obvious piles of corpses. There could be some buried beneath the snow, of course, but it doesn't look like a battle was fought here, or anywhere along this stretch of road. Without many zombies in the area, the sound of an engine might be a risk worth taking to save the effort. Did they take everything, even the salt and pepper? Locke said. Then they walked here and walked back. Let's fill up a suitcase with clothing and check a few more houses. You understand that we might need a new plan, Locke said. Yes, Bill said. Whoever it is, they might still be in the area. It might be connected to the smoke we saw before we crashed, and they might be the people who killed those two in the barn. They might be dangerous, they might not, but they've probably searched every house nearby. I say we check a few more houses, see what we can find and see if we can find any answers to all these questions that are stacking up. Or we could look for a river, Locke said, 
we could fish and forage. Easy to say. Five minutes later, they had two suitcases by the door, containing enough clothing for their entire party. No letters, Bill said. No address book. Someone must have taken them for kindling. It's frustrating, because I'd like to know where we are. Does it matter? Locke asked. Either we continue along this road, ultimately heading to the coast, or we turn south. Where precisely we are doesn't have any bearing on that. Bill shook his head. Locke's point was valid, but her sanguine detachment was far less reassuring than Kim's upbeat pragmatism. We'll check a few more houses, and then head back. The next house wasn't as far from the one-story bungalow as that was from the mansion, and before they reached it they came to a corpse. This time, it was a corpse. The body was slumped against the trunk of a fir, whose lower branches had been long ago trimmed. The upper branches had kept away the worst of the snow. A light dusting lay across the woman's legs, but nothing obscured the bullet hole in her skull. Zombie, I think, Bill said. Probably. It's the way she's sitting against the tree. I can't think how a zombie would die like that. I would say that she was shot a week ago, Locke said, about the same time as the people in the barn. Beyond the corpse, the front door to the next house was open. They went inside to confirm the kitchen had been stripped, then continued along the road. Locke took the lead, easily outpacing Bill. She marched past the next house, and then the next. The buildings grew closer together, until, fourteen houses later, they reached a crossroads. Some houses were bungalows, some had two stories. Some were old, some relatively new. What they all had in common was that the doors had been opened. According to the compass, Bill said, glancing between it and the roads leading from the junction, we have a choice between north and due west, more or less. Those bodies don't help us make a decision. Three corpses lay on the road to the west, two on the road to the north, all partially buried in snow, but all unmistakably undead. We go north, Locke said. Are you sure? Bill asked. Can't you smell it? Locke said. Bill sniffed. Would smoke? Isn't that just the mansion? No. It's coming from the north. You think the fire is close? It has to be. Then it can't be the smoke we spotted from the air. There's no way we've walked far enough. A better question is whether it was lit by friendly hands, Locke said. That's an argument for going west, then, Bill said. Look down. Look backward, Locke said. We've left footprints in the snow. If they're hostile, they can follow us back to the mansion. We can't outpace them, not while carrying the pilot. Nor can we leave anyone there while we go in search of supplies. Even without the footprints, they'd be able to follow the smoke from our own fire. And so, we can't go back to the mansion to get reinforcements either, Bill said. He checked his belt, and the pistol holstered there. Right. Advance. Hope they're not hostile. If they are, retreat back to the mansion where we have the high ground, a high wall, and Sergeant Khan and his rifle. Once again, I wish I had a better plan, Block said. The northward road led uphill. Bill stopped counting his steps and started counting corpses. After twelve bodies, all of which had almost certainly been undead, they reached a signpost. One arm read Fleurine. The other... Chateau de Saint-Christophe ou Chateau d'Argon. The sign had been knocked askew, so that both arms pointed towards opposite sets of houses. Have you heard of either of those places? Bill asked. No, but a castle would be a logical place to find survivors, unless it's a chateau in the modern sense of a grand house, she sniffed. The scent of wood smoke is growing stronger. It wasn't visible above the towering pine trees, each fifty feet tall or higher, shielding one property from its neighbors. Must be a big fire, Bill said. After another trio of broken open houses, two cars were skewed across the road. Before them lay a mound of rotting bones. 
the vehicles had acted as a snow break, leaving the bodies uncovered. They're wearing uniforms, Bill said. They must have died at the beginning of the outbreak. He scanned the trees, then peered into the vehicles. Can't see why they'd set up a blockade here. Hello, bonjour, Locke called out. There was no reply. I don't want to be mistaken for a zombie by any sentry they've deployed, she added. Bill pushed himself onto the roof of a car. No footprints in the snow, so I don't think there's a sentry nearby. But I think I can see smoke about three or four hundred yards away. Bill looked down at the corpses, then back the way they'd come. But it was too late to turn around. Whatever this is, he said, jumping down, whoever they are... Let's get it over with. Chapter 7 A School for Vampires Florine, France The smoke wasn't billowing from a castle, but from a bonfire smouldering in a farm's courtyard. Set back from the road, the wide gate had been reinforced with metal sheets, but only to a height of five feet. A jumble of barbed wire had been added to that, hanging loose over the join with a lock post, then continuing along a chain-link fence that disappeared into the trees. The entrance was wide enough for an industrial vehicle, evidenced by the tanker parked twenty yards from the bonfire. The tanker was plain white, completely devoid of warning signs or company brand, but its proximity to the fire suggested that it didn't contain anything flammable. Behind the tanker, were a trio of cars and a pair of rusting four-by-fours. Beyond those was a quartet of small windowed outbuildings, blocking the view of what lay behind. When first lit, and based on the diameter of ash and melted snow, flames from the bonfire had to have risen as high as the main building's roof. That building was an odd construct, covered in flaking whitewash. Two stories high, and long and wide, it had a sloping roof that would restrict the height of the upper floor to five feet close to the eaves. It reminded Bill of the seasonal bunkhouses that the Mastertons had on their Northumberland farm, freezing in winter, baking in summer. It would only suit a one-season worker, whom you knew would never return for a second harvest. Next to a windowless door was an external spiral staircase, the stairs ascended to a balcony deep enough for a leather armchair, table, and a threadbare sun umbrella. Sitting in the chair was a man, wearing a battered leather jacket, dirty black combat trousers, a bright red woolen hat, and almost matching scarf. Before Bill could call out, the man turned his head and saw them. He jumped up, grabbing a carbine. The barrel knocked into the balcony's steel rod railing before being aimed at them. Arrêtez-vous! Hello? Bill called back. It's all right, we're people. Alive. Nous sommes en vie, Locke said. The man lowered the barrel a little. English? he asked. No, monsieur, Irlandais, Locke said and then continued in rapid-fire French that Bill failed to understand. He took it as a good sign when the man replied, and a better one when the carbine was lowered, until it was being held more casually in his arms. The French was rapid and involved, far beyond the classroom language Bill had rarely used beyond the bars of Strasbourg. He did pick out a few words, of which avion was the most illuminating, but the increasingly relaxed tone from both Locke and the Frenchman calmed his nerves. Finally, the man nodded, turned around, and went inside. Well? Bill asked. The fire was for our benefit, Locke said. They saw the plane overhead and lit the fire so that we would find them. Ah, then they weren't the lights that I saw from the air. Are they friendly? And is it them or him? It's a small group but they are part of a larger group. They only arrived here a few days ago. I'm not sure exactly when. It's been a while since I had to speak French, and my vocabulary is better suited to the casinos of Monte Carlo than a quasi-military standoff. 
I'm thinking about the barn, Bill said. So am I, Locke said. But I... Before she could finish, the door opened, and the sentry stepped out onto the balcony. With him was another man. He wore the same style of combat trousers, but over his chest was a plain T-shirt. Around forty, his head was shaved, but his face was bearded. The hair squared off two inches below his chin. Dark-eyed, sallow-skinned, his bare arms were muscled and tattooed, the left bearing a long scar, visible even from such a distance. Bill guessed a military background was the most likely explanation for the scar, but he was more interested in the explanation for the T-shirt. Clearly, they had heating inside. Now he was listening for it. He heard the soft chug of a generator. That meant fuel, and possibly a far quicker method of reaching the coast. The leader addressed Locke, and this time Bill didn't understand a single word. After a minute, he gave Locke and Bill a gruff wave and went back inside. We're being invited in, Locke said, as the sentry ran down the spiral stairs. He'd slung his carbine and left it on his shoulder as he fished for a loop of keys attached to a chain around his belt. He grinned as he fumbled with the padlocks. It might have been a friendly expression if his mouth wasn't missing so many teeth. Come, the sentry said in halting English. Come, inside, please. Thanks very much, Bill said. I'm Bill Wright. Pleasure to meet you. He held out his hand. The guard stared at it for a moment, almost as if it was an alien gesture. Philippe Laurent, he said, taking Bill's hand. Please, come. Locke said something in French, but the man only responded with a shrug. As soon as they were through the gate, Laurent locked it again. They followed Laurent towards the spiral stairs. At the top, the guard turned to them and gave a curt instruction, though with a smile. What was that? Bill asked. We have to leave our weapons outside, Locke said. She put her rifle at the top of the steps. Bill hesitated a fraction longer. Bill, please, Locke said. Trust me, it's all fine. The trouble was that he didn't trust Locke. There was plenty she hadn't told him, and little of what she had said that he believed. She could have sabotaged the plane and engineered where they crashed if she'd been able to communicate with her people in France. As far-fetched as that seemed, Lisa Kempton had owned a satellite network. What other contingencies had she established? Bill, Locke prompted. Regardless, he had no choice. He unbuttoned his weapons belt, placed it on the wrought iron balcony, and went inside. On first sight, his guess at the building's original purpose was confirmed. The room, five feet high at the eaves, taller in the centre, ran halfway the length of the building. It was a communal eating living space, and no doubt the bunk rooms were on the floor below, but his attention was taken by the people. Not counting the sentry, there were two other men in the room. The bearded leader was propped on a massive oak table, his hands on either side gripping the edge. Each arm had a tattoo. The arm covered by the scar had what might have been a military tattoo. His other arm bore a faded tricolor above a branch wrapped in barbed wire from which extended three circular leaves. Was it a unit badge of some kind? Standing arms folded to his left was a man of about the same age, mid-forties to the century's mid-twenties, and an inch shy of six feet. Like the leader, he was bald-headed and bearded. There was a similarity in their appearance, and a similar three-leaf tattoo on his folded arm. They weren't brothers, but perhaps cousins? Perhaps it was just that they were dressed alike, their clothing tattered and worn, tending towards filthy. Bill knew well enough that cleanliness was no longer a guide to goodliness, and after so long among the luxuries of Anglesey, he shouldn't judge. Bonjour, Bill said with a wide smile, and I'm afraid that's about the extent of my French. 
Monsieur, Locke began, and Bill had soon lost the thread. Instead, he smiled and made an ostentatious show of enjoying the heat while he took in the room. It was a cut above the cheap accommodation that the Mastertons had offered their seasonal workers. The skylights were wide and broad, letting in enough natural light that artificial illumination would only be required at night. The windows were double-glazed, keeping in the heat from the pair of glowing red three-bar fires at the room's far end. The heaters might be ancient, but the cabling was new, snaking off from a multi-plug and through an equally new hole in a door at the room's far end. Next to the multi-plug, other than cables trailing to the TV, were a trio of fridges whose size matched the gaps beneath the counter of the kitchenette. The pair of ovens hadn't been removed, but on top of the hob were a pair of stained hot plates. The sinks were still used for their original purpose. At least, they were full of dirty crockery. The scent of turmeric hung heavy in the air, but Bill had already forgotten food. He tried to estimate how much fuel these people had if they were willing to waste so much. It wasn't just the fridges, though he was curious what they might be storing inside, but the television as well. The screen was seventy inches wide and almost certainly hadn't been in the bunkhouse before the outbreak. His eye caught the stack of Blu-rays next to the player. He recognized a stylized woman on the cover, with her wild blue and white hair carrying a scythe. It was a cartoon that Annette had watched back on Anglesey, and for which he'd got an hour-long lecture for calling a cartoon. Someone among the collective of coders had introduced her to it, most likely Mirabel. It was a Japanese story, something to do with vampires at a European boarding school. Considering the weaponry stacked around the room, it was not the kind of show he'd expect such hardened men to watch, but in the days of VOD, perhaps those were the only discs that could be found. Next to the television was a pile of guns. Hunting rifles dominated, though he counted two farmers' shotguns, at least four military-grade shotguns, and an FN P-90. The personal defense weapon was one of the few whose proper name he knew, but only because he'd assumed that it was a gun invented for Hollywood before he'd seen the anti-terrorist police carrying them in Brussels. Between those and a battered sofa were a score of backpacks, all either blue or red, and all with fluorescent stripes. Were they go-bags in case they were overrun? A cog slowly clicked against a mental gear, but before it could fall into place, Locke spoke. Did you catch much of that, Bill? She asked. Uh, no, not really, he said. The short version is that they saw our plane flying overhead and ran outside to light their bonfire. Ah, so that wasn't the smoke we saw from the air. What's the longer version? That they haven't been here long. Not in this building. Soon after the outbreak they heard rumors about Britain having a vaccine. They headed to the coast, thinking they might find a boat and cross the channel. Instead they found refugees from England who told them the truth about the vaccine. After that they came inland. They were heading to Paris when they heard a second-hand account of Marseille's destruction. A mushroom cloud, Bill. Ah, do they know of any other bombs? Not with certainty. They avoided cities just in case, and have been moving from place to place, looking for somewhere secure. Which brings us to where we are. It's a place called Fleurine. A village, I think, about sixty kilometers north of Paris, and about two hundred and fifty kilometers south-southeast of Calais. Two hundred and fifty? That's a lot further from the coast than I hoped. If they came from the coast, do they know a safe route back? For that matter, do they know of any refuges along the coast or places we should avoid? He glanced at the lights, but was conscious that the Frenchman probably understood English. The last thing he wanted was for them to think that he and Locke were a threat, and asking about precious supplies of fuel would certainly make them think that. Locke fired off another string of rapid French. Bill glanced around the room. Something was wrong. 
off, out of place. He almost had it when Locke spoke. You're to take Philippe Laurent back to the others, she said, and bring them all here. You're not coming? he asked. Now, William, she said with a smile, you know me. Given the choice between a comfortable chair in the warm or a hike across a river, which do I always pick? She grinned, and Bill forced a wry chuckle. Something was wrong, very wrong, but he hadn't a clue what message she was trying to give. Fair enough, just save some of the food for us. He turned around to face Laurent. After you, then. Laurent reached the door and had opened it when a high-pitched scream rent the air. Bill turned around and saw Locke barreling towards him. She pushed him outside, and in turn, he pushed Laurent before him. Laurent toppled over the balcony, and it was all Bill could do to stop himself from following. Laurent screamed as he landed hard. Locke pushed Bill away from the door, and halfway down the spiral staircase. Then the grenade detonated. The door flew outwards, as glass and the skylights exploded upwards. Bill shook his head, trying to dislodge the ringing. The grenade? he asked, knowing he was yelling. Why? Clear downstairs, Locke said. I've got up here, she said no more, but ran through the broken door back into the building. Bill decided that for once it was best not to think. He looked for his weapons, but his belt was nowhere to be seen. A scream came again, but this one was from Laurent. Bill ran down the stairs. Laurent's legs were broken, twisted at the wrong angle, but his hands covered his face. Bill hesitated, uncertain, until he remembered that first scream, the one that had come from downstairs. He ran to the ground floor door, reaching it just as it opened. Another man came out, again dressed in black trousers, though his were jeans, again in a T-shirt, though his was splattered with blood. Again, shaved-headed, again with that same tattoo of a branch with three leaves. The man saw Laurent, saw Bill, and swung his fist. Ten months ago, it would have been no contest. Ten months ago, Bill would have died. But a year was a long time living a brutal nightmare. He ducked under the fist, skipping back a pace, trying to give himself time to think. But this wasn't one of the undead. The man reached for his belt, his hand curling around the hilt of a knife. As it was drawn, Bill dived forward, right hand reaching for the knife, swinging his left palm into the man's throat. The man staggered back as the knife came free. Bill gripped his wrist as the man tried to raise the knife. The man's hand curled around Bill's throat. Bill slammed his left palm into the man's neck. The man bent, wincing, coughing. As the man tugged at the knife, and as Bill pushed, the blade slid into the man's stomach. He winced, eyes going wide, then let go of Bill's neck. Reflexively, Bill pulled the knife free. Its blade was wickedly serrated. The man hissed. His hands desperately covered the wound as he fell to his knees, then to the ground, blood pouring around his fingers. Without emergency surgery, he'd die, and so the man was already dead. Bill tossed the knife aside and bent down, grabbing the pistol at the man's belt. The man reached for Bill's wrist, but his grasp was already weak, easily shaken off. Bill stepped back, but didn't fire. Instead, he ran inside. The door led to a long corridor, with doors leading to the left. He pushed the first open, revealing a narrow chamber containing two sets of bunk beds and a narrow bank of lockers, the doors of which had been forced open. All the beds had sheets and blankets. Someone had been sleeping in there, and recently... The next door led to a similar chamber, again with four cots, again with sheets, blankets, and pillows. 
he opened the next door, and the next, checking that the rooms were empty until he reached the second room from the end. It contained a generator, still chugging away, and a score of fuel containers next to it. The cable led from the generator through a hole in the ceiling. He heard a cough. It came from next door. The room was marked La Salle d'Eau. Outside a shotgun leaned against a chair, on which was a neatly folded jacket. Inside the shower room, a woman was tied to a chair. Her face was bloody, with more blood trailing to an already clogged drain. A gag covered her mouth, but it was her hair that made Bill stop. Dyed blue and white, it matched the cover art on the Blu-ray box upstairs. Now he saw it on a living person. The style reminded him of the two young men whose bodies they'd found in the barn. It's okay, Bill said. I'm here to help. She stared at him, unblinking, as he looked about for something to cut the ropes. He had plenty of choice. A ninety-six-piece tool set lay on the tiled floor, open, with the trays extended. Most of the tools were stained with blood, with equally bloody fingerprints left on the yellow plastic handles. He selected a thin saw. The woman didn't flinch as he cut through the ropes, nor did she move when her hands were free. Only when he dropped the saw and stepped backward did she finally remove the gag from her mouth. Are you okay? he asked. She spat a mouthful of blood on the floor. La guette de l'ouest, sont-ils morts? I'm sorry, I don't understand, he said. I've got to check the rest of the building. I'll be back soon. Outside, the man he'd stabbed was motionless. Laurent twitched erratically. Will ran to the spiral staircase and had made it upstairs to the fractured doorframe when the ground floor door opened. The woman ran out. In her hands was a shotgun that had been leaning on the chair outside her cell. She limped over to the dead man and fired point-blank into his face. She pumped another round into the chamber and shot Laurent again in the face. She turned around and looked up. She was young, he realized, under twenty, certainly. She met his eyes, then turned away and ran for the gate. Wait, Bill called, taking a step back down the stairs. The woman ignored him. She reached the gate, pulled on the padlock, then swung the shotgun up and blew the lock apart. She threw the gate open and ran away without another backward glance. Damn it! Bill turned around and headed back up the stairs, reaching the shattered doorway in time to see Locke heading towards him. She had a shotgun in her hands, another on her shoulder. Downstairs, she asked. It's clear? Clear. They had a prisoner, a woman, a teenager, I'd say. She was tied up. I cut her free, she took a shotgun, finished the other two, and then blew the padlock off the gate. She ran. There were two of them. The sentry and someone, I'd say, was a torturer. I see. There was another man up here, she said. What just happened? Bill asked. That was the grenade Khan gave you. You had it ready. What did they say? It was what they didn't say, Locke said. They were interested in us only until I revealed the plane had crashed and we had no way of communicating with the rest of our people. They were here for a few days but lit the bonfire as soon as the plane came overhead. Look at that bonfire. It must have taken weeks to gather the wood. If they didn't build it, who did? And what for? The woman's hair was dyed in a two-tone effect, the same as the blue ray case, the same as the people in the barn, Bill said. The bags by the door, those are similar to the bags we found in that crumbling barn. I'll admit I didn't notice that, but I saw the bags, the firearms, the supplies. It didn't tally with the number of people they claimed lived here. I assumed the others were hiding in the back. Ah... There's more, isn't there? he said. That's enough to be suspicious, and what I saw downstairs certainly confirms your suspicion was correct. But it's not enough on its own to warrant throwing a grenade into their midst. 
was the tattoo, she said. You saw it. Which one? The three-leafed branch wrapped with barbed wire. I know that tattoo, and that particular variant is only inked in prison. It's a story for later. The explosion and those shotgun blasts might summon the undead here. She held out a shotgun. Bill took it. Gather what food you can, and ammunition, I guess. I want to check those outbuildings. He knew what he'd find, and he found them in the low building furthest from the gate. He took his time, looking at each barely decayed face. In death, all were ridiculously young. All had a two-tone effect in their hair. He counted nine, men and women, though really they were boys and girls. All had been murdered, stabbed and cut, and left to bleed out in agony. One by one, killed slowly, so that the living could hear them die. What was worse, somehow, was that theirs weren't the only corpses. Twice the number of zombies lay beneath the bodies of the slain living. He closed the door and left them in peace. More packets than cans, Locke said, passing him a bag, and more junk food than anything nutritious. Calories are calories, Bill said. I see that the movement towards healthy living passed you by, Locke said. They had hundreds of shotgun cartridges. None of the carbines had a silencer. She slung her shotgun, walked across the slush and mud yard, picked up her rifle, and fired a shot into the trees. Seems to work. Was there any ammo for our rifles? Bill asked. Not to speak of. Other than the shotgun cartridges, there's ammunition for the pistols, some for revolvers, but it's mostly ammunition for a hunting rifle. Did you check the fridges? From the smell they'd stored fish, though they were currently stuck with beer and wine. Hmm. There's fuel and a generator on the ground floor. We should look for the young woman and then get back before Sergeant Khan comes looking for us. We've been gone longer than we said. We'll return for fuel and supplies. Agreed, Locke said. I take it you found bodies in one of the outbuildings. Nine of them, Bill said. Plus the two we found in the barn and the woman who escaped, all are accounted for. Based on the bags? Based on the product description on the back of the Blu-ray case, Locke said. Twelve good vampires were tasked with holding off the forces of evil that for some reason opened a portal beneath their school. Vampires holding off the forces of evil? They picked that story to define their lives after the outbreak. Why not? It makes as much sense as a myth of knights or a fable about democracy. Bill walked across the slush-covered, blood-smeared, ash-coated yard and picked up his weapons belt. He buckled it. So tell me about this tattoo. Later, Block said. Let's find that woman before she freezes to death. Chapter 8 The Rosewood Cartel The Mansion Florine What happened to the young woman? Sergeant Khan asked, after Bill had recounted what had transpired at the farm. We tracked her footprints through the snow, but they disappeared into the trees, Locke said. Dressed like she is, in shock, in pain, with no supplies. She'll die. We decided to stop chasing her in the hope that she'll return to her former base and resupply. And you knew it was a trap because of the tattoo? Khan asked. A tattoo of three circular leaves on a single branch, Locke said, looking at Chester. Rosewood leaves. You mean they were members of the Rosewood Cartel? Chester asked. You know them? Kessler asked. I doubt I know those specific criminals, Chester said, but I've heard of the cartel. He won't have known these individuals, Locke said. On their tattoo, the branch was entwined with barbed wire with eleven barbs. It's a design specific to a prison in southern France. Then how do you know about them? Kessler asked. Because Lisa and I and our organization try to save the world, Locke said. Quigley and his cabal of politicians weren't the only threat. 
nor was nuclear war. Global temperature rises, falling crop yields, antibiotic-resistant viruses, the threats were legion. Compared to those, the Rosewood cartel was a mosquito, one carrying a particularly virulent disease, yet still an insignificant insect. It's some coincidence, isn't it? Sergeant Khan asked. Are these people you were tracking end up here, of all places? Sorry, I'm giving the wrong impression, Locke said. The cartel is more of a franchise operation, a union even. They deal in the trafficking of drugs, guns and people. Everyone from Colombian farmer to Parisian dealer was a member of the organization, and there are tens of thousands of members. Membership doesn't come with a magazine subscription or an annual conference. It's simply a way of reducing unnecessary turf wars, hijacking of cargoes, and in the case of prisons, people turning evidence. Loyalty is absolute because the punishment for disobedience is death. This enables them to keep crime and violence within their territories, their streets, their estates, their slums, lower than surrounding areas, thus reducing the interest of police and bolstering the standing of local politicians in their pocket. And they all wear that tattoo? Kessler asked. I'd have thought someone would have noticed. It's a prison tattoo, Chester said, and in some prisons you take whatever protection you can get, and so recruit new foot soldiers, Locke said. At the top, the organization is about money, power. To keep order at the bottom, they preach localized versions of ethno-nationalism, as such, the tattoo is worn by people with varying ethnic backgrounds whose history is one of conflict with each other. The tattoo itself has often been dismissed as simply a piece of prison art. Not by everyone, of course, but as I say, they're careful to keep the appearance of violence within their territories low, and so overworked police forces are less inclined to pay them attention. In case I'm not clear, I mean, they were very good at hiding the bodies. Over the years, the cartel has replaced the police and politicians they first bought with their own members and fellow travellers. This gives them further cover, all in the pursuit of the almighty dollar. It's not a new idea, Bill said, organised crime getting truly organised. It just hasn't happened on this scale before, Locke said. Mr. Wright, do you recall the NATO exercises in the North Sea two years ago? Probably not. Wait, you mean when the Russians sent a military convoy straight through the battleground, claiming they had every right since it was international waters? I remember that, Khan said. We were put on high alert. One accidental shot could have started a real war. And meanwhile, while the eyes of the world and their intelligence assets watch the North Sea, a freighter containing thirty tons of cocaine arrived in Spain. They almost started World War Three, so they could smuggle some drugs? Kessler asked. That's insane. How did they manage it? Khan asked. Because it suited the cabal to increase global tensions in preparation for Prometheus, Locke said. The cabal and the cartel had a mutually beneficial arrangement. Both viewed honest politicians and inquisitive journalists as a threat. For the cabal, having a reporter killed in some random drive-by shooting, or a senator found dead of an overdose, presented far fewer questions than an assassination. The cartel received intelligence on Coast Guard patrols, and in some cases, the workings of the most secretive of task forces. Are you saying their presence here has something to do with the outbreak? Kessler asked. Not at all, Locke said. That tattoo, or a variant, was worn by hundreds within the French prison system. Thousands more who'd been released, and tens of thousands across Europe. I don't know which category these men fell into, but I know the cloth from which they were raggedly cut. And on the basis of a prison tattoo, you pulled a pin from the grenade, Bill said. Events proved me correct, Locke said. For the last fifteen years, while you played narcissistic games with the pettiest of differences, I fought a war with the very highest stakes, a war where there was no margin for error, no quarter, no opportunity for doubt. It was act or die. And that young woman will die out there on her own, Khan said. I'm going to look for her. You'll chase her away, Locke said. 
We don't leave anyone behind, Khan said. A nice sentiment, Locke said, though I trust that courtesy doesn't extend to those thugs. She pushed herself to her feet. I'll show you the way. I'll come too, Chester said. I could do with stretching my legs. On balance, no, Locke said. Meaning no disrespect, Mr. Carson, but you don't cut the most comforting of figures. Perhaps Private Kessler would like to join us. Seeing a young woman her own age might set her mind at ease. Bill stood on the upturned chair propped against the gate, waiting until Locke and the two Marines were out of sight before climbing down and returning inside. Scott was still asleep. It was better to assume it was sleep and that he was healing. What was clear, even if it hadn't been for the delay caused by the confrontation, was that they wouldn't travel any further today. Leaving Chester to unpack and sort through the bags they'd brought back from the farm, Bill went upstairs to keep watch from the upper story, taking only his overly grim thoughts for company. The upper level of the house had been designed around the view, the better portion of which was to the rear of the property. The master bedroom's tall windows offered an unspoiled panorama of the snow-covered fields. That was not the direction from which danger would come. At the front of the house, on the other side of a wastefully large landing, was an office of sorts. It had an archaic writing table, a trio of high-backed office chairs, and a rotary phone. All the furniture and fittings were white, not painted, nor plastic-coated, but made of some white material that except for the colour looked like wood. The phone had no cord, nor was there a light in the room, not even a switch, but there was a window that looked out over the front gate. He pulled the chair close to the window, sat, and almost immediately regretted it. It was the most uncomfortable chair he'd ever come across. He decided the entire room was an art installation. As he scanned the road outside the house, he tried to focus on the underlying meaning in the room's design, but his mind kept returning to the bitterly cruel reality that always settled after a battle. If they'd arrived a few days sooner, they would have found the twelve youngsters before the murderers did. That, if the plane hadn't malfunctioned, they would never have come to this corner of France was beyond academic. It was the same in Ireland. If they'd arrived a few days sooner, they would have saved more than Siobhan, Colum, and their group. It was the same everywhere, with every confrontation. If he'd acted sooner, more people would be alive. The converse was that if they'd arrived in Ireland a few days later, Siobhan, Colum, and the Irish children would probably be dead. If the plane hadn't malfunctioned, the girl here in France would have been murdered. That wasn't comforting, because looking at the monochrome landscape, he found his mind drawn back to a hot summer's evening on Anglesey. For a few brief hours of utter joy, he, Kim, Sholto and the girls sat in the sunshine, thinking the worst was over. They talked about searching for survivors, about building a radio mast, even a flying drones across Europe. The murder of David Llewellyn had distracted them. Then there'd been the ill-fated expedition to Ireland, the election, Bishop, and all the rest. Yes, they had saved lives, but if they'd not taken an evening off, if they'd worked harder, it was indisputably true that more lives could have been saved. Perhaps it would mean that some they'd saved would have died, but more people on aggregate would be alive. Perhaps. 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 Chester's feet clunked against the probably not glass as he climbed the stairs. How's Scott? Bill asked. Still asleep, Chester said. And I think it is sleep, nothing worse. Odd room, this. I assume it's art, Bill said. Ah, uh, maybe. I was thinking the same about those stairs. Not what you'd call practical. No. It's the kind of dream house built by someone who suddenly comes into money. Bill said. That's the theory I'm going with. Sounds about right. 
Chester said, taking a seat and almost immediately standing up. Has to be art, otherwise it's torture. Bad choice of words, Bill said. Ah, oh, sorry. He'd found a toolkit, seemed to be working his way through it one tool at a time. There's been a lot of that. Torture, I mean. It's not surprising, Chester said. The presence of police, of laws, of justice was all that kept most people's dark thoughts inside their head. Bill turned away from the window. You really think so? Don't you? Isn't that one of the core principles of policing, that you make people police themselves? I steered clear of law and order, Bill said, turning back to the view. You can't win an election on prison reform. You know about this cartel? I'd heard the name, sure, Chester said. They were making a bit for some of the drug routes in southern England. But that was my bag. I knew enough to steer clear of them. Yet Locke knew them, Bill said. Knew of them, Chester said. Thugs and gangsters recruited in prison to run the streets, loosely affiliated to reduce any disruption to the upward flow of money. It's nothing new. The biggest dog always controls the territory and always demands his dues. It's no wonder they survived. No surprise, they embraced the worst possible versions of themselves. So, that's the world we live in, where there's nothing stopping people's darkest desires from being made manifest. Cannock and Sanders, Barrett, Stewart and the others. Did I tell you about them? I read your journal. Reread it back on Anglesey. Chester crossed to the window and peered out. They're dead. So best not to dwell on the past when the present's filled with enough problems. We've got food now, that's something. It's more additives than vitamins, but it'll keep us going for a few days. Was there much more at the farm? Some, Bill said. Probably as much as we could carry. Enough for a week or so, Chester said. He turned his gaze left, then right, squinting. I really do need glasses. Greta was nagging me to get some back on Anglesey. I wish I'd gone to the trouble. Do you think the village is big enough to have an opticians? I've no idea, Bill said, assuming we are near a village. I'm not sure how much to trust what those murderers said. And again, we saw a couple of signposts to Florine, so maybe they weren't lying. And it's about 250 kilometres from the coast. Well, that's what they said. 250 kilometres from Calais, 60 kilometres north of Paris. Hmm. And we'll have a week of food, Chester said. Of course, my next question is, where did that food come from? I'm assuming it was the young people who collected it. Probably. The fridge smelled of fish, though it was stocked with wine. I'd guess the food came from a delivery truck or possibly a supermarket somewhere nearby. The kitchens of the houses we looked in were empty, and the doors of the others had been forced open. It's a safe bet that someone searched them for food. Even the only supplies we'll find nearby being those at the farm, Chester said. And there's a generator and fuel. We could wait there until Scott's able to travel. Except we don't know if those killers were alone. Bill said. True, Chester said. But if they weren't, they'll find us here easily enough. If we're going to fortify anywhere, better it's somewhere with a few lights and some artificial heat. Perhaps, Bill said. If Khan and Locke find the woman, maybe she can tell us if there are any more of those ex-cons in the neighbourhood. How long does it take to torture someone to death? Dunno, Chester said. But torture isn't just pain. Expectation is a big part of it. Locke thinks that the bonfire had already been built, that this gang turned up within the last few weeks. What's the question you're asking yourself? They took their time, Bill said. Why? Why torture them at all? Surely there has to be a reason. I don't know, Chester said. Either they did it for fun or for information. You know as well as I, there's little point as trying to work out which. Twelve teenagers lived out here, in the middle of nowhere. We assume it's twelve because of that cartoon, because of their hair. 
What were they doing out here? Why did they build that bonfire? Whose attention did they want to attract? How did the killers find them? Those are questions the young woman can answer, Chester said. I'll say this, though. If they were taking their time killing them, then these thugs weren't worried about being discovered. We're unlikely to find any friendly faces in the neighborhood. How much fuel was there? Twenty or so containers in the room with the generator? Bill said. I'm not sure how many were full. There's a tanker in the courtyard. Not sure what's inside, but it might be fuel. But there's at least twenty containers, each holding about thirty liters. Closer to twenty, if full, Bill said. More than enough to get to the coast. If we can find a vehicle with a live battery, Bill said, and live electronics. We had that problem when we were getting out of London, after Q. Ah, oh, yeah, Chester said. He turned away, looking out at the snow. We found an old Land Rover Defender, Bill said. No electronics for an EMP to fry, and by then even London streets counted as off-road. It's a shame I'll never get to see the city again. I thought I might go back to the capital. I knew we'd have to send a boat or three, and thought I might go with it. Not to stay, just for the voyage. I was going to take Annette. She was from London, so was Daisy, but I thought it might be good for Annette to say goodbye to the city, not to know whether it was the right thing to do. But if I'm honest, the only reason she moved the satellites over London was that it was once her home. Looking for Nilda and Jay, that was just an excuse. Well, it's moot now. Give it a few years, the zombies will be dead and we'll go back, Chester said. First step is getting to the coast. We can recharge a car's battery with a generator at the farm, but we won't drive far in the snow. Two hundred and fifty kilometers. For the right vehicle, we could manage that in a day. Certainly in two. On foot, with Scott the way he is, it'll take weeks, maybe a month. Was it diesel or petrol at the farm? I'm not sure, Bill said. If it's diesel, we might have enough to get a motorboat all the way to Belfast, Chester said. If it's not, we'll need a sailing boat to take us to Sheppey. When I spoke to Nilda before we left Anglesey, she said she'd gone ashore in Sheerness and found fuel in the tanks of vehicles at the car import place. But we'd have to wait for the snow to melt before we could drive, Bill said. Leon will probably reach London tomorrow, perhaps today, perhaps the day after. Assuming they head due east out of the Thames estuary, they'll reach land around the Belgian-French border about three or four days from now. The logical thing for them to do is to head south, perhaps venturing inland, but only for as long as they have supplies. Give it a couple of weeks at most, and they'll have to make for Ireland. If we can get to the coast in the next few days, light bonfires and leave messages, find a way for them to spot us, we can join them. Well, this snow? In a car or on foot we won't reach the coast in time, Chester said. I guess not, Bill said. None of the choices are good, none of the options easy. Zombie, he added, coming up the road, can you see it? I can see the outline. That's about all. Is it alone? Just the one, yes. It's in uniform, all the remains of it. I'll take care of it, Chester said. He went outside. Bill watched as Chester reached the gate, watched him haul himself up the recliner. Chester paused, peering into the distance. The zombie was still fifty feet away. It saw Chester just as the Londoner jumped over the gate. The zombie lurched forward, its left arm swinging wildly, while its right hung loose by its side. The thrashing, clawing arm gave the illusion but the zombie was speeding up. But it wasn't. It slouched onward, while Chester stood, legs braced, machete held loosely in his hands. It took a full minute for the zombie to get within an arm's reach of Chester. He gave the machete an expert flick, and the zombie crumpled. Chester bent over the corpse, then straightened, and headed back inside and upstairs. A soldier, Chester said. Not French, but German. 
Not sure what that tells us. Probably nothing much, Bill said. But that dead zombie is another giveaway to any passing thug that we're here. No, there are no good choices. Chapter 9 Campfire Stories The Mansion, Florine Dusk was settling when Locke, Kahn and Kessler returned. They were alone and only carried the two suitcases Bill had crammed with clothes ten hours and a lifetime ago. She set fire to the buildings, Locke said, the outbuildings where her friends lay and the bunkhouse. The fuel's gone? Bill asked. Fuel, food, weapons, Khan said. We couldn't salvage anything. Any sign of the woman? Chester asked. The tracks led up the hill to an old castle. Locke said, it was partially ruined, partially restored, but completely indefensible against the undead. I suspect that was why they chose that farm as their redoubt. The tracks disappeared among the ruins. If she was there, she didn't want to talk. But she might have followed us back, Kessler said, heading for the staircase. I'm going to keep watch. Remember, she might not be the only person who comes looking, Khan said. It's unlikely she'll come here, Locke said. I think she waited near the farm until she saw us leave. Then she set the fire and vanished. From the prince Bill and I left in the snow, she would have known which direction we'd gone and chosen the opposite. With her friends dead, their bodies cremated. I can't imagine she has any reason to stay. That depends why she was here in the first place, Khan said. But she can follow our footprints if she wants to find us. And if she hasn't by morning? Chester asked. A good question, Locke said. If we trust what the killers told us, we're 250 kilometers southeast of Calais. We can probably trust that a mushroom cloud was seen over Marseille. But can we trust what they told you? Chester asked. I think so, Locke said. They'd already decided to kill us. Why bother with the effort of a lie? On that basis, we can also assume they originally made for the coast, intending to travel to England before they came across British refugees, who told them about the lie that was the vaccine. While we don't know which exact route they took, it is probable that there is a radiation-free corridor between here and Calais. But we should look for a Geiger counter anyway, Bill said. So Calais is our only option? Chester asked. Back in Birmingham, you mentioned something about a redoubt in Portugal. We'd never reach it, Locke said. To get to Portugal, we'd have to cross Spain. To get to Spain, we'd have to cross the Pyrenees. If we had fuel, I might suggest it, but we don't. Chester took the saucepan off the fire. Tonight's special is owl boiled in champagne. Food fit for a king, because I can't think of a regular bloke who'd eat it. What do you say, Scott? The pilot snored in reply. I'd say that's a good sign, Chester said, as he spooned portions into crystal wine goblets. There were no bowls, just a few slabs of slate which could have been used as plates. Odd way to live. Was Mr. Hickson awake earlier then? Locke asked. Briefly, Chester said. I crushed up some of those crackers, mixed them with water. He held it down. In my experience of concussion, that's a good sign. He raised a hand to the scar at the side of his head. So, let's eat. Bill took a goblet. Not sure if I should sip or spoon, he said, dipping the spoon in, and then stopped as the sergeant murmured a quiet prayer. I've not seen you do that before a meal before, Locke said, when the sergeant had finished. After today, Khan said, we could do with all the help we can get. He took a sip. Not bad. He put the goblet down, picked up Kessler's. I'll take this upstairs. They ate in silence until he returned. It's all quiet, he said. Earlier, Chester and I talked through our options, Bill said. Despite that we've not got any fuel and so can't drive, our best option is to head to Calais. If we can find a boat... With a small engine and enough fuel to reach Sheppey, we can gather fuel at the car import facility. Then we'll head to Belfast. 
And if we can't find a boat in Calais, Locke asked. We follow the coast until we do, Bill said. If those thugs met refugees from England, then there are boats somewhere along the coast. Were, not are, Locke said. Based on the events of today, I don't see much point in working out a more detailed plan, Bill said. They ate in near silence, broken only by the pilot's increasingly loud snoring. Finally, curiosity got the better of Bill. What's in Portugal? He asked. He didn't expect Locke to answer, but he was wrong. It is a facility similar to Elysium, Locke said. There's a two hundred year old house, but built on the ruins of a far more ancient property. Castle isn't quite the right description, though it was originally designed as a mountain top fortress around the end of the first millennium. Over the centuries, the building was alternately repaired, rebuilt, and abandoned until it burned down just before the Napoleonic Wars. The cellars and shrines beneath the house survived relatively intact. Lisa purchased it in order to restore it. That was the cover. No, that was the reason, Locke said. The cellars are a spectacular work of art, far superior to the tat in most museums. That we also had a need for a mountaintop retreat was a happy coincidence. Like Elysium, it held stores for a few hundred to survive until the fallout had dissipated. Because of its remote location, we had permission for a temporary helipad, a pair of wind turbines, and a solar panel array. Why? Chester asked. That's what I don't get. Ireland, Portugal, Birmingham, Denmark, and wherever else. Why put your efforts into that? Because we were individuals going up against governments, Locke said. Governments who were plotting nuclear war. Compared to that, groups like the cartel were an unwelcome sideshow. Because Lisa Kempton wanted to save the world, Bill said. I can hear the scorn in your voice, Locke said. Why do you find it so hard to believe? If you think her motive's so base, then after working so hard for all she had, why not think she would do all she could to protect her success? But her motives were not base. They were the same as yours or anyone else's. Money does not corrupt everyone. Power does not corrupt everyone. It did not corrupt her, though she moved in circles occupied by those it had. She became aware of the malignant tumour spreading beneath the veneer we called civilization, It was essential people survived who knew how the world had ended. People who knew who was responsible, because those responsible were governments. They had bunkers. They were the most likely groups to survive, to rebuild the world in their twisted image. We knew, after the end of the world, much of what we had would be gone and a lot more would be forgotten. It was vital that the truth should survive. You think the politicians did? Khan asked. Survive in their bunkers, I mean. Not in Britain, but perhaps, Locke said, which is why the truth is as important as ever. The snort of derision came unbidden to Bill's lips. You don't believe me, Mr. Wright. All the effort you put into surviving a nuclear war... Why didn't you try to stop it? You don't think we tried. Of course we tried. The cabal wasn't the only threat. We stopped others. We delayed many more. We did not foresee Quigley's use of a waking nightmare to seize control of a world on fire. No, we tried. And we did a damn sight more than your brother. For all he knew, for all he learned, what did he actually achieve? He persuaded some of the silo commanders and sub-captains not to fire their missiles, Bill said. Thanks to that, enough of the world is still livable that we've survived. Locke laughed. I'm sorry. You really think that's how the world was spared? Your brother might have sent a message. People might have read it. A handful might even have heeded it. That is not how we are still alive today. We are alive today because of Lisa Kempton. I'll buy, Chester said. How? We took control of the GPS network, Locke said, of Glonass, Galileo, Beidou. Why do you think we had our satellites built? 
to spy on your business rivals, Bill said. It is far simpler to have a rival employ one of our spies, she said. No, our satellites were designed to hack into the navigation networks from orbit. Not the software, but the satellite's hardware. How did you manage that? Chester asked. By developing a system that was proof against solar flares, and then giving it to any interested nation. Obviously, the level of subterfuge required was immense. It nearly bankrupted us, but the goal was achieved. After the update, we had our way into the network that in turn would control the guidance on the nuclear missiles. This was our fail-safe in case all other schemes failed, which they did when faced with the undead. When the missiles were launched, the fail-safe was triggered. The warheads were guided into the oceans. In doing so, we wrecked the global navigation systems, but that was a small price to pay since we are still alive today. It is how London survived. But Marseille didn't, Bill said. Apparently not, Locke said. But we could only affect the first wave. Once it became clear that the missiles were going off target, they would have fired the second wave dumb, like a simple projectile. Unfortunately, the country is a big target, hard to miss. How many did you stop? Khan asked. There's no way to be certain, Locke said, a smug demeanor cracking. That was the last throw of her dice in an attempt to save the world. We failed, yes, but the planet was not so utterly irradiated that it is unlivable, and despite everything, some of us are still alive today. Does this mean we can access GPS again? Chester asked. Can you bring those satellites under your control? We'd have a proper global communication system. If Mr. Clemens hadn't locked us out of our system, then one of our operatives would have been able to. Now? It is unlikely. Considering where we currently are, it's academic. But you bankrolled the cabal, you can't deny that, Bill said. You got the contract to produce the vaccine. Well, yes, of course, Locke said. How else would we have learned who the conspirators were? We weren't the only company involved, I should add. As for the vaccine, of course we wanted the contract to produce it. There was a chance it would work. Not a great chance. But if it had worked, how better to guarantee it was given to the world than manufacturing it ourselves? People died. Bill said, quickly, and the others, they murdered people. They used your company's assets to do it. The planes, the vehicles, the buildings, maybe you even provided the pilots and drivers. Did you provide the killers as well? People died. For all that you say, whether it's the truth or a lie you're trying to convince yourself of, people were murdered, and their blood is on your hands. And considering where we are, and all that happened... They died for nothing, Locke said. It is easy with hindsight to question the morality of the death of an innocent journalist or an overly observant security guard. In the moment we had to make a decision, a calculation, one life or the entire world, in both cases we failed. If you'd no qualms about murder, why not kill the conspirators, Khan said. Because they weren't just in Britain and America she said. All were senior figures with protection details. They would have had to die simultaneously. Such an act would have sparked small-scale conflicts across the globe. In turn, they could have escalated into the world war we were trying to prevent. We considered it, but decided on a different route. We decided wrong. I don't need you to tell me that, Mr. Wright. That rule on Anglesey about wiping the slate clean when people arrive is a good one, Chester said diplomatically. What about other bunkers, then? Is there one like Birmingham in the U.S.? There's nothing like Birmingham anywhere in the world, Locke said. But yes, we have storehouses in America. And you still won't tell us where? Bill asked. Locke stood and walked over to her bag. She took out the journal she'd been writing on Anglesey. The coordinates are here. Chapter 1, she said. The codes are the latitude and longitude backwards. Again, though, we expected a nuclear war. We'll find tractors, 
engines, tools, and machinery. You'll find chemicals and the equipment to make more. You'll find... You'll find that most of it is utterly useless, because it is on the mainland. Bill threw another stick of furniture onto the fire, still uncertain how much, if anything, he should believe. Perhaps Chester was right. Perhaps none of it mattered any more. Part 3. Storm and Starwind Day 255, the 23rd of November Chapter 10. Left Foot, Right Foot, Florine It's not bad news, Locke said. I wouldn't call it good, Sergeant Khan said. Chester dragged himself from the comforting depths of sleep. What's happened? he asked. It's raining, Locke said. Is it morning? he asked. More or less, Locke said. There's enough daylight to see the snow being washed away. The temperature's risen. It's well above freezing. Okay, well, yeah, I suppose that is good news, Chester muttered, dragging himself upright. The rain's persistent, Bill said, but not too heavy. We're going to get drenched, but we'll find dry clothes wherever we shelter. The plan's the same as last night. Head up to the junction, go west, and put some distance between us and this house and that farm. If we can manage five miles, that should be enough for today, depending on what we find. And what a map can tell us when we find one of those, we'll come up with a more detailed plan tonight. No sign of the young woman? Chester asked. None, Khan said. It'll be difficult to track her in this weather. But just as difficult for anyone to track us, Locke said. Chester crossed over to Scott, who sat on the couch, his eyes open. How are you feeling? Like I've been in a plane crash, Scott said, his voice weak. Do you think you can walk? Chester asked. Sure, Scott said, slowly lowering his hands to either side. Just got to remember how to stand up. <clears throat> Give me a minute. Take your time, Bill said. Then I got just long enough to see if the restaurant's still serving breakfast, Chester said. Ten minutes later, they were ready and eager to leave. Chester slung the spare shotgun Locke had brought back from the farm, helped Scott to his feet, and helped him to the front door. A new raincoat, that's what I need, Chester said cheerily, as the wind hurled a spray of rain through the open door. A new raincoat and a decent pair of gloves. A good act, too. You ready, Scott? Then let's get today's day's work done. Together, they slogged through the melting slush, as ahead of them, Khan sprang over the gate and Bill, more awkwardly, followed. Clear, the sergeant called. We need a ladder, Scott said as they pushed and pulled him over the gate. We well, need a van, Chester said, as he joined the pilot on the other side. Once again he took the pilot's arm, and I wouldn't say no to a helicopter. A moment later, Locke and Kessler joined them. Lead on, Mr. Wright, Locke said. Lead us to the promised land. This isn't too bad, though, Chester said, as they splashed along the road. I hear you get some real storms down in Oz. Hmm? Scott murmured. Some, yeah. This drizzle would stop Wimbledon, but not the cup final. You into sport? This time Scott didn't even mutter. Chester chattered on, talking about anything and nothing, peppered with the odd question that occasionally received a muted response. The rain was persistent, but not heavy, not yet, though it melted the snow turning the verge into a watery swamp that slowly seeped towards the median, down which they trudged. Khan and Bill shared point. Locke and Kessler brought up the rear. Chester was already supporting most of Scott's weight. At best they'd be able to keep it up until lunchtime. A lot of bones, Scott finally said. What's that? Oh, oh yeah, Chester said. The rain revealed an ossuary of bones scattered among the branches, and other debris concealed beneath the melting snow. Can't see any rib cages or skulls. Must have been dragged here by an animal. Makes me glad I'm a vegetarian, Scott said. You are? Lapsed. 
My daughter, Scott said, and again went silent. By the time they reached the junction, Chester's clothes were soaked and his arms ached. We can take a breather in one of these houses, Bill said. If we stop, Chester said, it'll be for the day. What do you say, Scott? I'm fine, Hickson lied. Bill frowned. If the sergeant takes the lead, Locke said, and Mr. Wright brings up the rear, Private Kessler and herself can search the houses we pass. I don't like the idea of splitting up, Bill said. We won't be, Locke said. We're looking for the furthest point searched by those people at the farm. Until we reach it, we will be wasting our time going room to room. We'll go inside only as far as the kitchen. We'll be out of sight for a few seconds. Come on, Chester, Scott said, ending the debate with an unsteady step. The rain's easing, Chester said, and stumbled around for a topic that might get the pilot talking. So how did you end up in Europe during the outbreak? What? Ah, pilot shortage, Scott said. Sergeant Airline didn't have enough pilots. If it, if it had cancelled flights, it'd have lost routes. Three-month contract to fill in. You don't usually fly passengers. Specialist, specialist, industrial equipment, Scott said. Mining mostly, between South Africa, China and Oz. The same company owned, owned the budget airline. Three months, triple time. Three months to pay for a year of my daughter's university. Ah, oh. Block and Kessler overtook them, disappearing into a bungalow ahead. The whisper of a suppressed shot was followed by a crashing clatter as a corpse fell through glass. Before Chester could reach for the shotgun slung on his back, Kessler appeared in the doorway. Clear, she said, and empty, one zombie. Sergeant Khan nodded and resumed his methodical pace. After the brief pause, the pilot was slower than before. Kessler and Locke disappeared into a one-and-a-half-story chalet on the right-hand side of the road, but reappeared almost immediately, jogged over to a grey stone cottage, and then on. They zigzagged down the road, entering building after building, occasionally accompanied by a shot, but always exiting with a brief shake of the head. Steps turned to yards, and the houses grew more distant from one another. I thought we were heading into a village. Chester said. So did I, Bill said. How are you feeling, Scott? Fine, Scott said. Keep going. The rain dripped down, washing away the snow. To either side, bare and barren soil emerged from beneath the ice. The water level on the verge slowly rose, and each successive footstep was accompanied by an increasingly loud splosh as puddles merged into a river. Not many undead. Chester said, not living, he added as they reached the entrance to a farm and saw the corpse lying outside. Its skull had been crushed. From the rotting leaves lying on its twisted, sodden, rag-covered limbs, it had died less than a month ago. The front door was locked, Kessler said, and we found a can in the kitchen. Rodents got the packets. They got the can's label as well, but I like guessing what's for dinner. Then we're beyond the search radius of the people at that farm, Bill said. We could rest here. I can, I can keep going, Scott said. If we can, we should, Locke said. Mice might have found the kitchen, but larger animals took refuge in the rest of the house. It's rank. Just until the next farm, then, Bill said. Maybe we'll come to that village. They didn't. The fields were replaced by woodland completely devoid of buildings. The road curved downhill into a dip, where snow melt and rain formed an icy morass. Chester was about to suggest they retreat to the last farm, but the pilot dragged himself onward and through the ten-inch deep swamp. Scott slipped halfway across, and Chester barely caught him in time. They just reached the relatively dry ground on the other side, when a ghoulish shape lurched out of the trees, five feet to Khan's front, and left. He, Kessler, and Locke fired at the same time, wasting five bullets to fell the zombie. We'll stop at the next house, Bill said. The next building, Chester added. 
and then the sky opened. Rain poured down, a torrent that became a deluge. Visibility fell to fifty meters, to forty, to thirty. Khan slowed, but Scott didn't, and they became a truncated pack rather than an extended line. Whoa, Khan suddenly called out, raising a warning hand. Barbed wire. Never less than two rolls thick and dotted with the remains of dead zombies, it ran across the road and up the driveway on their right, stopping only when it reached the building. To their left, it continued into the farmland for as far as Chester could see. Originally, it had run across the road, too, but an eight-foot-wide hole had been cut through it. She was bludgeoned, Locke said, examining the nearest ragged corpse. But there's a bullet in that skull on the ground. A wire was cut recently, Khan said. The exposed metal isn't as rusted as that section over there. I'd say more than a week, less than a month. So something drove down this way, Chester said. Did you say there were vehicles parked outside that farm? Perhaps they cut this wire, and perhaps this is where they got their fuel from, meaning there might be more fuel up ahead. What do you think, Scott? Another ten minutes? Beyond the wire were two cars with deep gouges in the bodywork. Pushed out of the way by something heavy, Khan said. There's some tools on the ground, Locke said, and a rifle. It's a Heckler and Coke HK-416, Khan said. It's German? Kessler asked. German made for the French military, Khan said, but other NATO forces used it. Magazines missing. There's a shotgun in the back of this car. Bill said. I'd say that's military grade. Empty. No cartridges that I can see. No signs of life. Bill said. I guess we go on. We can't really go back. We don't need to, Locke said from a dozen paces ahead. Around an abandoned APC, the ground was littered with bones and spent casings. Locke had stopped just beyond and was pointing at a corner of triple-thick chain-link fence topped with razor wire, covered in warning signs. Locke, can you translate? Bill asked. It's a military installation, Locke said. Civilians should stay clear. Does it say what type of installation? Khan asked. An airfield, Locke said. Chapter 11 Strange Meetings When Meeting Strangers The Airfield, Kray after another fifty yards, they found their way into the airfield. Supporting columns from both the inner and outer fences had been ripped from their foundations. The chain link and razor wire had been crushed into the mud. What on earth did that? Chester asked, peering at the thirty-foot-wide gap. An AMX Leclerc main battle tank, Khan said. You can tell that from the tracks? Chester asked. Nope. I can see another one stalled inside the compound. No, Khan added as he stepped off the road. There's two. Three? No, there's more. Six tanks had been abandoned inside the fence. Five were stalled in a line behind a lead vehicle, the treads of which had become detached. The sixth tank was to one side of that line, its tracks buried in a foot of sticky mud. I guess the sixth tried to overtake the other five after that lead vehicle stalled. Did they? Bill began, but stopped when lightning rent the sky, spearing down far too close to their right, immediately followed by a roar of thunder that didn't seem to end. We need to get inside! Chester bellowed, as the deluge of rain turned to a vertical flood. This way, Khan said. Chester was sure the sergeant had picked the direction at random, because visibility had fallen to a few sodden feet. But after a hundred yards where he was virtually carrying the pilot, a mound appeared out of the darkness, slowly resolving into a trio of huts. They looked entirely temporary, but they were built above ground. The door was accessed via steel steps, at the base of which was a mound of bones. Khan paused. This could be bad, he yelled, raising his voice over the tumultuous downpour. Lightning lit up the sky far closer than before. We've no choice, Bill roared back. Khan stormed up the steps and into the cabin, Bill next. 
Chester helped Scott up the steps after them. It was an office with a functionally anonymous desk. Against the wall was a row of hard-backed seats. Behind the desk was a closed door. Sergeant Carr knocked his rifle barrel against the door, but the sound was barely audible over the rising storm, making it impossible to hear whether anything was on the other side. On two, Bill said, reaching for the handle. One, two. As the sergeant covered him, Bill threw open the door. Beyond was a short corridor, with two doors leading from it. As Bill and a sergeant moved along the corridor, checking one office, then the next, Chester helped Scott into the chair behind the desk. Thinly padded, it appeared more comfortable than the hard-backed seats against the wall. At least we're inside, Chester said. How you feeling? Fine, Scott muttered closing his eyes. Two offices, Bill said, empty of bodies and zombies, not much in there, just a few filing cabinets, a desk, a computer. Do you think this building is earthed? Kessler asked from the doorway, her eyes on the storm outside. Perhaps we'll find out, Locke said. How are your hands? My hands? Kessler said. Fine, I guess. Why? I never liked the cold weather, Locke said. The skin between my fingers would always crack after a few hours' exposure. It made meetings in cold climates an embarrassing nightmare. After the crash, after the hike through the snowfield, and a freezing night in a damp ruin, they were bleeding. Today they're healing. You're saying the temperature has risen? Bill asked, glancing at his own hands, then out at the rain. Of course it has. But by at least ten degrees, Locke said. I'd say that was worth celebrating, Chester said. Nuclear winter, Locke said. It can't be, Kessler said. Isn't that when the entire sky gets blanketed by a radioactive cloud of fallout, blocking the sun? That didn't happen. Back on the ship when we left Cape Verde, we worried about that. Believe me, we had little food and water. Everything we knew had gone. But we still had space to stare up into the cloudless sky, wondering, worrying. Yes, it was a theory, Locke said, a hypothesis developed in a laboratory, tested with simulations. Data was gathered from each major volcanic eruption and fed into the models, precipitating a global debate over whether the theory held water. Sure, but the sky wasn't blanketed, Kessler said. Nuclear winter didn't happen. No, but Lisa and I did engineer for thousands of nuclear warheads to detonate in the oceans. Compared to the force of a storm, even a nuclear warhead is little more than a pinprick. But a pin can still draw blood. The injection of so much energy could have disrupted the underwater currents, the energy from which feeds the jet stream and other atmospheric conditions, which in turn determine the weather. The temperature has risen rapidly in the last day, and this year has seen nothing but bizarre and changeable weather. Maybe, Bill said, or the sudden removal of people, of industry, of agriculture, has massively reduced the amount of carbon dioxide, methane and other gases in the atmosphere. That's my theory to explain the weather. Perhaps it's just one of those odd years. Time will tell, but not any time soon. Another bolt of lightning lit up the airfield outside. Even if it is warmer than yesterday, we need a fire, Khan said, and we can't start one in here. You can run a diesel engine on aviation fuel, can't you? Bill asked, turning to the pilot. But Scott's eyes remained resolutely closed. You can, Locke said. Sergeant, what kind of fuel do those tanks use? Diesel, Khan said. You want a commandeer a tank? Why not? Bill asked. What do you think, Scott? You got a plane to work. Could you manage a tank? Scott? Uh, a tank? Scott winced. Sure, maybe. It'll be a noisy beast, Chester said. So would a car or a truck, Bill said. With a tank, we wouldn't have to worry about potholes or partially flooded roads. How fast can I go? Chester asked. That depends on the terrain. Khan said, forty or fifty miles an hour is possible. Twenty or thirty would be more realistic. The same as a car, then, Bill said. 
back in the summer twenty was about the most we could manage. Any faster, and a collision with the undead would have risked us being thrown off the road. That wouldn't be a problem with a tank. What about rivers? Locke asked. Bridges and tunnels? Bill said. The same way we cross them on foot. If we can reach a train line and follow that northwest, we could reach the coast in a day, carrying enough spare fuel to get a boat to Belfast without having to detour via Sheppey. If we can find the fuel, Locke said, and repair a tank. But I suppose it's worth investigating once the storm has ceased. Nope, Bill said. I don't feel like waiting. As he spoke, the wind howled, shaking the windows, and we need a sturdier refuge to wait out the storm. He picked up the shotgun. At least we don't have to worry about noise. Sergeant, could you give me your compass? I'll come with you, Kessler said. Good. Put a light in the window. We'll be back when we're back. Outside, it was as dark as night, with visibility reduced to a few dozen yards. The wind drove the rain horizontally into Bill's face while whipping up a river around his feet. As the ground grew firmer, the rain abruptly slackened. Visibility lengthened enough that Bill saw a large void ahead of them. Just as he thought the storm was ending, electricity lit up the sky. It's a hangar, he called out. Ahead, there's a plane, Kessler said, gesturing along the runway. Bill caught sight of a large wing, bent upwards at an impossible angle, but was nearly blinded as lightning struck the wrecked plane. The hangar, he said, now! The hangar doors were closed, but there was a pedestrian access door to the left. It was unlocked and unchained. From the gloom inside, he assumed the hangar was windowless, but it didn't have the smell of a tomb. He took out his torch. Again, the beam flickered, but the light caught rows of boxes, tables, chairs, and then two fighter jets. I recognize the flag, he said. Two French fighter jets there. What was it? Desso Rafale. I didn't think you knew much about the military, Kessler said, shaking water from her coat. Those jets provoked a lot of envy in Whitehall, Bill said. When it comes to international rivalry, there's nothing quite like that waged between Britain and France. On official visits, Paris would organize a fly-past. Those sleek lines with their swept-back wings, the radar-resistant profile. You know, I think they designed them just to wind up the RAF. Seriously? <laughs> Only a little bit, Bill said. His torch flickered again. Kessler unslung her small pack, opened it, and took out a plastic-wrapped package. Candles, she said. I brought them from the farm. Just be careful where you put them. Those look like ammo crates. They look empty, Kessler said, lighting a candle and placing it on the ledge of the small window next to the door. For the sergeant, she said, if they have to leave that hut, they'll know where we are. Good call, Bill said. Shh. Kessler immediately brought her rifle up. No, Bill added. No, I think we're alone. Are hangers earthed? They must be. Well, this seems like a better place to shelter from the storm than that hut. Question is, whether there's anything here that will make it a good place to wait until the rain stops. It's a big hangar, Kessler said. She lit another candle and balanced it on an upturned crate. Big enough for ten of those fighter jets. Not big enough for a passenger jet, though. Not a big one. A copper jet, maybe? Bill slapped the side of his torch, and the beam steadied. Whiteboard. Maps. Tables. Chairs. I think they used the hangar for planning. The planning what? There's some bedding over in this corner, Kessler said. Ash, too. The remains of a fire and a couple of saucepans on the ground. How many people warmed themselves around that fire, do you think? Bill asked, as he scanned the words on the whiteboard and found few that he recognized. A dozen or so? Kessler said. I think more people were here than that, Bill said, having turned his attention to the maps. Assuming this is a map of where we are, then there's a place called Cray to the west, maybe a town. Maybe a small city. It's hard to gauge the scale. 
They've marked barricades on the roads leading to the airfield and to the town itself. Like the barbed wire we saw near that armored vehicle? Maybe. This must have been a redoubt. During the early days of the outbreak, we know the French government recalled their troops before the runways became impassable, and they redirected the planes to Ireland. No sign of any bodies here. What about you? No bodies, no bones, she said. Check the crates, see if they left any ammo behind. He didn't think it likely. The place had the air of somewhere that had been evacuated, rather than fled. Empty, 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 Kessler said, checking the boxes near her. This crate's food, but it's empty like all the others. Do you really think we can repair a tank? A tank? A car? It's not that much different. Well, maybe they are. But it can't be as complicated as a plane. Right. That's what I thought, Kessler said, because there are two fighter jets here. They look airworthy. I mean, the wings are still attached to the fuselage. They've got engines and everything. If we got one working, maybe Scott could fly out of here. Back to Belfast. I don't know where he'd land, Hill said. The motorway, like we planned to. But we had Sholto to make sure it was clear of the undead, Bill said. Without the sat phone, we can't guarantee a safe landing. He could eject, Kessler said. Fire planes have ejector seats, don't they? Maybe, Bill said. I'd be worried the G-forces would knock him unconscious. He crossed to another stack of crates and we'd still need someone to come and rescue the rest of us. They could bring the helicopter to the coast on the New World, Kessler said. Is it worth the risk? Bill asked. But it's an idea. We'll see what Scott thinks. No, oh, these crates are empty. We can check the rest later, but I doubt we'll get lucky. So they took everything with them when they left, she said. I guess that makes sense. Whatever was left was taken by whoever lit that fire. I suppose that means we won't find much else here. We might find aviation fuel, Bill said. He unpinned the map. And this military map tells me that it was stored at the far end of the runway. You want to go back into the storm to look for it? Oh, not yet. Let's get the others and move them over here. We'll make a fire and can boil up some water, dry out for a bit, and then hunt for fuel. The door banged open. The wind caught the candle on the ledge, extinguishing it. In the doorway stood a woman. Locke? What's wrong? But as his torch shone on the woman, he saw it wasn't Soraka Locke. Qui êtes-vous? the woman asked. Chapter 12 Nous sommes l'humanité. The airfield. Cray. Bill lowered his light. Hello, he said. Nice weather for ducks, isn't it? You're English? The woman asked, shining her own torch on him, then on Kessler. And you're French, I suppose, Bill said, keeping his tone as bumblingly non-threatening as he could manage. And that means you're not as far out of your way as we are. The woman turned her head to the left, addressing the shadows. Ce ne sont pas les voyous des derniers. A figure detached himself from a dark alcove near the door. As tall and broad-shouldered as Chester, he carried a compact carbine in his hands. It wasn't pointing at them, not yet, but it could be brought to bear long before Bill had unslung the shotgun from his shoulder. If necessary, his best option would be to dive for cover and hope Kessler did the same, and that Sergeant Khan heard the shots. The door opened again. Another woman stepped inside. When she pulled her jacket's hood down, Bill saw a late middle-aged face, her close-cropped hair almost entirely grey. In her hands was a carbine, but when she saw them her first action was to reach into a pocket and pull out a pair of spectacles. She smiled and stepped aside so a fourth figure could come inside. It's you, Bill said. Her hair was shorter, her face cleaner, her clothing newly found salvage, but it was the same young woman from the farm. C'est l'anglais, she said. Hi, Bill said, I'm glad to see you're still alive. We looked for you, but when the rain washed away your tracks we had to give up the search. I'm Bill Wright, 
This is Amber Kessler. You are the man at the the watchtower. The grey-haired woman asked. Her English was accented, but her pronunciation was impeccable. Is that what you call the farm building? Yes, Bill said. And you were on the plane. The grey-haired woman asked. You saw the plane? Kessler asked. American? The man asked. Uh, yeah, American. Kessler said, from California. We come from all over the Atlantic seaboard, Bill said. Presently, we called Belfast our home. We were flying the plane there when it developed a problem with the steering. We couldn't turn, and ended up on a southeasterly heading. Hence, why we crashed here, and why we're now heading for the coast. The man muttered something that Bill didn't hear. That began a stilted conversation in French. Though Bill didn't understand the few words he heard, he sensed the tone, and it was surprised more than anything else. He took a step forward. The conversation stopped, and their attention returned to him. "I'm sorry," he said, speaking slowly, addressing the young woman. "I think I have some bad news for you. There was a barn near where we crashed. We found the bodies of two young men. They had streaks of red and white in their hair." Calf-length jackets, light blue backpacks with red flashes and fluorescent stripes. They'd been murdered. I'm sorry. The young woman stood motionless, her face blank. Then she turned on her heel and walked out into the storm. Gaston, the older woman said. The man nodded and slipped into the rain. I take it she knew them. You knew them. Bill asked, his brain whirring. The enemy of his enemy wasn't always a friend, and quite who these people were was still a mystery. He took another step forward, keeping his light low. That only added to the shadows. From the second-hand gleam, he was able to get a proper look at the two women. The grey-haired woman wasn't as old as he'd first thought. Late fifties, perhaps younger. The other was forty or thereabouts, dark-haired, dark-eyed. A recent scar running from cheek to ear, above average height, with a survivor's physique. She looked no different to anyone he might have seen walking through the streets of Hollyhead, assuming you didn't give the clothing too close an examination. Beneath the long jacket, the trousers were patched, the shoes clumsily re-soled. The woman turned to her older companion, and again spoke in a voice too low to be heard. The older woman laughed. Monsieur, the older woman prompted. Bill Wright, Bill said, and this is Amber Kessler. I am Professor Victoria Fontaine, the older woman said. This is Claire Moreau. That was Major Gaston Lambert, and you met Claudette. Starwind, Claire added. My daughter wants to be called Starwind. Your daughter, Bill gave a nod. A memory of sitting on a sofa in Hollyhead with Annette came back to him. Starwind is one of the characters in that cartoon, isn't it? You've seen it, Claire asked. My daughter got into it a few weeks ago. Bill said she wasn't happy when I called it a cartoon. The professor laughed. Claire forced a thin smile onto her exhausted face. You come from Belfast in Ireland, the professor asked. We thought it was as dead as England. Not quite, Bill said. And yourselves? Thank you for saving my daughter," Claire said. "Bonne chance." She turned around and made for the door. "Wait, hang on," Bill said. He wasn't sure what to say next, but the storm did it for him. As Claire opened the door, lightning lit up the airfield outside. "No one's going to travel far in this weather," Bill said. "Perhaps we should gather our people together, share the sentry duty and our food." We can also share information on where we've been and what we know. You must have some questions for us, because I certainly have some for you. The professor reached out and took Claire's arm. She lowered her voice and spoke in a low whisper. Bill saw Claire's eyes narrow, but then she shrugged. "You saved Starwind," the professor said, addressing Bill. "Bien. We shall talk, but not here. This hangar isn't safe." There is an office at the end of the runway, beneath the remains of the control tower. It is secure from the, 
les morts vivants, the living dead, yes? Chapter 13 Friend or Foe The Airfield Kai. Chester sat by the window in the first floor office, watching the rain, but thinking about the people with whom Locke conversed in rapid-fire French. He didn't understand a word, but he didn't need to. Could they be trusted? That was the question, and it was a familiar one. In his distant past, the wrong answer might lead to incarceration, occasionally worse. More recently, the danger was always worse. The criminal fraternity wasn't large, but it was secretive. A member of a crew might be arrested before a job. A new driver or lookout would be needed, and a call would be put in, usually via the fence purchasing the hall after the deed. Sometimes it had been Chester seeking an extra body, and sometimes he'd been the man filling in at the last minute. In those latter instances, it wasn't a case of whether he could trust the others, but how much he distrusted them. The risk of betrayal, of a grass, had to be spotted before he'd done or said anything so incriminating it could lead to incarceration. He'd learned to look for the little clues, to listen for the subtle signs. Unfortunately, neither his hearing nor his eyesight were what they used to be. The building to which they'd relocated had been a two-story set of offices built in the shadow of the control tower. According to Claire, before the conversation had switched entirely to French, an incoming freight plane had made an ill-judged dodge as a fighter made an unauthorized takeoff. The freighter's wing had clipped the tower, bringing down the building and causing the plane to tumble across the runway, effectively taking it out of commission. That hadn't stopped other planes attempting to land. Within a few hours, the runway was a ruin, but the smoke from the burning wrecks had warned off further incoming traffic. Once the runway was out of action, the general abandoned the airfield. Chester wasn't sure who the general was, whether the officer was still alive, or where this group now called home, except that it was obviously within walking distance. The building had four offices below, four above, with latrines on both floors, and a water tower built above the flat roof. Debris from the control tower's collapse had nearly demolished the ground floor, but in the months since, they'd added a ladder giving access to the upper floor, which, aside from a few broken windows, had survived the intervening months unscathed. Getting Scott up the ladder had, in the end, involved hauling him up by rope, leaving the pilot as exhausted as everyone else. At some point in the past, someone had converted a filing cabinet into a crude wood-burning stove. The chimney only funneled two-thirds of the smoke outside, but the heat was welcome. Cut firewood was stacked floor to ceiling in one of the building's other rooms. That told him a lot. What it didn't tell him was precisely why these people would come so often to the airfield that they'd make such preparations. If the runway was out of action, the answer might be supplies, but there was no evidence of them in this refuge. The professor walked over to the improvised stove and took the small saucepan off the heat, doling out equally small portions into four mess tins. She passed one to Scott, one to Khan on watch by the window, one to Kessler, and the last to Bill. She gave Chester an apologetic smile before refilling the saucepan from a thermos flask and placing it back on the stove. Something was wrong. But Chester had realized that from the moment he'd first seen these people. The French were different from the survivors on Anglesey and those he'd met in the wastelands of England and Wales. Those meetings had always been tense affairs. To one degree or another, in order to survive the outbreak, everyone had acted out of self-preservation. Guilt fed a survivor's inner demons, breeding doubt and suspicion that was turned outward when meeting strangers. Sometimes that turned to violence, though more often it had led to indifference. Neither appeared to be the case here. 
The conversation reached another lull. The professor stood, filled a mess tin and gave it to Chester. Thanks, Chester said. He looked down into the bowl. It was green and red. It might have been cabbage, but it was definitely fresh. Locke occasionally mentioned a place name in English. From that, it seemed as if they were discussing the world beyond France's borders. Chester wondered if they'd get around to discussing events far closer. Claire and the professor sat opposite Locke and Bill. Gaston and the young woman Starwind sat by the window. It was an odd name. A character from anime, apparently. But he was in no position to judge someone for reinventing themselves. When Bill had come to inform them that he'd found other survivors, they'd not had much time to talk. But one word had stood out. The farm in which Bill and Locke had found the killers had been called a watchtower by Claire. He took another mouthful, chewed thoughtfully for a moment, then rattled the spoon on the edge of the mess tin until he had everyone's attention. Who are you expecting to attack you here? he asked. Let me put that another way. Is it the same people who held Miss Starwind captive? The professor smiled, though the expression didn't reach her eyes. I don't understand. The vegetables are fresh, Chester said, so the food has to have come from a greenhouse. You came from somewhere nearby, your gear confirms it. You've got enough to feed the six of us as well as yourselves, but you don't have any cooking implements. You clearly don't fear us, so there's more of your people close by. Starwind called that farm a watchtower. So who are the rest of your people, the ones not in this room, watching for? Sergeant Khan stiffened. In turn, that had Gaston finally turn away from the window. We? Yes, the professor said. There are more of us. The rest of our patrol are watching for our enemy, the people who captured Starwind, who killed her friends. We do not know if they are still alive or if they have fled the area. If they come, if they attack, it will be here. Perhaps you could tell us who they are then, Chester said. Tell them, Claire said. They can't hurt us, but perhaps they can help. As the government collapsed, the professor said, this airfield was fortified. A plan was devised to secure military bases, repatriate troops, secure towns. How can you plan for walking nightmares? Planes arrived from everywhere. There were too many. Landings became crashes. When we lost the runway, the general moved everyone to the town, Cray of which we are on the outskirts. The town is bisected by the river Oise. In the middle of the river is an island, Ile Saint-Maurice. The general fortified the town, but the island became a... a... Uh, en anglais, a keep, a castle, a fortress, yes, our fortress. When the ghouls came, we retreated there. When they left, we were able to venture out to the town and to the fields. Ghouls? You mean zombies, Kessler said. And what do you mean they left? One day they were there, the next they drifted away, Claire said. And when they were gone, people left too. Some went to find their loved ones, others said they sought other survivors, but some people just wanted to leave. Did many return? Chester asked. We, oui, Claire said, including some from Ireland. That is why I was surprised when you said that is where you came from. You should speak with Tam. He may have information useful to you. Not all who arrived were as friendly, though we didn't realize it at first. Abel Garnier was among them. I think you met him, she added, turning to Soraka and Bill. A man with a long scar on his arm. Him? Yes, Locke said. And he is dead? the professor asked. Very much so, Locke said. Dernier told us he first headed towards the western coast with the intention of reaching England, Bill said, that he met some survivors from Britain who told him that the vaccine was a lie. That is what he told us, too, the professor said. He also said a nuclear bomb was detonated over Marseille, Bill said. It was, 
the professor said. We had four different sources, including an eyewitness who was, unfortunately, too close to the blast. He died a week after he arrived. Do you know of anywhere else that was destroyed? Bill asked. Not with any certainty, the professor said. We have second-hand reports that Corsica was hit, as were the Greek islands. Which Greek islands were not certain. Bombs fell on cities and bombs fell on farmland. The targets appear random. We have a map in the town. Earlier, did you say you had fields? Chester asked. Of course, Claire said. She frowned. How else could we eat? Sorry, I'm sure this is a language thing, Chester said. When you say fields, do you mean growing crops in the ground? How else would you grow them? Now it was Claire's turn to look confused. It's just that in Britain there are too many undead to farm in the open countryside, Bill said. Are you saying it wasn't the same here? Of course there were ghouls, the professor said, one or two each day. Some days more, but never so many we couldn't bring in a harvest. Tam brought an idea with him from Ireland. We used speakers in trucks to lure the undead to a fortified position where they could be more easily killed. That and barbed wire kept us safe during harvest. Not all of our food was grown in the fields. We grew it on rooftops. We built raised vegetable plots on scaffolding. The fields were an exercise in the urbanized, relearning agriculture for next year and for the year after that. After the harvest, the general formalized our settlement. We'd heard nothing from anywhere in France or beyond for so long he decided that we should declare ourselves something new, the Sixth Republic. Not everyone agreed with our new constitution. You mean like Abel Dernier? Bill asked. I mean Starwind and her friends, the professor said. The young woman just gave a shake of her head, then turned her gaze back outside. They left to establish their watchtowers. It was their choice, and it worked well for us. With an outpost to the east, another to the west, even fewer ghouls arrived in our town. Our days became safer, and, of course, each passing day was a day closer to when the nightmare would end. Sorry? Chester said. You've lost me again. What do you mean? The zombies are dying, the professor said. Surely you've realized. We've seen some die, Bill said but we've also seen some that are very much alive. They are like a parasite, the professor said. Like a parasite, they are only as strong as their host. A sick host produces a sick ghoul. When newly infected, the host's fluids are a red-brown color. When exhausted, it turns black, yes? You've seen this, yes? Thus, survival is a matter of patience. I take it you've not seen a horde, then? Chester asked. In Britain, they've massed into a pack ten million strong that was heading for London. It had already obliterated Birmingham. Utterly obliterated. They ground the bricks into dust. We've seen nothing like that, the professor said. And we didn't see a horde in Ireland, Bill said. Maybe it's something unique to Britain. Something to do with the island's topography and population density. But it was this idea that the zombies were dying that caused your problems with Dernier. Sadly, unwittingly, we witnessed a living experiment, the professor said. Catherine Pride had been diagnosed with a brain tumor before the outbreak and given three months to live. She was still alive in August. I thought her original diagnosis was incorrect. In September, her vision began to fade. She had headaches, slurred speech, blackouts. She would have survived another month, but no more. I had already presented my theory on the life expectancy of the undead. She decided to test it. She left, allowed herself to get infected. The zombie died three days later. That bittersweet announcement caused Dernier to act. His first assault was on our armory, but they were defeated. Dozens of good people died, and we lost most of our ammunition. Dernier escaped with twenty followers. I thought he would keep running. He came back. 
Our island is small. Our vehicle and fuel store is to the east of the river. This is where they attacked. They killed the guards and took the trucks we used during the summer to lure the undead away from the fields. With those, they lured the ghouls to the town. The undead have surrounded the island. We have little ammunition. Our food and fuel are trapped in buildings now surrounded by the undead. That is why we're here. We traveled along the river, then came inland. Millions of rounds of ammunition and other munitions were brought to the airfield at the beginning of the outbreak. Too much for us to carry to the island. Why should we? We left it here. I never trusted Dernier. When he arrived, I brought some people here to move the ammunition. People like Starwind? Bill asked. That's why she was being tortured. And why she was left alive until last, Claire said. We will gather the ammunition, return to the boat, take the ammunition back to the island, and then safely kill the undead from a distance. How many of Dernier's people are still out there? Chester asked. Maybe none, maybe eight, the professor said. They might have followed you here. They might have followed us. In which case, let them attack and they will be trapped between us and my people outside. The conversation switched to French and Chester turned his gaze back to the window, and to the outside. The enemy of my enemy is my friend, and with the undead no longer perceived as the greatest threat, that uneasy alliance had collapsed among the people of Cray. Whether the undead were dying or not, Chester doubted he'd ever believe they were all dead, not even if he lived for another fifty years. No. What he was more worried about was the location of the nuclear blasts. If the islands of the Mediterranean had been targeted, then where could they go after Belfast? Part 4 The Summoning Bells Day 256, the 24th of November Chapter 14 The Long Road to a Small Boat the river was Cray. Bill threw a last glance up at Chester, standing on the narrow platform by the ladder. His foot splashed ankle-deep in a muddy mix of gravel and stormwater. He turned his attention to the front. Khan and Claire had taken point. Kessler and Locke were ten feet behind them, while Gaston had disappeared among the ruined hulks of the wrecked plains to collect the hidden sentries. Bill fell in next to the professor. He knew what he wanted to ask, but they were still on the boundary between trust and distrust. From Bill's perspective, the worst-case scenario was that they'd leave this corner of France on foot, but with as much ammo and food as they could carry. The best-case scenario was a solution to feeding all the people now in Belfast, thus making caution the better friend of necessity. From the state of this runway, he said, for want of anything else with which to break the ice, we can forget flying a plane out of here any time soon. Do you think your pilot could repair one of the jets? The professor asked. Probably. He's a good pilot, and a better mechanic, Bill said. Without a plane, it'll be a long, slow slog to the sea. Still, the weather's warming up. The professor was unable to stop a snort of laughter. You English and the weather. I used to think that was a stereotype before I went to Cambridge. Bill had a detour around a pothole. When he looked up, two people were jogging towards them from behind a wrecked truck. Yours, I take it? He asked. Gaston's, the professor said. And now they are mine too, yes. And no sign of Dernier's gang during the night, Bill said. You really think they linger around here? With their leader dead? No, they will run east. Dernier was a man consumed by bitterness who ruled by fear. The story he told was that his brother was in prison when the outbreak occurred. Dernier went to rescue him and found the cells locked, the prisoners all dead. Perhaps he had no brother, and that was his story. Who can say? Now he is dead, his people will seek better fortunes elsewhere. 
They know they aren't welcome on the island, and after the snow, the storm, they will realize this good weather is their best chance to get far, far away. Another figure ran towards them from a small hut. Gaston was a few steps behind, angling across the runway, but he wasn't hurrying. Where's the ammunition? Bill asked. The plane, the professor said, gesturing to the wrecked airliner near the far end of the runway. A good hiding spot, Bill said, eyeing the mammoth plane. It's an Airbus? From Dubai, the professor said. The plane wasn't in service but being delivered to the airline. It had refugees from the airport on board and no fuel in reserve when it reached us. It couldn't reach the assembly line runway. They told us over the radio before attempting to land. You saw the crash? Ah, uh, no. I was in Paris. I arrived after they had relocated to the town hall on the Ile Saint-Maurice. You taught in Paris? For the last two years, I was at Cambridge before that. Teaching what? Bill asked. Botany. Which partly explained how they'd been able to grow so much food. He knew what the next question was expected to be, so didn't ask it. Instead, he turned his attention to the plane. The wings had sheared off during the crash. The starboard wing stuck upward, wedged between the cabin and a trio of fire trucks that hadn't been moved from the runway in time. I take it no one survived the plane crash? Bill asked. No. By the time they reached the wreck, ten sentries had joined them, and Bill was ninety percent certain no others lurked in the shadows. Gaston led six of them inside the plane. Unbidden, Khan walked a little way to the north, Kessler by his side, watching for the undead. Locke went over to Claire and struck up a conversation in French. Bill's suspicions of Locke, his anger at Kempton, had vanished during the night. When she'd said that she'd tried to save the world, he believed that was the story she told herself. Whether it was true, whether she'd been in it for glory, power, or money, no longer mattered. Chester was correct. They'd had a rule on Anglesey. What went before was forgotten. Perhaps they should amend it now that they'd abandoned Wales. Perhaps what went before should be forgiven. Gaston re-emerged from the plane with a black duffel bag in each hand. He gave one to Bill, spoke briefly to the professor before handing her one, then went back inside. I take it everything's as it should be? Bill asked. Indeed, the professor said. There is some storm damage, some flooding. It is not an immediate problem. We will make two trips today, three if we have time. The boat will take the ammunition to the island. At dawn the sniping will begin. We will return here and wait until we are relieved. The undead will not retreat, but we do not wish to be mistaken for them. And where is the boat? Bill asked. La passerelle Jean Biondi. Do you know the word passerelle? A footbridge. There is a, a, en anglais, a concrete ramp sloping down to the water so that a boat on a trailer can be lowered in. Ah, a slipway. That is where we left our boat, one and a half kilometers through wood and farmland. It was an easy walk a month ago. After the storm, perhaps not so easy. I've walked through worse, Bill said. A whistle came from his left. Kessler waved. Sergeant Kahn had crouched down, but slowly stood. Facing forward, keeping his right hand on the grip and the stock pressed against his shoulder, he raised his left hand and waved the all clear. I didn't hear the shot, the professor said. Suppressors, Bill said. We made them on Anglesey. They're designed for our SA-80s, but I'm sure one of our engineers could adapt them to your carbines. After the first zombie had been sighted, Gaston hurried his people back onto the runway. Bill didn't think the plane was the only place they stored ammunition, and that suggested... There was more to the story of Dernier than he'd been told. He didn't ask. He'd get the answers soon enough. Leaving the airfield, they followed a winding country road for nearly a mile until the aftermath of the storm brought them to a halt. The road had been washed away. In its place was a five-foot-deep, 
ten-foot-wide ravine with a muddy river at the bottom, fed by a waterlogged field to their left. To their right, the thin river washed around a blue and rust two-seater. You didn't come this way a few days ago? Bill asked. No, we went directly to the watchtower, the professor said. Gaston waved them back and led them up the edge of the field. If this is an example of the roads in France, we'll need to bring those suppressors in by helicopter, Bill said, as two of the French soldiers hacked a hole through the hedgerow. Of course, that's only a solution as long as we have fuel. Old world stores won't last forever. We need horses, the professor said. We had three, but they died in June. We had a couple ourselves, Bill said, and had the same problem but we found some ponies in Ireland on a small island off the coast. Once we're settled in Belfast, we plan to collect them. That might be our long-term solution. So the helicopter for the short term, ponies for the long term. That just leaves the inconvenient middle. Once you've settled in Belfast? The professor echoed. I thought you said it was your home. Bill mentally kicked himself. He'd been so focused on driving the professor towards his desired conclusion, he'd been incautious about his choice of words. With no way of coordinating with the others, there was more danger in being caught in a lie than in admitting a portion of the truth. We were in the slow process of relocating, he said. Moving the plane was the last piece of the puzzle. That said, we're uncertain whether Belfast will be our home beyond the spring. If the undead are dying, and if they're dying in Ireland as they are here, then Belfast could become our permanent home. Of course, the weather is another factor we'll have to consider. I suppose it would be most accurate to say that in a year that's seen the dead walk, a nuclear war, and the end of civilization, it's a miracle we're even planning three months ahead. We've seed stock, but the issue with Belfast is ground in which it's safe to plant. It was the same on the British mainland. While I'd like to believe this nightmare is finally coming to an end, I can only assume the worst for now. We might be able to sell you some food, the professor said. I'm not sure you'd be able to produce enough, Bill said. There are ten thousand of us at present, give or take. Like you found here, people leave and people arrive. Ten thousand? I see. Through careful cultivation we have managed to create a framework for survival, a framework we can transfer to another settlement, perhaps in exchange for your satellites. Oh, you can have a sat phone or three, Bill said. There'll be a spare in the first helicopter that arrives. We'll position a satellite over your heads and we can set up a downlink so you'll have access to real-time imagery of the surrounding countryside. But what is the exception? You have that particularly anglophonic mode of speech where you try to brace against bad news by scattering a few crumbs of good before it. Propellant, Bill said. The satellites are running out. They weren't designed for such frequent movement. Following the plane crash, they'll have retasked them over France as they search for us, and that'll only consume more. We are swiftly approaching the day when we will lose the ability to change their position at which point it's only a matter of time before their orbits decay and they burn up in the atmosphere. It's six of one whether they'll outlast the aviation fuel. We were considering radio as an alternative, though Belfast might be a little far to broadcast a signal without a repeater station, but these are problems I look forward to solving. As you say, we've things and ideas to trade. One step at a time, though. Despite that we've only seen a handful of zombies today, I'm conscious that's only because there are a few thousand of them a mile or two away. And in a few days there will be none, the professor said. She smiled. The nightmare is almost over. While Gaston and Sergeant Khan found a drier path through the field, it was still a slog through the mud, one that continued through a thin line of withered trees and across the neighboring field. That was bordered by a track that was even boggier than the fields, but it led in the right direction. The track turned onto a road. After five minutes on firmer footing, they reached a roundabout. The raised centre was an island surrounded by a moat of rainwater. One storm, and so much has changed, the professor said. It was two seasons weather within a week, she smiled. 
This planet is going to get very interesting very soon. You sound cheerful. Of course. It is a scientist's dream. I am living in my own experiment. While they had paused, everyone else had gone on ahead. Come, she said. We are holding them back. Chapter 15 A Bridge Too Far The River Was We are here, the professor said. The footbridge is ahead behind those trees. Do you see the rooftop? The house is opposite the bridge. Gaston hurried forward. Sergeant Kahn and two of the French soldiers jogged to keep up. Gaston stopped by a tree near the building. He raised a warning hand, and the column came to a ragged halt. Bill turned towards the building. He could see the upper story and the edge of a window frame. Then he saw a plume of smoke jet from the window. A fraction of a second later, before he could turn his head, the ground shook. Bill was thrown off his feet. He rolled across the road and into the ditch on the right-hand side, picking himself up, standing before his brain sorted through the backlog of sounds. An explosion. Screams. Gunfire. Bullets stitched holes in the muddy verge, then traced a line across the chest and face of one of the French survivors. Shouting in French was added to the gunfire, and screaming as everyone took cover. Bill crawled along the ditch on the right-hand side of the road until he reached a sweeping pine. The branches on the roadside had been trimmed decades before, while those on the verge had been left to grow in a wide skirt. The trunk was three feet in diameter and offered protection from bullets, but the branches wouldn't, and neither would protect him from another... another what? A mortar? No. There'd been a horizontal smoke trail. An RPG, then. Perhaps it was some other variety of shoulder-mounted weapon, but for now, he'd call it an RPG. The screaming continued. Someone was injured. Then the screaming stopped, but the shooting didn't. He was on the right-hand side of the road that led to the house and footbridge. As far as he could see, everyone else was on the left-hand side, though the pine restricted his forward view. The professor lay in the ditch on the other side of the road, almost completely submerged. Only her chin and face were above the water. Bill thought she was dead, until she raised her hand placed it on the cracked concrete and slowly eased herself up. Her shoulders were above the water when a fountain of dust erupted on the road two feet from her. The professor ducked back down a moment before a second burst churned the ditch water three feet behind her. Again, the professor was motionless. Bill couldn't tell if she was dead or alive. He unslung his shotgun and weighed his options. If he'd paid more attention to geometry lessons as a child, he might be able to use the location of those shots to calculate the angle and position of the shooter. Since he hadn't, all he had to go on was that the sniper was ahead. He? Or they? Probably they. It was safest to assume the worst. They weren't firing from behind, though, which suggested that the enemy didn't have enough people to spring an ambush properly. That was something but not much when another burst was fired into the professor's ditch. A second burst came too soon after for it to be from the same gun. The RPG had been fired from the house. The shooters were probably using that building as their high ground. He could fire back, but the shotgun didn't have the range. Sprinting across the road to join the others was pointless. His gaze returned to the professor in time to see Kessler crawl out from around a tree on the river side of the ditch. Uncoiling like a snake, keeping the tree between her and the building, she shimmied upright. Then she fired, emptying her magazine while Locke sprinted backward, firing her own rifle one-handed and unaimed. As Locke's magazine clicked empty, as return fire popped into Kessler's tree, Locke grabbed the professor's collar and dragged her out of the ditch, and into the sparse cover on the other side of the road. Mud and water danced as bullets came thick and fast, shredding leaves, cracking bare branches. The gunfire slackened, 
and was replaced by the hiss of a rocket, and an explosion at treetop height, twenty feet back from where the professor had been. Bill ducked, a shrapnel and branches rained down, then edged around the tree, away from the road. As more gunfire stitched the verge, the trees and a pair of rusting wrecks, he got a clearer view of the ambush. Clearly, Dernier's people hadn't fled. There were two firing positions, one on the bridge, the other in the riverside window of the building. Two shooters, then. If there'd been a third, he'd have hidden near the roundabout, there to box them in. That was assuming the third wasn't slow to get in position, or wasn't simply waiting until the survivors attempted a retreat. Retreat wasn't an option. They needed to get the ammo to the boat, and the boat back to the island, before they could continue their journey to the coast. He took another, cautious, crouching step around the tree. He could see the building's side wall. It had no windows. The gunfire came from a balcony on the riverside of the house. The inland side of the house was ringed by a four-foot-high wall, containing an eight-foot-deep garden. Beyond that was a waterlogged paved area containing a pair of rusting vans. Those vans and the wildly overgrown trees blocked his view of what lay beyond, but it was a safe bet there was a road. What he couldn't see were any people, so maybe, possibly, they wouldn't see him. Could a sniper be on the bridge? Perhaps. There was one way to find out. He wiped the mud from the stock of the shotgun, took a breath, then loped towards the house. Beyond the pine, the trees were deciduous and spindly, barely taller than he was, but the ground was uneven, waterlogged, covered in mud, branches and inches of partially decomposed leaves. His foot hit a root. He tumbled forward, just before bullets danced a line across his path. He hit the ground hard, rolled to his feet, and loped onwards. The bullets had come from the bridge, not the house. The next burst confirmed it, but the shots went wide. A moment later, a veritable fusillade came from the roadside, as the survivors provided covering fire. Bill reached the wall, threw his back against it and breathed out. The illusion of safety shattered when fragments of plaster sprayed across his face. Uncertain whether that was just an unlucky close-friendly bullet, or he'd misjudged the location of the other snipers, he pushed away from the wall, following it to the roadside of the building. The house's wall ended, becoming a low brick wall ringing a small front garden. Beyond that was a wide car parking space with the two flat-tired vans. Bill vaulted over the wall, but the top was slick with rain and moss. He stumbled on the other side, his feet knocking over a battalion of terracotta pots. He picked himself up and tried the front door. Locked. Blocked or nailed shut, there was no way in. To the left was a narrow, opaque window probably belonging to a downstairs toilet. To the right was a wider pane six feet by four feet tall. His feet crunching on terracotta, he crossed to the window. Beyond a partially collapsed net curtain, he saw a sofa, an armchair, a TV with a smashed screen a bookcase, and a dresser. No doors but two archways, one in the far wall covered in a strip curtain. The other archway was uncovered and close to the front door. Through the archway he could see the beginning of a staircase. Bill raised the shotgun, thinking that was the easiest way of breaking the glass. He saw a figure on the stairs, a man in a battered jacket, an AK-47 in his hands. The man saw him and slowly brought his gun up, but Bill's was already aimed at him. Bill fired. The glass window exploded, buckshot peppered the walls, but enough hit the gang member to make him dance backwards before collapsing forwards, crumpling down the remaining stairs. Bill swept the shotgun's barrel across the remaining glass, clearing the jagged shards from the frame, and climbed inside. The sniper was dead. Bill couldn't see his face, 
but the pool of blood spreading out from his chest was far more than a living person could lose. Slowly, he crossed to the arch. A top-loading freezer held the front door closed. He turned to the stairs, at the top of which was a second shooter. Bill stepped back, pulling the trigger as he moved. He didn't see where the shot went, because his foot caught against the corpse. He tripped, but kept his grip on the shotgun as he fell. His shoulder slammed into the corpse, sending still warm blood arcing across his back. He ignored it, pumped in a fresh round, and fired up the staircase before he scrabbled and rolled into the relative cover of the living room. He scrambled to his feet, loaded a fresh round, and aimed the shaking gun barrel at the archway. Any second now. Any second now. But no one appeared. Cautiously, he inched forward until he was flush against the archway. He could hear shooting, but it was all outside. He lowered to a crouch and turned around, holding the shotgun with a stock at his hip, the barrel pointing upward at forty-five degrees, then crabbed sideways out into the hallway. There was no one at the top of the stairs. Slowly, cautiously, he climbed. At the top of the stairs, lying half inside a musty bedroom, was a body, the man's face shredded by the shotgun's blast. Bill checked the other rooms leading off the corridor. They were empty. In the room with the balcony, lying on a rotting mattress, was a shoulder-mounted grenade launcher, a pair of AK-47s, and three magazines, with a score of empty magazines lying on the floor among a foundry of spent cartridges. Bill put his shotgun on the bed, picked up an assault rifle, and crossed to the broken window. Most of the gunfire was aimed at the bridge, and someone was returning it with interest. The bridge was narrow, dotted with low barricades of barrels and boxes, and it was behind the second set of those that the gunman was perched. The barricade was low, but the bridge's elevation gave the shooter cover from the road, but not from the house. Bill gave the rocket launcher a brief glance, but it was fifty-fifty he'd have it pointing the right way when he fired. He propped the assault rifle on the window frame and pulled the trigger. A three-shot burst and then another and another. The sniper ducked low behind the barricade. Bill thought he might have hit the man before a burst splashed the window frame. Bill fired again, pulling the trigger until the magazine was empty. He ejected it as he crossed to the bed and grabbed a fresh. When he returned to the window, the sniper had abandoned the barricade and was running along the bridge. Bill again rested the rifle on the window sill, but was still lining up the shot when bullets struck the plaster surrounding the window's frame. Reflexively, he ducked back inside. Clear! he yelled. It's clear! They're dead! One on the bridge! Running to the other side! One hostile on the bridge! Words were shouted in French. The firing stopped. Sergeant Khan sprinted from cover, running to the bridge. The last sniper had already disappeared over the furthest barricade on the river's other bank. Chapter 16 A Hollow Victory The River Was Bill? Locke called from below and outside. Clear! It's clear! Bill replied, dropping the empty assault rifle. He picked up the shotgun and made his way downstairs. The front door shuddered as someone tried to get in. The door's blocked, he called. Go to the front room. He followed his own instruction and reached the broken window at the same time as Locke and one of the French survivors. There were two of them in here, Bill said. They're dead. The third sniper was on the bridge, but I think he got away. Locke turned to the survivor and translated that into French. The man dashed off as Locke climbed inside. She paused briefly in the archway. You've come a long way since Whitehall, Mr. Wright. Bill said nothing, but collapsed into the mildewed armchair as Locke climbed the stairs. He still couldn't get a handle on the woman. Outside he heard a shot, then another, and then the softer pock of a suppressed rifle shot from upstairs. 
he supposed he should help secure the location, confirm no other enemies lurked in the shadows outside, and that this ambush wasn't part of some larger trap. No. He'd leave it to the professionals like Gaston and Kahn. But now he could say he'd done his part. His gaze fell on the body at the bottom of the stairs. He supposed he should search the corpse, though he wasn't sure for what. From above, the firing ceased. There are zombies on the other side of the river, Locke said, coming down the stairs. Perhaps our foe didn't escape. Zombies? For a moment they had forgotten about them, Bill said, pushing himself to his feet. Locke bent down, checking the corpse. A tattoo, she said. He's one of them. It's a recent tattoo, she added, recent and crude. If I didn't know what it should look like, I wouldn't recognize it. He got it after the outbreak, you mean. It's to be expected, she said. Yes, and so is villainy and violence, Bill said, except we're happy to have that as an excuse to tell us that we are the good guys. After what we saw in the watchtower, after the torture Starwind endured and which killed her friends, don't you think we are? This time, sure, Bill said, though I tried to shoot a running man in the back. Yes, this time at the tail end of the Professor's War, we know we're on the side of right. Next time, next year, next decade, it won't be so clear-cut. Our morality is ebbing away. I can feel it. How long will it be before we're killing people simply to survive? We already are, Locke said. I meant fighting to prevent people stealing our food, Bill said. So did I, Locke said. That is what this skirmish is about. Food, supplies, control of their island. Why are you here, Mr. Wright? Why did you volunteer our assistance to these people? For fuel and a vehicle, food and ammunition, yes? We are mercenaries, fighting for pay, simply so we can go home. From outside came a loud crunch of feet on broken terracotta. Bill spun to the window, raising the shotgun, but lowered it when he saw Private Kessler. The professor wants you, she said, adding, It's bad. Gaston's dead. Claire removed her coat and laid it over the Major's face. Ten feet away the professor had already laid her coat over the remains of most of another survivor. How many fatalities? Bill asked. Three, Claire said. Two from the explosion, one from gunfire. It was an LRAC F-1, Locke said, a shoulder-mounted anti-tank rocket launcher. Did it come from your armory? No, Claire said, turning to look at the house, then at the professor. Earlier in the year of the summer, Dernier led a patrol east. Half died, but they found one such weapon. It was used and destroyed during the attack on the armory. The rifles were AK-47s, Bill said. Do you have those in your stores? No, our equipment came from the French military, Claire said. It sounds like they found weapons and ammo out in the wasteland and didn't tell you, Bill said. Of course... That begs the question of why they attacked your armory. Some people arrived with Kalashnikovs, the professor said, dismissively and too quickly. It is unwise to hypothecate a data set on one piece of datum. If you'll excuse me, I would like to confirm the identity of the dead. Go with her, Amber, Bill said. He turned to Claire. The man who crossed the bridge? Your sergeant is in pursuit, Claire said. Fine. Let's get the boat loaded while he finishes that task. Claire shook her head. They sank it. The boat's gone? Bill said. Locke sniffed. I'm going to walk the perimeter. I'm suddenly feeling very exposed. Bill looked at the bodies. The bullet-flecked building, the churned mud road. How long until they send another boat from the city? Claire shrugged. They may not... They may wait for the undead to disperse. There was a debate, no, an argument over the professor's plan. Bill looked southward. We're too far for them to have heard the explosion. I take it there aren't any other boats anchored along the banks. We took them all to the island, Claire said. There are none within twenty miles north or fifteen miles south. 
There's no radio, no way of signalling the island. I'm sure there is, Claire said, just not one I've thought of. Bill nodded, then looked at the house. They could set it on fire, create a pillar of smoke as Starwind had done. However, putting a few of the pieces together, it sounded as if the only reason this group had left the island was because Claire's daughter was among those at the watchtower. Would anyone come looking for the professor? Or would a fire simply act as a beacon to any of Dernier's people still in the vicinity? Either way, if they set the building alight, they would have destroyed the better refuge, and so would have to wait on the footbridge on the off chance a boat arrived before the undead. He was still weighing up whether that was a risk worth taking when Sergeant Khan returned. The enemy escaped, sir, Khan said, using his in the company of strangers voice. And dead are on the other side of the bridge, I've left the French survivors guarding it. As if on cue, there was a distant pock-pock of gunfire. Can they hold it? Bill asked. Yes, sir, there are less than thirty zombies at present. Could the undead have killed the sniper? Claire asked. Unlikely, Khan said, and not within sight of the end of the bridge. Do you want me to clear the undead and continue the search on the other bank, sir? I don't think so, Bill said. What happened to your arm, Sergeant? The crude bandage covered his forearm, already oozing red from the spreading blood. Shrapnel, sir. If we're not going to neutralize the hostiles on a far bank, we should retreat. I would advise we return to the airfield and regroup. Claire? I will have to consult the professor. Of course, Bill said. Wait, at the airfield... Did you take the rafts from the planes? It was something Chester said back when we were on Anglesey. Planes scheduled to fly over bodies of water were required to have safety equipment on board, in case they had to ditch in water. I forget how large a plane had to be for them to carry a raft, but that's where Chester found some rafts in London. That airliner is big enough, I'm sure. We didn't take any rafts, Claire said. Then that's our plan, Bill said. Sergeant? You better get the survivors from the bridge, assuming you agree, Claire. I will speak to the professor, she said, and hurried towards the house. Bill moved closer to the sergeant and lowered his voice. What do you make of this? Nothing good, sir, Khan said. They had time to prepare an ambush. Not well, but they almost killed us all. One of the bodies has a crude post-outbreak tattoo. I'd say he was a new recruit. Understandable, Khan said. Every army needs new recruits. My read is that after the bonfire was lit at the watchtower, Dernier expected people would come to investigate. He expected it, and so sent this group to cut off their escape. I'm not sure, Bill said. Before the watchtower bonfire was lit, he'd already destroyed their armory. He must have known the islanders were low on ammunition, so he would expect them to gather more. I don't think this was an ambush. I think it was a heist, so they could steal the ammo. Two birds with one stone, Khan said. Makes sense. Claire, the professor, and Kessler came over from the house. We will return to the airfield, the professor said. Sergeant, Claire, can you gather everyone? Claire nodded. The sergeant saluted, but had gone only a few paces when he swung around. Bill followed the line of his gaze and saw Locke sprinting towards them. Footprints, she said. Where? Bill asked. How many? The professor asked. Two sets, Locke said. They had a vantage point in the trees back from the road, near the roundabout. From there they could have killed us. They didn't. They ran. They ran south. Then let's hope they keep on running, Bill said. Bill, Locke said. The airfield is due south. Chapter 17 Paint and Knives The Airfield Chester sat by the window, watching sunlight dance on the flooded runway, catching the pools of water the storm had left in the craters and potholes. The storm had ceased during the night, bringing a dawn of glorious sunshine. More surprising, 
was that he'd woken from a fitful half-sleep to find the French survivors hadn't left. He wasn't sure what to make of them. Rather, he wasn't sure why he distrusted them. Partly, obviously, it was their decision to set a trap without first asking whether anyone minded being used as bait. That annoyed him, but it was an obvious move he might have made himself. No, it was something else, something to do with their story that didn't add up. We'll be back in a few hours, Bill said. Understood, Chester said. He was staying behind to keep an eye on Scott. Starwind and one of the French survivors, Michel, was staying behind too. Chester was under no illusion that they were guarding the ammunition rather than himself and Scott. Chester stood by the ladder as the expedition climbed down, then returned to the window while Starwind and Michel climbed up to the water tower. Perhaps we should have arranged a signal, Chester murmured. What's that? Scott asked. Ah, I'm just getting cynical, Chester said. He sat on a chair next to Scott. You know what I miss most about electricity? It's how decisions always get made at night, but we can't act on them until dawn. Interesting choice, Scott said. I'd pick an electric heater. You're feeling cold? Nah, I'm fine, Scott said, pulling the blanket closer around his shoulders. My head's nearly stopped pounding. My mouth tastes like a wombat's been nesting in it. But my vision's back to normal. My eyes no longer feel like they're going to drip out of their sockets. I'm just tired. Tired and cold. But in a good way. A cloudless sky means no more rain, so I'll take solace in the cold for now. It's not as cold as yesterday, Chester said. Not nearly as much. Give me a few days of food and I'll not notice it. Scott said. A helicopter can fly in this weather. The satellites will be able to spot us. They're bound to spot this town if there are so many people in it. Speaking of which, how many do you think that is? I'm not sure, Chester said, glancing upwards. He couldn't see Starwind or Michelle, but they could almost certainly hear the conversation. Whether they understood it, he wasn't sure, so he chose his words with care. They gave the impression it was around a thousand. Assuming they exaggerated, like most people do, I'd say around five hundred. A lot less, if a gang of twenty could cause so much trouble for them. Yeah, true. Though one person can play merry havoc if you don't know where he is. That was our trouble back in the Tower of London. He is hoping the rest of them are dead or fled. You'll get your few days of rest, though. We can't continue to the coast until they've dealt with the undead surrounding their island. I'll figure a day for them to get the ammunition back to their people and a couple of days to kill the undead. Three days at least. He looked up at the sky. Maybe we should paint a message on the runway. We could get a lift out of here on the helicopter. We need a plane, Scott said. There are fighter jets in the hangar? That's what Bill said. Scott leaned forward, peering at the runway. It'll need a bit of work. A lot of work for a lot of people. But we could manage it. Was it just fighter jets? He leaned back and picked up one of the military maps that had been left in the hangar. As far as I know, Chester said, two fighter jets. Do you think you could get a plane in the air again? I did it before, Scott said. I've got to try. You mean you've got to try to get back to Australia? Chester said. I don't know, Scott said. My daughter's in Vancouver. My wife and son are in Australia. It's an impossible choice. Oh, that's why you wanted to fly the plane to Canada. Scott shrugged. I'll get it. Chester said, I understand. Except now, here, I'm closer to Australia than I've been since the airbreak. Scott said, we've got the people to repair an airfield and for the sound of it, they have fuel. He tapped a finger against the map. As for a plane... There are eight other airfields marked here as redoubts, eight airfields to the southeast. That would start my journey even closer to home. But flying to Canada was your idea, wasn't it? Chester said, except you wanted to fly to Newfoundland, then down to California, right? And Vancouver is on the Pacific coast. Yeah, well, I wasn't going to tell everyone I wanted to steal the plane, Scott said. Truthfully, 
I'd not made up my mind what I was going to do. I had a dream the satellites would find us a clear runway in British Columbia. I'd fly there, buy my daughter, fuel, and a transcontinental jet capable of making it to Oz. Dreams are for sleep. And when I was awake, I didn't think I had any chance of seeing any of my family again. Then we found that plane in Belfast. It was a godsend. And since the Admiral and her people wanted to know what had happened to the U.S., my destination was chosen for me. Now, though, I have another chance. And an impossible decision. Chester nodded. There was nothing he could say. You know, there was an evacuation in Australia, Scott asked. They shipped everyone to Tasmania. Bill wrote as much in his journal. And Mr. Mills said he heard some military chatter over the UHF that suggested the same. Why would anyone want to nuke Tasmania? Maybe it survived. Maybe their evacuation worked. If it did, there's a good chance my family is safe among hundreds of thousands of survivors. Maybe millions. Why shouldn't they be? It'd be worth putting together an expedition to Tasmania to check, Chester said. It would, Scott said. But what about my daughter? Australia or Vancouver? I can't go to both. We can't. Not any time soon. Sure, the Admiral might send a ship across the Atlantic, but Vancouver is on the Pacific. Planes rust. Fuel evaporates. Each flight we make, we have to assume it'll be the last. An impossible choice, Chester echoed. It is. It is. Scott pulled the blanket tighter around his shoulders and picked up the map again. You say there are eight other airfields marked there, Chester asked, hoping to drive the conversation in a different direction. Looks like twenty redoubts, of which eight are airfields to the southeast. Trouble with airfields, even military ones, is that they weren't built as fortresses. Seeing as air power negated the defensiveness of stone walls, it's no surprise. They were built on the edge of towns, never the high ground, obviously, but usually the flat lowlands. But if the zombies are dying, then we don't need fortresses, Chester said. Did you hear that last night? Vaguely. The professor's pretty certain the zombies will only be a threat for another year or so. Perhaps less. Not sure I believe her. I want to. But it's dangerous to place too much faith in hope. But she has some evidence to back up her claim. I guess we know that some zombies have died. But we just don't know whether they all will. What else did I miss? I found bits and pieces about Lisa Kempton and how those thugs at the watchtower were foot soldiers in a cartel. They were? Scott asked. And Locke blew them up with a grenade. That's it. Then they got what they deserved. He put the map down. They're who I blame for being here. Not with my family. And for my daughter being in Vancouver. I thought you were here for triple time pay on a passenger route. About twenty years ago, I worked on a small airfield, Scott said. That's where I met my wife. An old couple owned the airfield. Their kids didn't want a piece of the business and their grandkids were too young. They wanted to retire, so when we got married, they sold us a stake in the business. It cleared us out. Every penny we had. And we were still getting a good deal. About six months later, the drug dealers turned up. The airfield was small, but it had a long runway, and it was out of the way. It was ideal for an island-hopping jet crammed full of heroin and cocaine and who knows what else. The police were no use since it was all talk at that point. They suggested we could go along with it, set up a sting, and then go into witness protection. It would have been fine for us, but not for the old couple, who'd never be able to see their grandkids again. We weren't going to say yes, but we couldn't say no. Instead, we walked away. All of us. We took a digger to the runway and shut the business down. The local authorities didn't like us abandoning it like that, but we told them to take it up with the cops. A few debt collection agencies came looking for us, but the gangsters didn't. We were broke, and starting again, this time with a family, but without a home. Life was tough. It got tougher. I only returned to flying a few years ago. I figured that whoever was behind that first bunch of thugs might be long since dead. 
and good riddance. He picked up the map again. If these runways were put out of action when passenger planes try to land, there should still be fuel in the stores. Or there would have been at the beginning of the outbreak. We could hop from one to the next in the helicopter, look for fuel, see which runway will be the easiest to clear, and whether we can find a plane with a longer range than a fighter jet. That's not a bad idea, Chester said, which means we'll need that helicopter, and I don't like standing around here waiting. I'm going to look for some paint, add a message to the runway. Any ideas where I should look? You want the far end of the runway, furthest from the control tower and the main entrance. It's where you find maintenance crews, as far from officious eyes as they can get. Chester climbed down the ladder and luxuriated in the feel of concrete beneath his feet. It truly did feel warmer today. Even the nearest pothole was only half full, the rest of the snowmelt and rain cocktail having already evaporated. Despite what Soraka and Bill might think, he'd happily take a warm winter over the alternative. The shotgun dug into his back. It wasn't a weapon he was happy with, bringing back too many memories of life before the outbreak. Like all weapons he'd acquired since, it was better than nothing, and would do until he found something better. Scott was deluding himself, making plans for the future to avoid thinking about the present, or, more likely, the past. His family were probably dead, but even if they weren't, they would have moved since the outbreak, running, Hiding until now, they could be almost anywhere. A trip might be arranged to Tasmania to see whether their evacuation had been more successful than the British attempt, but even that wouldn't happen any time soon. What they'd not really discussed since the crash, and what they couldn't mention when the French survivors were within earshot, was that the food supplies on Anglesey had been low. In Belfast, they'd be worse. In London they'd be living off stores left by Quigley, where they would have been abandoned when Nilda departed. Yes, yeah, she'd look for him, and Sholto would look for his brother, but everyone else would have to look for food. Within a few days that latter search would take priority. When he and the others reached Belfast, it would become a priority for all. He had no idea what the solution was. Perhaps they might loot a port city on the French coast. Perhaps the French islanders had enough food to share, though that begged the question of how they would get the supplies to Ireland, or the people to France. His foot kicked against a metal bracket, grinding it into the runway's cracked surface. This airfield was beyond repair, although Scott's words finally bubbled to the surface of his consciousness. A plane was how they'd get the food to Belfast. They'd cleared that stretch of motorway to use as a runway, hadn't they? There was the small matter of where the food would come from. But if the islanders couldn't spare any, perhaps they'd find some crates of rations at the other airfields. Fly the helicopter from one to the next, like Scott had said. Why not? It would only take a few days. Which brought him back to the reason he'd climbed down the ladder. He needed to find some paint. He found his route taking him past the tanks. He didn't like relying on the satellites spotting the message, and since the weather had improved, driving to the coast truly was a one-day trip. Even with his poor eyesight, he could tell from a hundred yards away that the tanks were unserviceable, but he walked closer to confirm it. The storm hadn't been kind to them. All six had sunk deeper into the ground, with a drying coat of mud caking treads and carapace. How long to dig you out? he muttered. A day? Days? Too long. Pity. Still, they said something about having a fuel store. Maybe the professor can spare us a vehicle, or... He trailed off, listening. A rustling whisper came from behind the furthest tank. Was it the wind? Hello? he called. The whisper came again, but this time accompanied by a squelching splash. He drew the machete and strode to its right, giving the tanks a wide berth as he checked behind, then forward, then to each side, until he saw the creature crawl around the furthest tank. 
Mud clung to its clothes like treacle, oozing from its arms as it raised one, then a handless other. Its arms fell into the mire, sending a geezer of mud splashing over its already coated face. It was tempting to draw the shotgun, but a gap in the fence, and so the road and the outside world was too near. He stepped forward as the zombies slogged another foot closer, then another, finally reaching the firmer footing away from the tank. As it dragged itself onto the drier ground, Chester quickly closed the distance, hacking the machete down on its skull. Red-brown pus arced over the ground, a bright contrast to the monochrome mud coating the creature. So you weren't dying, were you? Does that mean you turned recently? he said, flicking the gore from the blade. It was impossible to tell anything from the clothes, and he wasn't going to look for a tattoo until he knew he'd be able to wash himself clean. Perhaps Starwind would be able to identify the body. He headed to the access road running parallel to the runway, passing one hangar and then another, giving the open doors a wide berth, but their dark interiors barely a glance. It would take Scott to tell whether anything useful could be salvaged from inside. Near the end of the runway, where a small passenger jet was spread across tarmac and grass, the access road curved to the right, leading towards an odd quartet of huts with a clump of trees behind them. The huts were in clear view of the control tower, but the trees behind looked like an ideal spot for a groundskeeper to surreptitiously while away the hot summer days. As he drew nearer, he saw they were a very odd set of huts. Each identical, about four meters square, the walls painted bright yellow, the roofs some reflective white material. Between them, creating a wall, was a chain-link fence. The center was covered with a pavilion-type roof, supported on the same struts that held the fence in place. The interior was mostly empty, containing a forest of bins, a single tractor painted a military grey-green, and what was clearly a civilian refuse lorry painted yellow and white. Twenty feet away, he slowed his pace again. Lying against the fence, half buried in mud, was a corpse. He checked behind, to either side, but all was still. Are you properly dead? Mud cracked as the zombie twisted its skull to face him. Its eye sockets were empty, its chin missing. Its arms didn't move. Its legs appeared oddly thin beneath the shapeless rags of its trousers. He marched across the intervening ground, hacked the blade down, finishing the creature, then paused to look at the gore. Black? So you were dying? I don't know. Not sure I'd risk my life on the professor's theory. Four feet above the zombie's now split skull, a padlock held the gate closed. A new padlock and a new chain. The rubbish truck was a civilian model, while the solitary tractor looked military. There was room for a dozen more tractors with space to spare. Those vehicles could have been abandoned on the runway. More likely, they'd been used to transport ammunition, people and supplies from the airfield to the island. In which case, why lock up a rubbish truck inside? He could guess the answer. He'd seen the professor lead Bill and the others to the crashed plane to collect the ammunition, but it was likely that wasn't the only place it was hidden. Leaving the padlock alone, he went to search the huts for paint. The hut closest to the runway was a break room and office for the groundskeepers. Following the huts clockwise, the next was filled with snow shovels, brooms, chains, and a lot of empty shelves and brackets. Wondering what they might have contained, he continued. The third contained a few broken rakes and little else. Clearly the contents had been raided by the islanders. The last hut contained paint, mostly white, all in industrial-sized tubs. Score, he said. So, how do I get it back to the runway? He tried lifting a tub, but could barely manage it. There were no trolleys or dollies in the hut, and none in the fenced compound. Again, presumably, they'd been taken during the exodus to the island. Missiles were moved on wheeled racks, weren't they? At least they were in the movies. He turned on his heels, heading along the access road towards the nearest hangar.
There was no door at the rear. He turned the corner, angling towards the front, then slid his body against the wall. Shapes moved along the runway, people running. Not zombies, then. Starwind and Michelle? Unlikely. Two of Gaston's people? Possibly. But these two had taken cover behind the remains of a jet engine. Gaston's people wouldn't hide. Who, then? Either they come from the island, assuming that the professor had failed in her mission, or it was Dernier's people. How was he to tell the difference? The two figures sprinted towards the hangar entrance, disappearing around the front. Cautiously, he unslung the shotgun. Stepping quietly, he picked a path to the front of the hangar. The two figures crouched behind an upturned four-by-four, four, just beyond the hangar's furthest corner. Men, probably, but with their backs to him, and so far away he couldn't make out any more details than that. Their attention seemed focused towards the office building Scott and the others were in. Since the professor had used them all as bait the previous evening, Dernier's people must know that was where the islanders sheltered when they went to the airfield. Since the islanders would know that too, it didn't clarify whether these two men were hostile or not. The main hangar doors were open, but too far away for him to reach before a bullet reached him. A second, smaller door was built into the side of the hangar some twenty feet from him. He'd have to hope it was unlocked. He edged back a pace and took a half-step to the right, gripping the shotgun in his left hand, so it and the left-hand side of his body were concealed by the hangar's wall. Nice day for a stroll, isn't it? He called out. Both men spun around. They held their guns across their chests, not pointing at him. Not yet. Have you come as far as us? He added. We're out of England. What about you? Almost together, the shadows tightened as they raised their guns. Chester pivoted, rotating ninety degrees on his heels, dragging the shotgun out of cover. The thugs fired first. A single shot from one, a three-shot burst from the other, and that spoiled what little aim he had. He pulled the trigger, letting the recoil continue spinning him around. He didn't see where the slug went, but that didn't matter. He ran to the side door, switching the shotgun to his right hand, pumping in another round. Not bothering to check whether the door was secured, he fired into the lock plate, pushed, and found the door swung open. Inside the hangar was dark, illuminated only from the now open side door and the hangar entrance, across which he saw a shadow flicker. The figure didn't come inside. Good. They'd follow the hangar around to the door, see the blown open lock, and come inside. Hopefully. He edged into the shadows by the door to wait, focusing on footsteps outside as an alternative to the questioning fear flooding his mind. The footsteps drew nearer. The door was barged open. A man came inside, firing. Gripping the shotgun by the barrel, Chester swung sideways, smashing it into the man's chin. The man staggered back, dropping his rifle. Chester shifted his weight to his right foot, kept the shotgun rising, stopping its motion when it was above his head. He slammed the gun down. The man moved at the last moment, but not by enough to stop the shotgun's grip from hammering into his temple. He crumpled, and Chester moved into the shadows on the other side of the door. One down, but the next would be more difficult. With no time to think, instinct led him behind a set of long, portable shelves on rollers. Out of the sunlight stretching through the hangar's doors, it was the nearest cover, and he needed time to think. He didn't get it. Just as he was positioning himself out of sight, a shadow moved across the hangar's main door. This assailant didn't linger in the sunlight, but came inside, moving to the darkness next to the hangar's entrance. Chester stayed motionless, listening. A soft clink, a muffled thud, a flicker among the shadows as his enemy edged along the hangar's wall. His breath held, his lip bit. Chester reached for the shelf, moving his hand a millimeter at a time until his fingertips came in contact with a two-inch-long oblong of metal. He tossed it, 
as far as he could, into the depths of the hangar. As it rattled to the ground, the shadow near the door moved towards the sound. Chester waited as the man drew nearer. Ten feet. Five. Three. Chester jumped up and sideways, putting his weight onto the shelves. It clattered over, and he nearly did the same, but he caught himself as his feet hit the ground, as nuts, bolts, tools, and spare parts rattled over the floor. Chester jumped around the edge of the fallen shelves. His assailant had managed to dive out of the way. He was on his knees, rising to his feet. Chester swung his shotgun like a club. This time, his opponent saw him coming. The man raised his rifle, hacking it around as Chester drove his shotgun up. Chester knocked the man's gun from his hands. Chester stepped back, but the man turned his fall into a dive, then a kick that slammed into Chester's thigh. Chester fell, letting go of the shotgun as he pushed himself back to his feet, in time to see the man backflip back to his own. Chester stepped back. You shot first, remember? He said. It doesn't need to end like this. Do you understand me? He couldn't see the man's face, but he saw his arms move, and saw the sunlight glint off metal as two knives were drawn, the blades a foot long, serrated on both edges. You understand me perfectly, don't you? Chester said, taking a sliding step back, nudging the fallen nuts and screws out of his path. The man flexed his arms, slashing the knives in front of him, twisting his wrists till the blades danced a figure of eight. The man stepped forward, but his foot stepped on a piece of the fallen metal junk. He slipped and fell to a crouch, one arm extended, knife still waving as he picked himself up. Chester kicked, punting screws and nails into the man's face, skipped back and drew the machete. His enemy hadn't moved. He'd got to his feet and held the knives, one forward, the other above his head, side on, in a pose Chester had only seen in films. Are you sure about this? Chester asked. But you're a new recruit. Didn't learn that in the prison, did you? The man gave an abrupt twist of his hand, beckoning. Chester gave a short shake of his head. He'd met people like this before, and he'd come against them a time or two. They were always either flash or skill. Against skill, genuine skill, you ran. But as the man had fallen, as Chester had jumped back, he'd seen the holster at the man's belt. He had a pistol, and had opted to draw his knives instead. This man was all flash, and against flash. Chester charged, roaring a berserk bellow of furious rage. The man twisted, raising his knives, but Chester dived, feet first, sliding across the floor. The man was off balance, off centre, and unable to jump out of the way. He threw one knife, slicing the other down, but Chester was too close. He hacked the machete at the man's leg. The heavy blade shredded cloth, sliced flesh. Chester dragged the blade free and rolled to his side, to his feet, while his opponent toppled over, screaming. Finally, the man reached for his holstered sidearm. Chester didn't hesitate. He slammed the blade down on the man's neck, stepping back as warm blood sprayed over his hands. It really didn't have to be like this, Chester said. A wave of tiredness washed over him. But maybe it did. He heard movement. Turned. It was the first man. He was alive and he had his rifle in his hands. Oh, hell, Chester said, as he looked down the barrel. There was a shot. The man crumpled. Chester turned towards the hangar's main doors and saw Starwind there. She lowered her carbine. Thanks, Chester said. Starwind shrugged, walked forward, and peered down at the man Chester had killed. She spat on his face. I take it they were Dernier's people? Chester asked. Starwind seemed to weigh that up. They were demons, she said in perfect and nearly accentless English. Demons from the pit. They've been sent back to the hellfire that spawned them. Good, Chester said. 
Do you have a torch? I dropped my shotgun. Thanks. He found the shotgun, then crossed to the man she'd shot, took his rifle, and gave a quick search of his pockets. No spare ammo. I'll take that as a good sign. We better get back to the office in case more of them come. Starwind didn't move, her gaze fixed on the corpse. Come on, Chester said gently. Best to save dark thoughts for when you're out in the daylight. Chapter 18 The Best Laid Plans The Airfield, Kay Bill was at the group's rear when they reached the runway, but he heard the shout from the top of the office. A moment later, he saw Chester step out from the building's ruined ground floor. The loose column slowed its run to a walk, except for Sergeant Khan, who sprinted ahead. After the briefest of exchanges with Chester, the Marine began barking orders. The French survivors may not have understood the words, but they grasped the tone, fanning out to cover either side of the runway. What happened? Bill asked. Two of them, Chester said. Two of the gang. A few zombies as well, he added. But two of the gang came here. Then they are probably all accounted for, Bill said. You don't win a war with probably, Khan said. Only with certainty. Kessler, with me. He moved off across the runway. What about you? Chester asked. I note your bags are as full as when you left. It was an ambush, Bill said. Gaston and two of his people are dead. The boat's ruined. We tracked two of them back here. Have to hope it's the two you killed. Gaston and Moore? Starwind asked, having climbed down the ladder. Claire crossed to her daughter, raising an arm to comfort her, but Starwind shrugged it off and walked away. Claire followed, leaving Chester, Locke, Bill and the Professor alone among the rubble. This is getting dangerous. Locke said. Another day is half gone. The island is still without ammunition, and we don't know how many hostiles are still out there, but it's a near certainty they know where we are. If there were more of them, they'd have taken part in the ambush, Bill said. Sergeant Khan is correct. We shouldn't bet on that, Locke said. Not when the stake is our lives. And the lives of every one of my people, the professor added. She's right, Bill said. We need to resupply the island. Chester, didn't you say you found rafts on planes at London City Airport? We did, Chester said. Still had a couple of them when I left London. Hardy things, those rafts. Then we need to check the airliner, Bill said. With a raft or two we can resupply the island and end this tonight. Not hardy enough, Chester said, holding up a scrap of singed orange rubber. Starwind emerged from the far side of the plane. She gave a shake of her head. So much for rafts, Bill said. We could make one, the professor said. It would take too long, Claire said. We're running out of food. We thought Starwind would resupply us. What is the alternative? the professor asked. We have the materials here to build a raft. We can have it ready tonight. Tomorrow morning we will take it to the river. You won't carry much ammunition on an open-sided raft, Bill said. We won't carry any, the professor said. Claire will return to the island and collect another boat. We'll lose at least one more day, Locke said. Again, what is the alternative? the professor asked. There's the obvious, Chester said. We take as much ammo as we can carry, get as close to the island as we can, and start shooting the zombies. You must know of a building or three whose roofs we can reach. There aren't enough of us, Bill said. He said there's over a thousand zombies. At least that number, the professor said. What worries me, Bill said, is that with the explosions by the bridge and the gunfire here, added to the thunder of that storm, the zombies might disperse. They often do. We'll have thousands of undead lurking in the rubble, in the fields, behind fallen trees, broken walls and crashed cars. We'll have to hunt them down before it's safe for the helicopter to arrive, otherwise its engine noise will summon them. We can't afford to lose the helicopter. Wait. Of course. The zombies were summoned to the island by music, right? 
speakers in trucks. We could find some speakers of our own. There has to be a generator somewhere on this airfield. The generators were taken to the fuel store, Claire said, and that is kept with the vehicles, and that is where Dernier drove one of the trucks. It is surrounded. There has to be something, Bill said. How about a church? Chester asked. A church with a bell. Is there one? There are two, Claire said. Chapter 19 Our Lady's Bells L'Église de Notre-Dame, Cré Chester crouched by the crumbling wall, his knee uncomfortably balanced on a fallen brick, waiting for Bill to wave the all clear. Back at the airfield, they'd wasted another half hour trying to come up with a plan. Scott had asked for a couple of hours to see what he could do with the planes, the ejector seats, and the remaining missiles. As beguiling as that idea was, a few hours would bring them to nightfall, and thus mean another day was lost. Instead, they'd come up with a series of contingencies, in expectation that something would go wrong. Chester and Bill were going to the church, while everyone else, carrying as much ammunition as they could, headed as deep into the town as they could. If the bell was rung, and if the undead left the bridge and headed towards the sound, the professor would resupply the island. She would lead a column back to the airfield for more ammunition, while Sergeant Khan led a rescue column to the church, where hopefully the undead would have gathered. If the zombies didn't head to the church, then Sergeant Khan and the others would open fire on the undead, killing as many as they could, while Bill and Chester made for a small garage on the river to the south of the island. They would rendezvous with Claire, fashion a raft, and row to the island before dark. If Bill and Chester were surrounded, unable to leave the church, it would be down to Claire to build the raft alone. Bill and Chester had easily located the church. Built on a hill, the top of the bell tower was visible from a mile distant. The first half of that mile had been travelled quickly and without incident, and then they'd found the undead. Six fresh corpses oozed black gore over the road behind them. The fight had been quick and brutal, and far too loud. He and Bill had taken shelter behind the wall at the rear of an apartment block, waiting to see if the sound of the fight summoned more. We're clear, Bill whispered, easing back to Chester's side. On the other side of the wall, there's a fifty-meter dash up an alley to a road with a few more houses, and then it's the graveyard, and then the church. Fair enough, Chester checked his borrowed watch. We're five minutes ahead of schedule. How's the graveyard look? Empty of zombies, Bill said. But halfway along the alley, there's a thick bush that's moving. It could be the undead. They climbed over the wall and dropped down the other side, their feet landing with a heavy thump. They walked quickly, not quite at a run. Chester had his attention on the buildings to either side, so Bill saw them first. He stopped, pointing silently at the mud. A trail of footprints headed up the alley in the direction of the church. People? Or zombies? Chester mouthed. Bill shrugged. Alert for imminent danger, they continued along the alley, slowing as they neared a gap in the high wall where a set of steep stairs led to the rear garden of a white-roofed villa. Halfway up the steps, a wrought iron gate was held ajar by a corpse. This body was definitely a zombie, and it had been recently killed. They shared a look, both thinking the same thought. The church's tower offered a vantage point over this quarter of the town. Why the gang would want the high ground was a mystery, but Chester was increasingly of the opinion that there was more to the story of Dernier's assault on the town than they'd been told. Bill motioned they continue. They stopped again near the end of the alley, but far enough from the road that the walls kept them concealed. The road looks clear, Bill whispered. Can't see any footprints. Can't see any zombies. In the cemetery, we'll only have tombstones and trees for cover, but there's a gate a little way to the left, and a path, I think, leading to the church. There's a light. A glimmer of something up in the bell tower. It's gone. It's probably just a reflected gleam off glass. Not with the luck we've been having. Chester said. 
they reached the low wall ringing the cemetery without an alarm being sounded or a shot fired. Keeping low, with the wall as cover, they made for the gate. A small handbell had been hung from a pole tied to the lock post. A rope ran from it to the latch, so if the gate was opened the bell would ring. A warning against the undead, or against people, Chester whispered. Either way, it wasn't put here by accident. Or that long ago, Bill said. He lifted the bell from its hook, then cut the rope. Carefully he put the bell on the cracked pavement. I say we make for the rear of the church, furthest from the bell tower. Chester nodded, but slid the shotgun from his back. He and Bill both carried one, though Chester now wished he'd brought a more accurate weapon. He wished he'd had time to find some glasses. Not for the first time he wished he'd gone with Leon back to London. Bill set the pace, Chester following four steps behind. The bell tower was to his right. He forced himself not to look. It was unlikely he'd see anything, and there was nothing he could do if he did. The ground between the tombstones was uneven and treacherous. Tufts of long grass, some dark green, some withered and brown, were interspersed with occasional patches of broader leaves, where a graveside plant had survived a year of rain and heat, snow and ice. Instinct made him dive sideways, before his brain properly registered the sharp report of a gunshot and the duller crack as a bullet chipped a headstone. He knew where the firing came from, but still didn't look. Mud flew to his right as he darted around the graves, angling for the cover of the church's wall. A third shot, a fourth. More as he sprinted and Bill loped an erratic zigzag until they were flush against the church's ancient stones. They're not good shots. Bill said, his back against the wall. Nope, Chester said. I think one of them called something out, Bill said, not sure what. There was another shot. They're not communicating now, Chester said. They're hostile, and we're not going to talk them down, you understand? I do. It's just, in your journals, you often try talking when your opponents clearly don't want to listen. Not everything that's happened went into those journals, Bill said. We'd better get inside and get this finished. We don't want to get trapped out here between the undead and a sniper. He led the way along the wall, while from above the shooting continued. What are they shooting at? Chester asked. Can't be us. Can't see any zombies, Bill said, after the briefest of glances. Not yet. I think they're trying to summon them. Must be why they're here. They want to use the church's bell to summon the undead which begs the question of whether we should ring the bell ourselves, Chester said. One problem at a time, though. They reached the end of the wall. Around the corner at the rear, furthest from the bell tower, they found a small house tacked onto the church. It was built in a more modern style, and the lack of chimneys suggested it was constructed long after the age of coal fires. Priest's house, Bill said, there's a door. It wouldn't open. Chester gave it a shove. It's nailed shut. That window, Bill said. Chester smashed the glass with his shotgun. It led to a cloakroom. The smell of fresh sewage seeped from beneath the thankfully closed toilet seat. Wait, Chester said, grabbing Bill's arm. We don't know how many there are, but we can't risk both of us being shot in the close confines inside. I'll go in here. You make your way around to the main entrance. When I start shooting... You'll have a shot at their backs, or catch them in a pincer. Go, Bill said, moving away without another word. Chester climbed in, quickly moving from the cloakroom to the hallway, peeking around the corner to confirm it was empty before moving away from the stench. The front door had been nailed shut. It led to a hallway filled with photographs of men and vestments, occasionally interspersed with a few nuns, and the even more occasional civilian. Pride of place went to the photographs of the last four popes, with the most recent pontiff displayed directly opposite the front door, on the wall above a staircase. Not counting the cloakroom, two doors led from the hallway. Except for funerals, Chester hadn't been in many churches before the outbreak. They were cash-poor, land-rich, and far too often frequented by local magistrates. 
He made up for it since February, and recognized the two front rooms immediately. The somber chamber with the dark furniture and solitary crucifix was a place to meet the grieving, or the soon-to-be bereaved. The other, with the photographs of church groups of expeditions to distant shrines, of illustrious visitors, was for happier occasions. He gave the rooms a glance, and then ignored them. His concentration was split between listening for the approaching enemy and not dislodging the statues and crosses on the narrow tables lining the hallway. At the bottom of the stairs he paused, listening. He heard nothing, not even the crack of a rifle, but when he placed a foot on the stairs he was sure the whole world could hear it creak. With no way of ascending quietly, he sprinted up. Six steps led to a landing, another six steps, another landing, then three steps leading to a split landing. In one direction it led to a corridor above the ground floor hallway. With no time to investigate the rooms leading from it, he took the other corridor, the one leading towards the church. He glanced briefly inside the open doorways. A kitchen, a library, a living room with a small television, and a door at the end that led to another staircase. He went down. At the bottom was a far heavier door. He could hear gunfire, but it was distant. Shotgun held ready, he eased the door open. It led to the vestry. Cupboards and drawers were open, vestments strewn on the floor amid empty boxes of communion wafers. The gunfire grew more furious. Were they firing at Bill? His hands were slick in anticipation of what was to come. Before that could solidify into fear, he opened the door leading into the church. It only opened an inch. On the other side, a tasseled red rope held it closed. A quick slash with a machete, and the rope was cut, but the door creaked loudly as it swung ajar. Was that a pause in the gunfire? But they heard it. Again, fear was taking hold. He sheathed the machete and ran out across the sacristy, diving for cover behind the altar. For a moment he thought he'd moved unseen, but then a burst of gunfire came from the rear of the church. Bullets ricocheted off the stone. Another burst came, then a third, and then he realized that the solid stone altar was, in fact, a cement casing around a steel bar frame. On the off chance you could understand me, it doesn't have to end like this, he bellowed, before running to the left, diving off the altar and behind the first row of pews. Lead thudded into the heavy wooden seats as he edged along it, towards the center aisle. The entrance to the bell tower was on the left. That was where the sniper lurked. He needed to get closer before he tried a shot. Another burst came, too many bullets to count. But the moment it stopped, he sprinted in a crouch along the central aisle, diving forward just before another burst was fired. This one was followed by a loud shotgun blast from the rear. Bill had found his way inside. The fusillade began again, this time not aimed at him. Chester pushed himself up, fired at the rear of the church, and then bounded forward. Bullets pinged off metal candle racks, smashed the tall windows, chipped stone, and thudded into wood. Chester sprinted along the pew, tripped over the padded kneeler, and turned the fall into a roll until he was sprawled behind a massive stone column. The next burst from the rear of the church tore chunks of plaster from the column, revealing it to be just as ornamental as the facade surrounding the altar. The second burst, and plaster rained down on him from above, but that burst was cut short by a shotgun blast and a gargled scream. Chester pushed himself up, gun raised. He sprinted the last dozen feet to the rear of the church as Bill made his way from behind a pillar at the end of the central aisle. Near the doorway to the bell tower lay a corpse. You okay? Chester asked. Fine. You're bleeding, Bill said. Chester raised a hand to his cheek. Ricochet. I'll secure the front door. He'd made it ten steps when a giant of a man, at least seven feet tall, barreled through the bell tower's doorway. A sledgehammer dangled from the giant's hand. 
With an effortless flick, he swung it one-handed at Bill. The hammer collided with Bill's shotgun, sending it pinwheeling across the church. The force of the blows spun Bill around. The giant lashed out with his left hand. His fist slammed into Bill's head, pitching him off his feet and out of the line of fire. Chester fired from the hip. The slug ripped through the giant's chest. You all right? he asked, running over to Bill. Bill shook his head and spat blood. I'll check the rest of the tower, Chester said. First he grabbed the thug's dropped AK-47 and handed it to Bill. Here. Chester stepped over the corpses and ran into the bell tower. From the outside, the tower had an octagonal shape. Inside it was square. A rope hung down the centre, disappearing above through a hole in a square of planking. That raised the hopeful prospect that the bell was still there, and revealed a flaw in their plan that they'd not considered what to do if it wasn't. Around the exterior wall ran a set of stairs. Made of industrial metal, they were one grade more permanent than scaffolding, whereas the handrail was one grade below. The diagonal horizontal sections were bolted to an upright that in turn was attached to the stairs by a single bolt. Careful not to lean on the handrail, keeping his weight as close to the wall as he could, he clambered up the stairs. He was out of breath halfway, and in no condition to fight when he reached the top, but thankfully there was no one there. There was a bell. It was smaller than he'd expected, with a base diameter of four feet, a height of three feet. He reached down and gave the rope a tug, confirming the clapper was still attached. A soft gong came in reply. Good enough. Clear up here, he called. Intending to climb down, he turned around and stopped. Three military green backpacks lay in the corner of the tower, furthest from the stairs. Around them were scattered ammunition casings and the sets of wire mesh that must have covered the glassless windows. The bags weren't what arrested his attention. Behind them was a radio set with a thin coil of wire extending out of the window. The set was a foot square, six inches deep, and attached to a separate battery pack. He had no idea if its size was a function of age or a function of its range, but it was a worrying sight that surely had only one meaning. He grabbed the packs and carried them downstairs. Chapter 20 The Bells, The Bells L'Église de Notre-Dame Cray Bill rubbed his jaw. He'd been punched before, but never so hard. His entire head ached, and the feeling was spreading down his body. Intending to stand up, he reached down and put his hand into a pool of still warm blood. He wanted to swear, but didn't want to move his mouth. He pulled himself to his feet and found them unsteady. A soft gong reverberated from above, followed by a shout of, Clear up here! The bell worked. That was a start. He staggered over to the door by which he'd entered, a side entrance at the right and rear of the church. A hole had already been hacked through the thick woodwork, presumably by the people they'd just killed. Looking around for a way to secure it, he came up with no better option than a barricade. At least that was something with which he'd had too much experience. He was still dragging the first pews across the floor when Chester appeared at the bottom of the stairs. Let me give you a hand, Chester said, grabbing the other end. Together they hauled it in front of the door. How's your face? Ugh, Bill mumbled. He tried again. Sore. Ah, the bell seems to work. That's the good news. There's... Bill winced, rolling his tongue around his mouth. He found two of his molars were loose. There's bad, he mumbled. They had three bags, three backpacks. Ah. Uh. Bill walked over to the rifle, picked it up, checked the magazine, then slung the gun on his back. Yeah, Chester said, because that's all we can do. Do you have any shotgun shells left? 
Bill fished in his pockets, found a single handful and passed them over with an apologetic shrug. It's enough, it'll do, Chester said. Might not be a third person, of course. Or that third person might be somewhere deep in the town. That's not the worst of it. They picked up another pew. There's a radio up there with an aerial running outside. Explains, Bill began, and winced. Explains why they were here, in the bell tower, Chester said. That's what I thought. They wanted the elevation for the radio. The good news on that score is that ringing the bell wasn't part of their plans, so we can go ahead and do that without worrying it'll be the signal for some fresh nightmare to commence. Question is, who were they radioing? Someone on the island? Or someone further away? They pushed the pew into position. I don't know about you, but I've got the feeling that Claire and the Professor weren't telling us the full story. I don't think they're lying, not exactly, but they're being deliberately cautious about what they share. Agreed, Bill said as they picked up another pew. A radio set, and that these people were communicating with someone puts a different complexion on all that happened on that island. Can't say it's any more illuminating. Bill looked at his wrist, then tapped his watch. Broken, he said, with another wince. Chester looked at his own. Mine too. I'd say we're about ten, twenty minutes behind schedule. Why don't you start ringing the bell? I'll finish up here. We'll have at least ten minutes before the undead come. Chester had brought the three bags down from the bell platform and had left them at the bottom of the rickety staircase. Bill quickly searched them in turn, finding six spare magazines for the assault rifle. The rest of the gear was uselessly mundane, cutlery, tin mugs, water bottles, a few items of clothing, and a few looted trinkets. That each bag contained cutlery and mugs confirmed there had been three people here. Perhaps the third man had died. It didn't matter. Once the bell began to sound, the undead would come, the island would be resupplied, and he could head for the coast. Hopefully. He laid the magazines on the step, kicked the bags out of the way, and then pulled on the rope. It was heavier than he expected. It took him two pulls before the clapper softly gonged against the bell. He pulled again, and got a louder tolling that caused a vibrating spike of pain to arc across the back of his battered head. Wincing, he pulled again, and again, and again. The doors are secure, Chester called over the echoing bell. I didn't bother with a vestry. The way the house is laid out, the undead won't get into the church from that direction. Bill nodded, only half sure he'd heard him correctly over the sound of the bell. You want me to take over? Chester asked, motioning at the rope. On the downward swing, Bill let go and pointed up the stairs. Check on the undead, got it, Chester said, and clambered up the stairs once more. Bill concentrated on the rope trying to ignore the sound and the growing throbbing in his temples. He fixed his mind on the radio. He'd not seen one in the watchtower, nor had there been one in the house by the river. That didn't mean those people hadn't had one. That didn't explain why they had a radio in the first place. What had the thug's plan been? The presence of a radio suggested there was a plan. He pulled the rope down. Why had they lured the undead to surround the island? To find out where the ammunition was hidden? But if they already knew it was at the airfield, it wouldn't have taken long to locate. No. Too many pieces were missing, and the puzzle was only a distraction from their real task. The salvation of Belfast lay here in France, but the future of these French survivors lay in Ireland. He had to reach the coast. Chester came back down the stairs. They're here! He yelled above the bell's sonorous din. Zombies! They're at the wall ringing the church. About sixty already. More coming from the town. It's working. Here! He took hold of the rope. Go and take a look for yourself. At the top of the stairs, the noise from the bell was disorientating and made counting the undead difficult. But there were already over a hundred. 
more approached from the direction of the island. Their numbers were greater around the wall to the west, but scores approached from every other point of the compass. They'd almost left it too late. The undead had already begun to disperse through the town. Again he thought of the questions he'd not asked the professor. At the top of the list was for how long had music played from those trucks, luring the undead to the island. Right beneath it was where the undead had come from, if the survivors had been living on the island for so long, rarely seeing more than a zombie or two each day. He turned toward where he thought the plane had crashed. There was no sign of it, nor of any landmark that might indicate how far away it or Starwind's watchtower was. Soon after they'd crashed, hundreds of zombies had gathered by the plane. Where had they come from? If how was a better question than where, the answer had to be Dernier. Was the radio the method? Was this gang in communication with some other, larger group? If the islanders had more than one boat, why had so few come on this resupply mission? Why had Claire and the Professor been forced to detour inland to recruit Starwind and her people? Once resupplied, would the survivors leave the island? Venturing into the town to kill the undead, would they remain behind their walls? Time would provide the answers. The greatest number of undead were to the west, five deep at the densest point, and that was only twenty meters from the gate through which he and Chester had entered, a gate that they had not re-secured, not that it mattered. A gate wide enough for a hearse was situated on the northern side of the churchyard, and it was open. Zombies were already traipsing between the tombstones. By now some must have reached the church itself, lost to view, their beating fists inaudible over the echoing chimes. At the perimeter wall, sheer numbers pushed zombies over the low stone barrier, while even more edged towards the gate. He unslung the rifle, balancing it on the open window. He closed one eye, lining up the sights with the largest portion of the pack. He was sure he could hit them, but with each chime his head shook, his eye reflexively blinked. Yes, he could shoot them, but he doubted he could hit their heads. He lowered the rifle, and in time to see a chunk of masonry fall from the perimeter wall. A zombie followed it over and into the church's grounds, falling flat on its face. As it scrambled to get up, a five-foot section of wall crumbled, spilling bricks on top of the fallen creature. More creatures followed. They had less time than he'd thought. He went downstairs to wait for the doors to break. Chester raised his eyebrows and nodded his head towards the main door. Bill shrugged. He collected the six magazines he'd placed on the stairs, cramming them into one of the packs. A moment more, and he'd sorted through the meagre scraps of food and added the three water bottles. When he looked up, Chester gave him a quizzical look. Again, Bill shrugged. Their choices were limited, but if the worst happened, it would happen quickly. He tied the bag closed, slung it over his shoulders, and cinched the straps tight. He checked that his machete and the pistol were secure, picked up the rifle, and then took up station by the main doors. It all came down to whether they broke before Sergeant Khan arrived. They did. The side entrance was the weak point. As the mass of the undead grew, the weight of bodies pushed against the door that in turn pushed against the mass of pews they'd thrown in front. The door shook and juddered open, wide enough for a skeletal hand to curl around the frame. Bill slammed his foot into the pews. In turn, they slammed against the door, crushing the hand. Black pus splattered the frame and the pews, but a second later the door shuddered open again, and the rest of the creature's arms slid through. Bill stepped back, raising the rifle, biding his time. The side entrance was the weak point, but the processional door was shaking too. It appeared to be a sturdier construction, but he was mindful of the facade around the pillars and the altar. Appearances weren't to be trusted.
The door edged open another inch. Bill raised the rifle, taking a guess at where the first head would appear. Twenty seconds later, he was proved almost right. He dropped the rifle a fraction. The bullet slammed between two clumps of ragged brown hair. The zombie fell, but with its arm and shoulders inside, preventing the door from closing. The undead behind trampled the corpse as they pushed and shoved, clawed and kicked. The next gong from the bell was softer than the preceding one, and then the tolling ceased, replaced with a moment of equally deafening silence before Bill's hearing adjusted and the churning roar of the undead outside came into focus. I don't know about you, but my head's pounding, Chester said. Do you reckon enough have heard it? Bill was too busy lining up his shot to answer. An undead woman had squeezed her head and shoulders through the door, but thrashed up and down, bucking too fast for him to fire. Finally, he did, and missed. The bullet slammed into the creature's neck. The zombie didn't pause as it writhed up and down. The wound tore wider. The trickle of black pus grew to a torrent until Bill fired again. This time his aim was true. The creature slumped to the floor. Its corpse was shunted a foot inside as another zombie pushed its way into the breach. A few minutes and they'll break through, Bill said. You ready for this? Chester raised the shotgun. Sometimes I try to remember what a quiet life was. Bill paced forwards until he was eight feet from the door. The grasping zombie stretched out a clawing hand towards him. Bill fired. Its head exploded, spraying gore and bone across the wall. Its body fell, joining that of its fallen comrade. There was now a foot-wide gap between door and wall. Bill flipped the selector switch to fully automatic and fired, emptying half the magazine's bullets into the writhing gloom beyond. He took another step forward and fired the remaining bullets before retreating back to Chester. There's too many, he said, slotting a fresh magazine into place. Way too many. Best save the ammo, then, Chester said, slinging the shotgun as he stomped forward. He took hold of the broken pews and pushed. Wood creaked. A moment later, bone crunched as the corpses were pushed between door and wall. Chester turned around, bracing his back against the pews. I don't suppose you saw the sergeant when you were upstairs? Afraid not, Bill said. He'll come, Chester said. He's a good man, Sergeant Khan. From what I saw in Birmingham, we can trust Locke not to be too far behind. From outside came a metallic screech. That didn't sound good, Chester said. How long do you want to give it before we retreat up the tower? I don't think we will, Bill said. That stairwell is made of scaffolding with only a handful of bolts holding it in place. Did you see that platform at the top? It's balanced on the scaffolding, not attached to the wall. When a few dozen thrashing undead get into the bell tower, it'll all come tumbling down. We could perch on the ledges by the window but the stone surrounding the pillars and on the altar is just a ceramic façade. If the bell tower's the same, it could collapse before help arrives. The door jerked towards the pews, which in turn shook. Chester pushed back. Oh, I'm, I'm as big a fan of the desperate last stand as the next bloke, but we'll die quickly if, if we fight them here. Agreed, Bill said, raising the rifle as a hand, then an arm, then a shoulder snaked around the door. I say we retreat to the church house. Maybe we can get out the other side? Escape through the cemetery. If not, we try for the roof. Wait it out, up there. Do you? Chester began, but was interrupted by a metallic screech. Then a sharp crack, and a sharper pop, as the hinges were torn from their bolts. The door sagged forwards. Around the fractured frame appeared a writhing mass of decaying hands and arms, heads and shoulders. Go! The house! Bill said. Chester spun around, unslung the shotgun, and raised it to his shoulder. But he held his fire as he stalked backward down the church's central aisle. Bill fired. There were too many targets to miss, and too many zombies for it to matter. With the door now on its side, it became a ram with which the undead pushed the stacks of pews out of the way. 
The undead spilled into the church. Bill ran, following Chester back to the altar. There are times I wish I could call in an airstrike, Bill said, as the creatures flooded through the broken door, trampling the pews and each other in their attempt to reach their prey. They ran through the door to the vestry and slammed it closed. There's nothing to secure it with, Chester said. Should have considered this, Bill said. It's too late now. They left the vestry behind and re-entered the house, again closing the doors behind them. They climbed the stairs to the landing and kept going up. Where below the colour scheme was dark and subdued, on the second floor it was bright and airy. The doors weren't polished wood, but painted white, their handles ceramic rather than brass. The walls were cream-coloured, nearly matching the pale carpet, and covered in abstract paintings rather than stern-faced photographs. There were similarities with below, however, in that the upstairs consisted of a long corridor with a window at one end, a door at the other, and other doors leading off, all closed. And now we can breathe, Chester said, pushing the stairwell door closed. He walked to the window, but stayed a few feet back from it. It looks bad to me. What do you think? Bill walked over to join him. It's not great. I'd say about fifty zombies immediately below, more in the cemetery, mostly heading towards the bell tower. Call that a couple of hundred. There's even more around the wall. Based on what I saw up in the tower, we've the better part of a thousand zombies close by. That many, Chester said, and they really had dispersed through the town. You think Dernier's people were behind that? I do. Not that it matters. A muffled bang echoed inside the church, shaking the building. I don't like the sound of that, Bill said. We've two options. Climb onto the roof or make a run for it. Personally, I'm not a fan of hoping that help comes. Nope, like old George Tull says. We're the help that comes to others. Any help coming to us will have to kill all those undead first. Aside from the risk of a stray bullet, I'm not sure the building will last that long. Run, then? Bill asked. Run, Chester said, and set fire to the building first. We might be able to save ourselves some grief down the road. Then we need sheets for ropes, Bill said. You check the rooms on that side of the corridor, I'll take this side. The nearest door opened on to a bedroom with a narrow window, too small to easily climb out of. He quickly stripped the bed, throwing the sheets out into the corridor, before turning a quick 360 in search of something better down which they could climb. He saw nothing. He left the room, moving to the next. It was dark. The curtains were closed. He stood in the doorway, blinking as he adjusted to the gloom, and so almost didn't see the figure. We stepped back as a knife slashed through the air where his neck had been. Whoa, who are you? he said, the words reflexive, but the only reply came from the knife hurled at him. He dived backwards, but the knife went wide, thudding into the hallway's plasterwork. He rolled across the floor, unslinging the rifle from his back, but the thug was faster. Bullets thudded through the wall two feet from the ground. Bill rolled away from the door out of sight, but far from out of danger, as another dozen shots tore through plaster and paint. Chester? Bill called. Yep. Yeah. Chester's voice came from the room next to Bill's, and was followed by six bullets fired at an oblique angle towards him. That was a tad unnecessary. Chester added. Look, mate, I don't know who you are, but I bet you understand English. Fight us and you'll die. Leave now with us and you could escape and live. Another barrage of shots came. Bill? Five miles from home. Watch the east, up and under. Got it? Understood, Bill said, though he hadn't a clue what Chester meant. Instead, he fired five shots through the doorway. The thug returned fire. Bill emptied the magazine. The moment he was out, there came the roar of the shotgun. Once, then twice. Clear, Chester called out. Bill stood and crossed to the doorway. The thug was dead. What was that about five miles from home? Bill asked. Just nonsense, Chester said. 
I wanted him to think we had a plan. It worked, I suppose. Guess this was the third man. Get the sheets, we need two ropes, Bill said, quickly searching the dead man's pockets. He found nothing unusual except for a folded piece of paper in the breast pocket. Now stained with blood, only a single number four was legible. Do you have matches? he called. A few, yes. Bill kicked at the table, breaking it into splinters. He smashed one of the paintings, adding the canvas to the broken wood. He went into the next bedroom, dragged the sheets from it, tossed them into the corridor, then took the Bible from the desk. He added that to the pile of kindling, then took the sheets through to Chester, who was knotting others into a rope. How's it look outside? Chester asked. Not bad, Bill said. About twenty or thirty out there who'll get close before we hit the ground. We'll have to fight our way clear, but once we reach the gravestones we'll be safe, relatively speaking. He rubbed his shoulders. My bruises are getting bruises. Did you find anything on the body? Chester asked. No, no tattoo. I'd say there are far more of these people than the professor thought. Assuming these are the same people as at the watchtower and elsewhere. I've had enough of France, Chester said. It's been nice to visit, but it's time we went home. Agreed. Bill grabbed the first of the improvised ropes and tied one end around the leg of the bed, as Chester tied the other set of sheets to the opposite leg. They dragged the bed against the wall, beneath the window, and took another look outside. Start the fire, and let's go, Bill said. He double-knotted the laces on his boots and zipped his jacket up to his neck. And done, Chester said. Fire's lit. No turning back now. Bill smashed the window, propped the rifle on the window sill, and lined up a shot. Go, I'm right behind, he said, as he pulled the trigger and hit the zombie's arm. Chester threw the sheets outside and clambered after them as Bill fired again. This time the zombie fell backwards, and he hoped it was dead. He aimed at another, then a third, but he couldn't fire at those close to the knotted sheets for fear of hitting Chester. He slung the rifle, grabbed the sheets, and climbed out the window, his last sight that of flames licking up the walls of the house. His head was level with the bottom of the window when he heard the shot. Chester had already reached the ground. The shotgun was in his hands, a dead zombie at his feet. Chester fired again, and Bill clambered down. The sheets were nearly impossible to climb. Above, he heard cloth tear. There was a jolt, and he dropped half a meter. He looked down. Chester was hastily reloading the shotgun, the undead approaching too fast, too numerous for him to hold them alone. Ah, uh, hell. He let go of the sheet and fell, landing hard. Run! he yelled. But Chester didn't. He fired. Can you run? Good question, Bill said, getting to his feet. I can stand, so I can walk. Go! He unslung the AK-47 as he limped after Chester. His ribs were bruised. His hand ached around the stumps of his missing fingers. His jaw still screamed from that colossal punch back at the bell tower. He fired a burst into the pack of undead to the left as Chester fired a shot ahead of them. The zombies were too numerous to count, but that was another way of saying even he, with his terrible aim, and Chester with his terrible eyesight couldn't miss. Until his gun jammed. He dropped it, among the tombstones, drew the pistol, and quickly emptied the handful of rounds in the magazine. He let it fall, and drew his machete. I'm out! Chester fired again. Me too, unless you've got any spare. Sorry, just run, sprint through them, Bill said. Go first, keep going, you'll reach the wall. Chester might make it, but Bill knew he wouldn't. They were almost surrounded and his body had taken too great a battering to fight for much longer. He smelled smoke. He didn't look behind because he could hear the groaning wheeze of air being dragged into undead lungs. The zombies were close, and getting closer. Chester increased his pace, but not by more than Bill could match. Run! Bill bellowed, but Chester ignored him. A zombie was directly in their path. Red coat, Red trousers, 
a shredded black shirt beneath. Its clothing showed no sign of weather damage. Either it had spent the last few months trapped inside, or it had been a living person not that long ago. A shot echoed across the churchyard. The zombie fell. Red-brown gore splattered across the tombstones. A chest had been keeping a shell back. No, he was holding the shotgun by the barrel. Bill looked to the right, in time to see a far more raggedly dressed creature crumple to the ground. Someone was firing somewhere close, but not close enough. A zombie lurched across their path to the left. Chester swung the shotgun. The grip smashed into the creature's jaw, pitching it from its feet. Chester kept going, and so did Bill, leaping over the zombie's grasping arms and almost straight into the clawing reach of another creature, slouching towards them from their right. Bill ducked, swinging the machete up and around, slicing through the ghoul's decaying cheek and nose. Momentum spun the zombie around, but the wound hadn't killed it. Bill didn't stop to finish it, but ran on. Ahead, immediately in front, were four of the undead. One collapsed, then another, and then the last two simultaneously. Don't stop, Bill said. Wasn't planning to, Chester said. Immediately ahead was the wall. Beyond it, a figure rose from a crouch. Not a zombie, but a person carrying a carbine. Bill didn't recognize him. But right then and there, he didn't care whether he was one of Dernier's thugs or not. The next figure to stand, he did recognize. It's Soraka, Chester said. What's your right? Bill replied. Chester spun in time, though not in time to swing the shotgun. Instead, he launched his left hand, palm out, into the creature's jaw. It fell onto its back and scrabbled to its side before Chester brought his boot down on its skull. Bill spun left, then right, in time to see another distant zombie collapse. Only then did he look ahead. He saw Locke, a rifle raised, and another five figures beside her. Ignoring everything else, they sprinted for the wall and safety. Never has a sight been so sorely welcome, Chester said, as he threw himself over the wall. Looks like we got here just in time, Locke said. Bill fell down next to Chester, while on either side the survivors fired at the approaching undead. I take it the plan worked? Bill asked. Not especially, Locke said. The undead had already dispersed, but you're both alive. Then we need to get to the airfield, collect Scott, Bill said, pushing himself to his feet. Claire's gone to get him, Locke said. Rather, she took two hundred people with her to get more ammunition. Two hundred? Chester said. Then there are a thousand of them on the island? Locke glanced at the people with her. A few more than that, I think. We were to collect you, then return, unless there's any reason we should stay. Smoke billowed from the house's windows and was already seeping out from beneath the roof of the church. A flurry of gunfire came from the French survivors, aimed along the road. No, there's no reason to stay, Bill said. Chapter 21 Thomas Allen Murphy, Cray It was an anxious walk to the island, at least for the French survivors, and their nervousness rubbed off on Bill. Rifles were raised and lowered, with more than a few bullets fired into the shadows. Some of those shadows kept moving, lurching out of broken doors or from behind wrecked cars. In turn, their appearance brought a roaring fusillade, the shots echoing, fading, merging with a gunfire coming from deeper in the town. After two hundred meters, Locke stopped issuing commands for the firing to stop, replacing them with a near-constant reminder to keep the weapons aimed outwards. Friendly fire was added to worries over being surrounded by the undead. A memory of the radio set raised the additional concern about how friendly that fire actually was. In the town, Windows were boarded up. Doors were nailed shut. Where the main road was a shallow river of murky brown water, the side roads were blocked with concrete, cement, vehicles, tree trunks, and whatever junk had been scavenged locally. 
Above some buildings and occasionally across the roads, scaffolding linked the roofs. Even more occasionally, they passed a long ladder pinned to the side of a wall. Though they were so coated in rust, he wouldn't trust them in anything but the most desperate of escapes. After another half kilometer, Locke gave an exasperated shrug and gestured they should fall to the rear of the group, where they'd only risk being shot from in front. They aren't soldiers, Chester whispered. No, Locke said. Not yet. A trio of shots came from near the front, seemingly echoed from a distant street to the right. They need suppressors, Chester said. Which gives us something to trade, Bill said. My read of the situation, Locke said, is that they blocked the alleyways and ground floor entrances and built walkways above as a way of reducing the risk of attack from zombies at street level. However, soon after these defences were complete, they stopped maintaining them, presumably because all efforts were needed in the fields. More recently, with those music lures close to the island, these blocked alleys funneled the undead to the bridge. Unfortunately, because they've not been maintained, many of the barriers have broken, and the undead are now spread throughout the town. Ringing the bell only worsened that dispersal. Hang on a mo, Chester said, stalking over to the remains of the corrugated barrier. He pushed at the corpses with his shotgun, then examined the wall. What are you looking for? Bill asked. Ah, this, Chester said. He held up a thin piece of moss-coated cord. One end was still tied to a wrought iron bracket at the side of the house. Presumably, that had originally held a hanging basket. More recently, it had held the corrugated sheet in place. The rope's been deliberately cut, Chester said. I'd say this was the plan all along. Summon the undead to trap people on the island, and when they dispersed, ensure the zombies stayed in the town. Why? Locke asked. What possible good would that do anyone? From everything the professor said, from what little I've seen, these people were quite content staying put on their island. Ahead, the French patrol had stopped, where a pile of tires and barbed wire lay half-submerged in the flooded road. Was this a barricade? Bill asked. Before he could ask Locke to translate, a barrage erupted to their left. Two of the French survivors had slung their weapons and begun restacking the tires. At a curt command from a tall man in a ragged trench coat, they abandoned them, rejoining the others now hurrying along the road. We best not fall behind, Bill said, hurrying to keep up. There were three of them in the church, he added. Dernier's people, Locke asked. Has to be, Bill said. They had a radio set. I think they were in the bell tower so they could take advantage of its height to send and receive messages. Do you remember seeing a radio in Starwind's watchtower, or at the house by the bridge? Not that I can recall, Locke said. What kind of radio? A bulky thing with an external power supply, Bill said. One person could carry it in a pack, but they'd not have much room for anything else. I see, Locke said. She said no more because they'd caught up with the rest of the survivors. It was impossible to tell whether Dernier's plan had succeeded, since it was still unclear what that plan was. The result, however, was indisputable. The undead were trapped in houses and side roads throughout the town. The islanders had been resupplied and would be able to gather more ammunition. However, a good portion of those bullets would be expended over the coming weeks before the town could be called safe again. Weeks? Perhaps months, depending on the weather. He turned his attention to the survivors themselves. They were dressed much like those he'd met at the airfield. Their clothing was slightly less uniform, slightly more colourful, but it was just as patched and oft-repaired. As many feet wore trainers as boots, and all looked worn. Their packs were of varying sizes, and only two were of a military design, but he couldn't tell whether the women carrying them had a similar background. The weapons were mostly carbines, though an older man carried a rifle. It wasn't a military style, but far sleeker than a hunting tool. Was it for sport? Perhaps so, but that didn't mean the man had owned the gun a year before. That was the overarching impression he got from the survivors. Whatever they wore, held, and had, 
It had been collected and shared out according to need over recent months. Of course, if they'd stayed put in this small town for all those months, with no major city close enough to loot, they would have had no choice but to make and mend. The deeper they pushed into the town, the louder gunfire raged across the alleys, lanes and streets. Undead corpses became a common sight. The barricades grew sturdier. Blockades around the alleys grew denser. Equally, the artificial walls sealing those alleys were more often broken, confirming Locke's hypothesis. In securing the town, the islanders had created a funnel down which the undead had slouched to the bridge. But before the survivors reached the island, they came to a heavily defended warehouse. Guards stood sentry on the road outside, behind a hasty barrier of upturned four-wheeled handcarts, ringed by the bodies of the undead. The guards' clothing was more uniform than their escort, though still raggedly repaired. Their weapons were slightly cleaner, their stances slightly more rigid, their gazes disinterested in the arrival of the living. It was a safe bet, when combined with a lack of questions from those accompanying Locke, that newcomers weren't an uncommon sight for the islanders. Bill filed that thought away, as a wiry red-headed man stepped forward, issuing orders in accented and faltering French. Four stories tall, the building had a trio of water towers perched on the roof. The ground floor windows had been sealed shut with welded plates. The upper windows were narrow, but closely spaced. To the left of a battered truck, dented and pummeled almost beyond recognition, were two five-meter-wide sets of shutters, one of which was open. Inside was a tightly curving driveway leading to a basement chamber. Bill was still trying to work out what the building had been before the outbreak when the red-headed man walked over to them. Welcome, he said. His English was perfect, his accent Irish. I'm Thomas Allen Murphy. Most people call me Tam. You must be the Irish survivors I've heard about. Not quite, Bill said. Soraka's from Ireland, Chester and I are from London originally, our pilots from Australia, while the other two in our party came from the United States. Though, when we leave here, we will be making for Ireland, for Belfast, specifically. That's close enough to call you kin, Tam said. We left via Dundalk. That's across the border, but not too far from Belfast. I might have some information useful to you. We left some supplies behind. This was back in... He was interrupted by a loud clatter, then the roar of an engine. The sound grew. Lights appeared in the curving tunnel, resolving into headlights, as a tractor and trailer chugged out of the underground car park. Excuse me, Tam said. There's work to be done. Can we help? Bill asked. I've done your part for the day, he said. Go to the island. Get some food inside you. We'll talk later. They stepped aside as the tractor growled its way outside. Handcarts were dragged out of the way, and the tractor and trailer chugged down the road, a squad of guards jogging to keep up. When Bill looked again, he saw Tam disappearing down into the tunnel. Their vehicle store, I suppose, Bill said. Reckon so, Chester said. So what are they doing with the tractor? Do you think it's to move the bodies? It's going to the airfield, Locke said. She gestured at a pair of the guards. That's what they said to one another. They're bringing all the ammunition back here. Do you see that lorry that looks as if it's been rejected by a scrap merchant? That was Dernier's people. They put speakers in the back, drove it here, bringing the undead with them. Again, Bill looked to the entrance to the underground car park. Their vehicle and fuel store? It can't be that large. What is it? A government office or something? I'm not sure, Locke said, but one of them said it'll take them days to inspect their entire motor pool. As the tractor moved further away, they heard another engine start below. I've got fuel to spare, Chester said. Bill motioned they should start walking, but waited until they were out of earshot before he spoke. What do you make of them? The same as you, I suspect, Locke said. There's more going on than we were told yet a lot of what we were told was the truth. I've been here since the beginning, 
and most haven't strayed far, Chester said. You can tell that by the gear. But they're used to strangers turning up. That's different to England. And because it's different, I won't draw conclusions beyond that. I'll tell you one thing that worries me. How the zombies all ended up here. Locke's right. These barricades created a funnel. The first time a pack of the undead lurched into the town, they'd have had this problem. That means this is the first major attack since the defences were built. In which case, where did the zombies come from? And the hundreds that gathered around the plain, Locke said, where did those creatures come from? If these zombies were lured here with music, I wonder whether we misread why those two young men died in that barn. The escaped from the watchtower, yes, but weren't running away, since if they'd been fleeing, they would have come to Kay. I think they aimed to stop Dernier's people. Perhaps they intended to destroy the trucks, or steal one, in order to lure the undead to trap Dernier. Starwind will be able to shine some light on that, Bill said. If she's willing to talk, Locke said. I take it we're agreed on something else, Chester said. But Dernier's attack required more than twenty people. Add in the radio set, and I can't fathom what they hoped to achieve. Supposition is like an itch, Mock said. Start scratching, and you can't stop. But you rarely get deeper than the surface. Ah, time for a detour. That's an optician's. It's time you had some glasses, Mr. Carson. The optician's was sandwiched between two near derelict cafes. The short windows suggested it was a recently converted house, rather than a purpose-built shop. Warped plywood covered the windows, while a ship's worth of planks had been inexpertly nailed to the wooden door. Since the door opened inward, and the sturdier of the planks were nailed across the frame, it only took a hefty kick to open the door. Another kick, and the lowermost plank came free, leaving enough space for them to crouch and enter. Chester moved quickly inside, his machete raised. He searched behind the counter before moving to the doorway, leading to the back room. Empty, he called, barely before Bill had followed Locke inside. Smells damp, but not of death. He moved to a rack of designer frames. Try behind the counter, Locke said. You want the prescriptions which weren't collected. Fair point. There's a lot of empty cases down here he added, as he stepped behind the counter. Looks like I'm not the first customer since the outbreak. He opened a drawer, took out a case, and then a set of black-rimmed frames. Not bad, he said, holding them up. He tried them on, but not even close. He put them back in the box and tried the next. What now, Mr. Wright? Locke asked, taking a seat. Now? Same as since we crashed, get back to Belfast. And beyond that, Locke said, obviously the presence of these people changes things. Yes and no, Bill said. If we can, we'll fly the helicopter here with a sat phone and some suppressors, perhaps in trade for ammunition. Beyond that, it'll be easier to assess after we've seen the island. Oh, I like these, Chester said. Very Hollywood. Ah, no, not unless I wear them upside down. By the time we get back to Belfast, Locke said, and then back here, perhaps we'll be able to tell whether the professor is correct or not about the undead. There's Elysium too, Chester said, trying on a pair of over-large and overly pink frames. Nope. There is, Bill said. Ah, oh, perfect, Chester added. He'd found a pair of half-moon wire-rimmed glasses. Not perfect. He pressed them high on his nose. Good enough for now, I'd say. Yes, we need to have a think about what we can trade. Bill nodded, but his mind had already moved on to what they needed from these French survivors, and whether it would be willingly given. Chapter 22 An Island Unto Themselves Ile Saint-Maurice, Cray as they drew closer to the bridge, the clusters of mud-coated corpses grew more numerous, interspersed with a colourful flash marking the more recently infected, and the more sombre sight of survivors collecting a slain comrade. About them, 
were other survivors, easily divided into two groups, sentries armed with carbine or rifle, and workers, levering, sweeping and shoveling the twice-dead to the side of the road. Thankfully, gratefully, the workers were armed too, though usually only with knife or hatchet. When they paused to watch the newcomers pass, none of the guards hurried them back to their labours. They were workers, not prisoners or slaves, and like the patrol who'd collected them from the church and the guards at the vehicle park, they weren't surprised to see newcomers in their midst. Bill offered a few friendly greetings, but got barely a word in reply. Whether anything should be read into that was utterly forgotten when they finally reached the bridge. Now that is what I call a barricade, Chester said. Two massive gates, over thirty feet high and twenty feet wide, made of welded sheet metal had been erected on the mainland side of the bridge. At the top ran a pair of girders, a mass of chains, and a small platform on which stood three people, each holding a telescope, each peering into the distance. Undead corpses were piled three deep around the gates, except where a narrow corridor had been cleared leading to the currently open right-hand gate. Inside, beyond another group of armed sentries, a second set of gates marked the far end of the bridge and the beginning of the island. Though it was shrouded in smoke from dozens of cooking fires, Bill's overriding impression was of a shanty town. Bill, it's the professor, Locke said. Bill tore his gaze away and down. To the north of the gates, next to a jumble of scaffolding, the professor was in conversation with a diminutive woman holding a clipboard. As the three newcomers approached, the professor saw them and waved them over. She smiled. Bien, bien, vous êtes en vie. Welcome. Bill smiled back, though the expression didn't reach his eyes. The surprised relief in the professor's tone was unmistakable. Mr. Wright, Ms. Locke, Mr. Carson, this is Dr. Britta van Housen, our chief engineer, the professor said. Nice to meet you, Chester said. The diminutive woman's eyes moved from Bill to her clipboard, to Locke, to her clipboard, to Chester, and back to her clipboard, before finally nodding. For some reason Bill thought it was with approval. Do you have any experience in construction? She asked, her accent Germanic. Not especially, Bill said. I have to work, Dr. Van Housen said, and with no more ceremony marched over to the pile of scaffolding. A gang of six others, who'd been idly talking, sprang to attention and rushed over to her. It is the remains of our footbridge, the professor said, gesturing at the scaffolding. We constructed it after we built the gates, with a ladder at either end. It was secure from the undead. Dernier destroyed it after the assault on the armory. Ah, Bill said, another piece of the puzzle slotting into place. That's why you took the boat upriver. We had plans to run a cable car from the island to the warehouse, the professor said. Construction was due to begin this week. It will get built, but not until the footbridge is repaired. In turn, that will have to wait until the ghouls have been dispatched, their bodies cleared. Ah, we are in a race against time, and have fallen into second place. From the number of corpses, I take it the bells didn't summon as many as we'd hoped, Bill said. It was enough, she said. The island has been resupplied. Well, that's a good day's work, Chester said. There's got to be at least five hundred corpses. The professor shrugged. It is a lot of dead zombies, Bill said, with those at the church and the bodies we've seen on our way here, and he was interrupted by a distant gunshot, and with the undead still trapped in the town, that's a lot more zombies than you thought. It is hard to count the enemy you cannot see, the professor said, and we could only see those immediately in front of the gate. I didn't mean I was doubting your word, Bill said. It's that I believe it, that you didn't have many zombies in the area over recent months, and now there are thousands. How did Dernier summon so many? For how long was he planning this attack? It is over. Does it matter? The professor asked. 
I'm afraid so, Bill said. We found something in the church. Is there somewhere we can talk? The National Assembly will meet when Claire returns. Can it wait an hour? I think so. Good. They will have as many questions for you as you do for them. Come, I'll take you there. You can wash and eat before the session. They followed the professor to the gap between the gates, stepping around the corpses and over deep drainage channels dug into the roadway, now filled with gore and bloody scum. Welcome, she said. I don't call this paradise, but we aim to make it paradise on earth. Le paradis terrestre est où je suis, Locke said. Paradise is where I am, the professor said. Yes, Voltaire still has something to teach us. This is where we are, and where we have learned to become who we truly might be. I'm more of a Shakespeare man myself, Chester said. Bien sûr, vous êtes anglais, the professor said. With a second set of gates looming ahead, it was impossible to properly form an impression of what lay beyond. From what lay southward, it evidently wasn't a large island. A few hundred meters long at most, the remains of a second bridge near the southern end languished in the fast-flowing snowmelt-fed river. What couldn't be seen were buildings, not as such. A forest of scaffolding, wood and metal panels obscured any chimney or rooftop that might dwell below. The second set of gates was open, but only by the width of a person, and a sentry stood in that gap. The gangly teen, with a scruffy attempt at a beard, made an equally scruffy attempt to stand to attention, but he was more elbows and knees than a stiff back. The professor patted him kindly on the shoulder as they went through the gates. Walkways ran across and over a road, where caravans and camper vans, trucks and lorries had been parked bumper to bumper, and even stacked on top of one another. Scaffolding ran to and through and above the vehicles, though it was impossible to tell which supported the other. Planks and panelling had been laid on the scaffolding to create floors and walls. Little natural light made it down to the roadway, making it difficult to pick out specific details. But immediately ahead was a giant crane, explaining how the camper vans had been placed on top of each other. The chains running from the crane to the gates explained how those were opened. Beneath the crane, the old road had been reduced to a narrow alley, an inch deep in water. One story above, on a walkway that ran behind the crane, a woman with two young children paused to watch them. The professor gave a friendly wave. You actually did it, Chester said. You built a walkway city. The professor gave a bemused smile. A town, at best. No, I'm impressed, Chester said. Back in London, a group of us took shelter in a broadcasting station near Oxford Street. We were trapped by the undead, but had this idea of building walkways across the rooftops. Around there, the buildings are pretty close together. Lots of those old Victorian alleyways. I ended up separated from that group. When I returned, months later, they'd relocated to the Tower of London, but not before they'd linked up hundreds of buildings. We talked about doing something similar around the tower. Dreaming of it is more accurate. Stay above the undead. Stay safe. You managed it here, though. Initially, we had no choice, the professor said. When choices became available, we had already adapted to our new way of life. Up here, please. They followed the professor up a set of metal steps, then a sloping ramp of irregularly sized aluminium sheets, until it met wooden planking laid on a bed of crudely cut wastewater pipes. Now five feet above the ground, the professor led them along the walkway, then down another that branched to the left. This section was enclosed, with more planking above and wooden panelling on either side. When they reached the next narrow junction, Bill realised it wasn't panelling, but the walls of someone's home. Not the most pleasant of homes, sure, but security from the undead was as great an aid to sleep as insulation. Another turning, and they finally had stone walls and windows on one side. It was through one of the windows that the walkway led, 
and through which the professor led them. Welcome to the town hall, she said. Here you will find our doctors, our workshop, school, theatre, library, and our shops. Shops? Chester asked. A market might be a better description, the professor said. It is a place for trade, though we closed it during the crisis. It will open again soon. And here's me having left all my traveller's checks on the plane, Chester said. The window door led to a reception area, run by a stern-faced elderly man. His long moustache drooped almost at the exact angle of the battered berry on his head, but the unit badge had been polished to a shine. He wore a jacket, shiny at the lapels, and a tie that was dull at the edges, but had a gleaming pin holding it in place. When he saw the professor, he rose and offered her an arthritic salute. She replied with a kindly smile and a few words in French. You can wait in my office while the assembly gathers, the professor said. They didn't have far to go and saw no one else until they reached her office. Three tables had been crammed into a space that really only had room for one. A woman sat at the desk closest to the door. When she saw the professor, she jumped to her feet. Somewhat incongruously, she wore a suit. The material was faded and patched, but it was the distinctly impractical style of the pre-outbreak world. Please make yourselves comfortable, the professor said. Lorraine will bring you some refreshments. Without needing a translation, the woman darted from the room, if you'll excuse me. The professor left. Chester sat in the room's only armchair, leaving office chairs for Bill and Locke. It's tempting to read some of these papers, isn't it? Locke said. I can guess what they say, Bill said. Food levels, water consumption, warnings from the doctors about disease and malnutrition, complaints and suggestions from anyone not too exhausted to pick up a pen. It'll be the same as back on Anglesey. The door opened, and the suited woman entered carrying a tray of hot drinks. Chester sniffed. That's coffee. Is this really coffee? Lorraine gave a brief smile, placed the tray on the desk, and left without speaking. She must be more of a tea drinker, Chester said. He picked up a mug. It is coffee. Bit weak, but it's real. Well now, this isn't too bad. Mug in hand, he leaned back. Not too bad at all, considering how the day began. It's not over yet, Bill said. Chapter 23 The National Assembly of the Sixth Republic Gilles Saint-Maurice, Cray The coffee was long since drunk when Lorraine returned. She led them to a room barely larger than the office, and made to seem smaller by the cloth-covered tables that nearly filled it. The professor sat in a padded oak and brass high-back chair facing the door. Behind her was a French tricolor and a flag of the European Union. Claire sat on her right. The chair to her left was empty. Five other people sat at the table, but that left another four empty chairs. Welcome, Claire said. Please sit down. Good to see you, Claire, Bill said. Did you make it to the airfield? And we made it back with Monsieur Hickson, Claire said. He is with our doctor. Sergeant Kahn and Private Kessler volunteered to join the patrols clearing the town to the west of the river. We should help them, Bill said, taking a seat opposite the professor. First, we have a few things to discuss. Sorry, I assume this is your leadership group. That got a derisive snort from a jowly man about fifty years old, with sagging skin underneath two days of stubble. This is the National Assembly of the Sixth Republic, Claire said. Professor Victoria Fontaine is our president. General de Hobstraat was our Prime Minister. She gestured to the empty chair next to the professor. He died during Dernier's attack on our armory. As you can see, the professor said, indicating the other empty chairs, his was not the only death. Our assembly is much depleted. But the Republic lives on. Mr. Wright is the leader of the people in Belfast. A grey-haired woman frowned. Le Président? 
Le roi, l'empereur? I'm just an advisor to our mayor and our council, Bill said. But we can negotiate with you, the professor said again in English. Before we decide whether there is anything to negotiate, Bill said, there are a few matters we must discuss. At the church, we were attacked by people. Three men. They had a radio set. With the height of the bell tower and the church's elevation, the signal could have reached for miles. Derniers people? Claire asked. Bill shrugged. I assume so. Can you describe them? The professor asked. There's one you'd be bound to remember, Chester said. An utter giant of a man. Well over seven feet tall. Not sure what that is in meters. Two and a half? That received mostly blank stares that only turned to puzzlement after the professor had translated. It is as I feared, she finally said. Dernier had people outside the island. It is something we will need to discuss after we send a team to the church to see if the bodies are still identifiable. Sure, Bill said, which leaves the small matter of our two communities. We want the same things. Somewhere safe for our children to grow up in a land free of the undead. Words are easy, of course, but they're all I have until we're back in contact with Belfast. The good news is that we have satellites, and they'll use those to look for us. I'd like to paint a message on the runway, so they know we've been here. We've a helicopter that has the range to reach here if it operates from one of our ships anchored off the coast. How soon it will arrive will depend on the weather, but whether there's a message or not, they'll see this town, see what you've built. They'll see the smoke and know there are people here. They will want to make contact. In our shoes, wouldn't you? You will invade and take everything, the jowly man said. Take what? Bill asked. How? We need a fleet of helicopters to transport an invasion force. What could you possibly have that would be worth a cost in people, in ammunition, in fuel? But if our actions so far don't prove our intentions, is there any point continuing? Of course there is, the professor said. Jacques is being cautious. We all are. You must remember, we were betrayed from within. What happens when your helicopter arrives? What happens in two weeks, in two months? In two months? Who can plan that far ahead? Bill said. I'd like to offer to airlift you all to Ireland, but we're months away from being able to do that. That produced a muted chorus of indignant muttering. In the first instance... We'll give you a sat phone and access to a satellite overhead. Images of this corner of France will give you some warning of the weather, and perhaps some warning of the arrival of the undead. We'll be able to bring you some suppressors, too. The models we've designed are for the British Army SA-80, but I'm sure our engineers can redesign them to fit your equipment. At present, that's as far as I can promise. It's the weather as much as anything. It will hamper movement at sea as much as flights. And in return? Jacques asked. I'm sorry? You give us silencers? A satellite? What do you want in return? Jacques asked. The same thing we charged for helping you today, Bill said. All eyes turned to the professor, a mix of anger and confusion as to what price she'd agreed. He means nothing, the professor said. You would do this for nothing? There are too few of us left for us to barter away our children's future. I agree, the professor said. Good, Bill said. That leaves the small matter of us getting in contact with Belfast. You said you would paint a message on the runway, Jacques said. I did, and we will, Bill said, and I'm sure it will be spotted, but only if the skies remain clear. A rescue party was dispatched before we lost contact with our people. I assume they'll make landfall somewhere near Calais, and at some point in the next day or two, assuming they haven't already arrived. I don't know how well supplied they are, but I doubt they'll be able to linger more than a couple of weeks. Less, if the weather turns again. If it does, that would limit the chance of the satellite spotting this town, and restrict any flights the helicopter might make. Staying here is far more appealing than a trek through the wasteland, but for the sake of my family, I can't stay here. 
worrying that someone might get the insane notion of trekking through France in search of us. We have to travel to the coast and leave as soon as possible, in the hope we can meet up with the rescue party before it leaves. We'll depart tomorrow morning. You can stay longer, the professor said, though it was clear that she was one of the few not glad these newcomers weren't going to linger. Best not. Too much rest and I'll get a taste for it, Bill said. However, you could help us pick a route. Is there a railway line we could follow to the coast? In Britain, the raised embankments and lack of traffic before the final collapse made them far more navigable than the roads. To Anya, then west, Claire said. The railway line is passable, the roads, not as much. Good, that just leaves the vehicle, Bill said, and enough fuel to get to Calais, with enough spare to reach the Irish Sea. Ah, there it is. There is the price, Jacques said. We'll travel on foot if we have to, Bill said. The longer the journey, the longer until our helicopter arrives. Did you hear that? The gunfire? He paused as all eyes turned to the narrow window. The sooner we get to Belfast, the sooner you get the suppressors. It is a small enough price, the professor said, and it is one we can easily afford. But you should not go to Calais. Dunkirk is where Tam arrived with the general. They came in small boats and secured them in case they had to flee. Speak to him. He will tell you about the boats. As for a vehicle, we have an armoured car. Yes, a small price for your help today. The professor's assistant, Lorraine, led them outside into the corridor. I can give tour? She said. Locke replied, but not in French. Is that Polish? Bill asked. You're from Poland? Lorraine sighed. Estonia, Bill, Locke said. She says we've been given a couple of rooms. Can you ask her to take you to Scott? Bill said. See whether he's able to travel in the morning. I'd like to find Tam and have a chat with him about these boats in Dunkirk. Locke spoke to Lorraine, then turned back to Bill. Tam will return here. He shares the office with Lorraine. That room there. She pointed. Bill nodded and waited until they were gone before walking a few yards down the corridor to a wooden bench. He sat. Chester sat next to him. That went better than I was expecting, Chester said. You're pretty good at this negotiation, Locke. It wasn't a negotiation, Bill said. We're emissaries from a foreign land meeting as equals, rather than rivals. When was the last time that happened, Marco Polo? Well, that's a particularly Eurocentric view of history. We're back in an age when Here Be Dragons is written on every corner of the map. An interesting idea, Chester said, and one I'd happily debate, but after I've had a bit more to eat. I was going to take a stroll and find the kitchens. Good idea. That was next on my list. See if you can find out what their diet is usually like. Chester nodded. Understood. Alone, Bill leaned against the wall and stretched out his legs, ignoring the aches that would turn into an all-over body bruise by morning. Emissaries wasn't really the correct description. From his understanding of history, they were almost always followed by scouts, spies, and then soldiers. That wouldn't happen here. Whatever he called it, the meeting had gone better than he'd hoped though no better than they deserved after risking their lives, a risk they'd taken with incomplete information. He stamped down on the rising tide of anger. The plan had been devised in haste, in the face of a language barrier, and after the death of a soldier Gaston. They'd volunteered to help and had all survived. Apportioning blame was a fruitless endeavour. In the morning, they'd leave, and with enough fuel and food to reach Belfast. That was a significant improvement on a few days before. But what then? This hadn't been a negotiation, but that would come next. They'd promised a sat phone and suppressors, but given the time frame they might have to give the rifles as well. They could spare a few hundred. This begged the question of whether he wanted the helicopter to return with ammunition or food. Both were needed, and it appeared that Cray had both to spare. At least, 
That was the impression the professor had wanted to give. A single helicopter couldn't carry much of either, and that led his thoughts to what would happen next. A second flight? A third? Would they create an air bridge? It wouldn't be from Ireland, but from somewhere along the French coast, perhaps one of the Channel Islands. Perhaps. But aviation fuel was scarce, and so were the ships they'd need to transport it back to Ireland. Within two days, they would reach Dunkirk, dragging a tale of the undead in their wake. They wouldn't be able to linger on those beaches waiting for George and Nilda. No, they would have to take to the sea, and so to Belfast with all haste. How long would it take? A week? Two? It would take far less for the new world to return to the coast, and only a matter of hours for the helicopter to then reach this island. Three weeks, but no longer. And then what? He knew what he wanted, what Belfast needed, somewhere they could farm safe from the undead. Despite what the professor had first said when they'd met at the airfield, despite her clear belief that the zombies were dying, Cray was not the safe refuge Bill sought. It might provide them with food, though, enough to last until spring. That left the question of where they would go after Belfast, but that question had an obvious answer. Somewhere closer to France. Again, he thought of the Channel Islands, but it was just a place on a map. He had no idea what damage the apocalypse had done. Perhaps they could detour past the islands on their way to Belfast. No, better to do it in the New World on the return journey. If not there, they would find somewhere else. Or they could collect more helicopters from near Belfast International. They'd find a way. That left the question of what they could give in trade for food. Clothes? Perhaps. Solar panels? Wind turbines? Crossbows? What was it that the people of Kay really needed? Penny for them? Tam asked. Bill looked up and saw the Irishman leaning against the wall, ten feet away. He looked the very definition of a man lost in his thoughts. I was trying to work through a trading route between Belfast and Kay, when we've a sea in the way, only a handful of large ships, and winter just begun. We're leaving in the morning for the coast. We might reach Dunkirk before nightfall, or certainly the day after, depending on traffic. Tam sat on the bench next to him. Traffic? That's one of the many problems of the old world I'm glad to see the back of. I earned my crust on the eternal commute, haulage taking shipping containers from Ireland, driving them on a row row to Hollyhead, then to Dover, and all points east. You've spoken to the assembly. I did. We're going to send a helicopter here as soon as we get back. They said you left some boats at Dunkirk. Hundreds, Tam said. That many? Not everyone who crossed the sea came here, Tam said. How much do you know about Ireland after the outbreak? Bits and pieces, Bill said. We found a few survivors there, and a few more made it over to Anglesey early on in the outbreak. Anglesey? That was our main refuge over the spring and summer. With a nuclear power station, I'd have thought that's the last place anyone would call safe. We managed to get the power station operational, Bill said. We had electricity for a glorious summer and a fraught autumn, but you're correct. The clock was ticking as soon as we arrived, hence our relocation to Belfast. Electricity? We've some ourselves. Generators for the most part. Rigged up some solar panels during the summer, but demand always outstrips supply. It's worse now. You can't fish by firelight during a storm. Electricity is the answer, isn't it? Bill said. It's the golden goose. No, the grail. I was never good at metaphors. If we lose the ability to create it, I worry we'll never have it again. But worries should be set aside after battles. You want to know about Dunkirk? The short version, the end of the story, is that Dunkirk is where we came ashore. We had a flotilla of small boats. Skiffs, yachts, launches, trawlers. Some diesel, some sail, but all small craft. Some vessels travelled faster than others. So during the voyage, we became strung out. The general, myself, a few hundred others, we arrived first, dragged our boats onto the shore, so there'd be room for the second wave. 
Then we defended our beachhead while awaiting the other's arrival. Defended it against the undead? Yes, a few people arrived overland during the night, local families who'd escaped the port. They told us that Dunkirk had been destroyed. The port town, I mean. We'd come ashore in the beaches to the south. Destroyed? How? Bill asked. Was it a nuke? No conventional weapons. It was bombed from the air. Don't ask me by who or why. They flattened the port. Shortly after dawn, the second wave of boats arrived. That was the people brave or desperate enough to travel at night. Not all found our section of shore, but so many did that by the time the third wave arrived a few hours later, there was no room on the beach for their boats. They were left in the shallows. The undead grew in number, and though the numbers of the living bolstered our ranks, our situation grew untenable. The decision was made to leave the beach. Not everyone wished to take that risk, and so they returned to the boats to wait offshore for the last of our ships. They intended to go north, to the Netherlands. Others simply left, heading for home, wherever that was. How many stayed with you and came here? Bill asked. One hundred thirty-nine, Tam said. Our destination was European Central Command, a grand name for a hastily convened EU government. It had been overrun. We came here instead. I don't know of anyone who's come through Dunkirk since then, so don't know what state the boats will still be in, or even whether they are still there. Everyone here knows the general story, and everyone who passed through or left would have known those vessels were on the beach. I do know that you won't find any boats to the south. In the north, maybe, but not south. How many people left? A few hundred, Tam said. A few hundred more were just passing through. And has anyone who left come back? Bill asked. A few dozen, not counting those expeditions who set out to explore. They found nowhere better than this. How far did people go? Bill asked. The Pyrenees in the south, the Alps in the east. We avoided the Riviera. Did you hear about Marseille? A mushroom cloud. No one made it further northeast than Stuttgart or further north than Rotterdam. You don't want to go there. Millions of people did back at the beginning looking for an escape that wasn't to be found. It's a grim fate that befell our world. No, Cray is all we know of, the best we knew of until now. If you're in Belfast, you should take a boat south to the Republic, to Dundalk. It's halfway to Dublin. You can't miss it. Just look for the wind turbine. That's where we sit out from and we left a lot of supplies behind. A lot of people, too. Colm and Siobhan? Charlie, Tamara, Billy, Callie, Dean, Lena? Tam stared at him. We found them. On the west coast a few months ago, Bill said. I'm sorry to say we arrived too late to save any others. I thought they were dead, Tam said. Did they tell you what happened? Just the bare bones, Bill said. They mentioned a guy called Tam, but assumed you were dead. That's not surprising. Everyone else died. We'd been moving from place to place, farm to house to office, to anywhere with a door we could secure against the undead. The zombies always followed us, and after nightfall, when we were too exhausted to leave, they surrounded us. Sometimes we could hold them off until dawn, then a few of us would lure them away, meeting up with the rest at a prearranged rendezvous. This time... The last time, we had to flee at night. Was that in Iskillen? No, it was for the south. Blarney, maybe. The places blur into one another. I led the undead away, but I didn't make it to the rendezvous in time. I looked for them. Do you know how it is? Do you know how it is? Have you spent much time out in the wilds? More than I've spent in safety, Bill said. England, Wales, Ireland, and now France. Then you know... You set out down a road but end up running through a forest in the opposite direction. It's a miracle I met the general scouts. You know about the redeployment to Ireland. Of forces from across Europe? Yes, we've a detachment of French special forces who flew into Dublin. That's where the general arrived, how we arrived. He tried to hold Dublin, but after the airport was lost there were too many zombies, too many civilians. He retreated north to Dundalk. The general was Dutch and he'd been in contact with a commander from the Coast Guard who was looking for a refuge, just like us. 
At that point, I was just another survivor, a conscript. I wasn't privy to the full plan, but I'm certain it wasn't to leave Ireland. By the time I arrived, they'd emptied half the homes and shops, gathering every scrap of food that could be found. But the undead came. They always came. We had defences, walls, barricades, but it wasn't enough. That's when I got my battlefield promotion. I suggested lures. Trucks with speakers in the back to lure the undead to a killing ground. It worked, more or less. Until it didn't, Bill asked. What went wrong? Too many people died. Too many zombies came. The second column never arrived. They'd come from Dublin in two groups. The general had led the advance party. The second group must have been overrun, and we faced the same fate. We lured the undead away from the coast, and then left by sea in the commander's ships. The general knew of a plan for redoubts in France and the Low Countries, redoubts like the airfield. The Coast Guard commander had heard over the radio defences around Zealand. That's where she went, while we went inland. We never saw her again. Never found any working redoubts except this one. He shrugged off the memory. But you should go to Dundalk. Watch out for the undead. Maybe they've died by now. Maybe they haven't. Be careful in the hospital, that's where we lured them. The hospital? I'd have thought that's the last place you'd want to destroy. Ramps, Tam said. We needed a building the zombies could walk into. There's ammunition in the barracks, and there's a coal depot by the waterfront. Coal? That will be useful this winter. Would you like to go back? Either tomorrow or when the helicopter arrives? To Ireland? No, no, I don't think so. I'm glad some others survived, but everyone I knew before February is dead. Ireland is a memory to me, and if I went back I'd only be reminded of those I've lost. I'll stick with the professor and follow her path. Using speakers in trucks, that's how Dernier lured the undead here, Bill asked. He copied my idea, Tam said. Why, though? What did he want? What does anyone want? Tam asked. Power and glory. Same as it ever was. That man was filled with hate, too. Wanted to spread it around. You heard the story about his brother, trapped in a prison. I think that was his story, Tam said. I think that's where he and his people came from. They were left for dead, and perhaps their souls died there. But he is dead now. He is, Bill said. Then that's one less problem to worry about. He leaned forward, glancing up and down the corridor, until someone fills his shoes. He had a lot of followers then, Bill asked. Who can say? Tam said, standing up. Good luck with Dunkirk. It's the beaches to the south. You can't miss them. There's boats lined up for miles. And check out Dundalk. I have to report to the assembly. They'll want to know how many of our lorries and buses still work. Thank you, Tam. I'll see you before you leave, he said, and headed off down the corridor. Bill drummed his fingers against the bench and closed his eyes, replaying the conversation, then the meeting with the assembly. It wasn't what had been said, but what hadn't been said that made him wonder whether trade would even be possible. He had three weeks, three weeks to return here in a helicopter, three weeks to organize a plan for trade. What if the French survivors didn't want to share their food? If not, then there was only one chance for the people in Ireland. He'd spent many a long night on Anglesey talking with Kim, the Sholto, with Mary, and on his own, going over maps and books, discounting one place after another. They didn't have the luxury of time. No, if Kay couldn't supply them with enough food to last until the spring, then only one course was open to them. He rolled the idea around in his mind, desperately searching for an alternative. Chapter 24 I can see your house from up here. Ile Saint-Maurice, Kay. Chester leisurely wandered the walkways, relishing the wonder of his artificially restored sight as much as the wondrous sights of this odd little island. He felt secure, content, and not just in relief at having survived another day's nightmare of unprecedented danger. 
An odd sense of belonging, of homecoming, had swept over him in a way that highlighted how transitory had been their life in the tower. The people were wrong, of course, but in the handful he saw, he could imagine Nilda or Tuck, Jay or Kevin. Perhaps it was just homesickness coupled with the awareness that his old home by now would have been trampled to dust by the undead. On that basis, it was a thread of thought best not pulled. He pushed the half-moon glasses back up his nose and peered at the street sign ahead of him. It had been painted in white on a red car bonnet, attached to the scaffolding with blue plastic-wrapped wires. Red, white and blue. I wonder if that's a coincidence. He spoke loudly enough for the pair of children standing by the ladder to hear him. Though they both glanced round, they didn't speak, but clambered upward to the next level. The words on the sign were in French, but since he wasn't looking for anything in particular, it didn't matter which way he went. Not wanting the children to think he was following them, he headed to the ladder and climbed down. Ground level was as gloomy and dank as a sewer. The gutters had been extended and expanded from their original depth, though they were overflowing. Presumably they led straight to the river. That, he decided, was something else on which it was best not to dwell. He was on a wide street that had been turned into a narrow alley by a camper van on one side, a truck on the other, and then a minibus next to that. Through the drawn curtain on the minibus's windshield, he saw that the driver and passenger seats had been replaced with a wooden table and a trio of matching chairs. In the back were a wardrobe, an ancient cabinet, three narrow armchairs, and the same number of hammocks currently secured to the roof. The side windows were covered in paintings, though it was too dark to tell whether they were priceless rescues or cheap prints. On top of the minibus was a garden shed, supported by scaffolding poles secured to a shipping container on the opposite side of the street. The shed's door opened, and an elderly woman peered out. Chester nodded, smiled, and kept walking, doing his best not to laugh. Yes, he could see himself living like this and if he did ever live in a converted truck, he'd certainly install a garden shed on the roof. The humour evaporated, after a few more paces, when he realised that the elderly woman had chosen elevation over comfort to remain safe from the undead. More vehicles lined the road beyond, but he ignored the windows and concentrated on the licence plates, marking off one European country after another. The scaffolding walkways above were so dense, with the gaps between the vehicles so increasingly narrow, it was impossible to judge where the buildings were either side. From the surface beneath his feet, he was no longer walking on a road, but on some paved courtyard. From ahead came raised voices. The door to a camper van flew open. Starwind jumped out. She stormed along the alley, spun around, and continued shouting at the van. One young man, then another, stepped outside. They were both about Starwind's age. The taller of the two was dressed in mended dungarees over a cracked leather jacket, while the other wore ill-fitting jeans tucked into thigh-high boots and a brown overcoat buttoned tight. Even though Chester didn't understand what they were saying, the way Starwind remonstrated with them, the way they were protesting in reply, showed she knew them well. Abruptly, Starwind threw up her hands, turned on her heel, and stormed away and towards Chester. He stepped aside, but she ignored him, marching straight past. After a brief internal debate, he followed her. Just as she reached the camper van with a garden shed on the roof, she stopped. What? she demanded of him. Is everything okay? Chester asked. Did you hear what I said to them? she asked. I heard it, but I didn't begin to understand it. Sorry, I really don't understand French. Friends of yours, are they? She fumed, chewing her lip. No, she finally said. They are not friends. Not now, not any more. Do you want to talk about it? With you? No, she said. Good, he said. She frowned. Because I have a ton of questions, 
Chester added. Like, where did all these vehicles come from? What? Oh, a camping ground. And the shed? He asked, pointing at the wooden extension above them. The door to the shed opened, and the old woman peered out. She gave them both a stern glare, followed by a flurry of sterner words. Starwind gave a brief reply. This way, come, she said. Chester smiled at the old woman, then followed Starwind down the narrow alley. Are we in trouble? he asked. You are, Starwind said. You were disturbing her. Ah, oh, sorry about that. So these all came from a campsite. Where? I don't know. Does it matter? It might do, he said. We're leaving first thing tomorrow. We could do with all the information we can get about the world between here and the coast. You're going already? she asked, surprise briefly replacing anger. We've our own families and friends and they'll be looking for us. Dangerous task, that. The sooner we're reunited, the safer they'll be. It's a nice place, this. One of the best I've seen. And you are an expert, she said, her voice dripping with scorn. As it happens, compared to everyone else on this planet, yes. I spent a good portion of this year looking for other survivors out in the wasteland of England and Wales. Seen a lot of little communities, reinforced farms and office blocks, that kind of thing. Then there's Anglesey and London, of course, but those aren't a fair comparison. On Anglesey, we had electricity. In London, we had the world's most famous fortress. This place, though, is a labour of love and sweat. Vive la République, she said, with marginally more scorn than before, then resumed her angry march down the narrow laneway. He was dealing with a teenager, so decided to channel Nilda and change tack. Why don't you give me a tour? Chester said, jogging to catch up. It'll make a great story for the children when I get back. You have children? She asked, slowing but not stopping. About fifty of them, he said. Rescued them from Kent a while back. Ah. Oh. So, show me around, Chester said. This place is impressive. There's a lot we could learn from it. Like? Like, how do you grow food? Where's the water come from? Water comes from the sky when it rains, the river when it doesn't. Food came from farms during the summer and from, from, I don't know the word, inside farms with light and heat. Hydroponics. Greenhouses. Perhaps, she said. What more do you want to know? Well, like with hydroponics, are you using LEDs or mirrors and daylight? If the latter, what type of crops do you grow? I don't have time. Why not? The battle's over. We've won, right? The battle? Not the war, she said. I have to go to the others. You mean your dead friends? No, the other watchtower, she said, finally stopping. There's another. In the west. I wanted eight watchtowers surrounding the city guarding against evil. Eight would have been perfect. Four would have been enough. Four would have kept everyone safe. No one wanted to join. I had two. East and West. No one knows what has happened to the West. Ah, well, dusk isn't far off, so you can't leave before dawn. We're heading north and west, so we might as well travel together at least as far as that. How far is it? Vingt kilomètres. In miles? I don't know in miles. What about in English? She gave another scoffing laugh. Twenty kilometres. Well, dark is a half hour away. You won't get there tonight. Wait until morning and travel with us. You wanted to recruit those two men? I am desperate, she said. I mean, I mean, no, I know what you mean, he said. Most people are out in the town hunting down zombies, while those two weren't. Says a lot, that. Why do you want to help me? Same reason we helped today, he said. We have to work together, all of us. We were saying in our community... We're the help that comes to others. It's too easy to hide in the dark, to hope the nightmare will end. But that's always been a false hope. It caused so many deaths from suicide and starvation, disease and the other kind of infection. Now the only chance for an individual to survive is to risk their lives and hope that others will do the same for them. 
What good is it to possess the whole universe if you are its only survivor? Starwind said. Precisely, Chester said. No, that is what Rousseau said, what the general said, why we had to create this town. Old ideas and dead men's words. Plus ça change, plus c'est la même chose. Rousseau? He was one of your philosophers, wasn't he? Something to do with your revolution. I've been reading a bit of history, more about Napoleon than what came before, but I remember the name. So people had this idea a few hundred years ago. I guess it's true when they say there's nothing new under the sun. He grinned. She didn't. Look, since we're travelling together tomorrow, you don't need to spend the rest of the evening recruiting companions, which means you've time to give me the tour. Show me why you think this island is such a bad idea. She weighed that up. Finally she smiled, though it was with a calculating grin. Fine, I'll show you. We have to go up. A ladder led to a walkway, to another ladder, another walkway, then to the crane. Starwind sprang onto the ladder running inside, scampering up a dozen rungs before Chester had managed three. After twenty rungs, he stopped looking up. After forty, he almost turned back. By the time he reached the top, he was exhausted. Are you okay, old man? Starwind asked. Oh, fine, fine, he said. Just thought my day's exertions were over after that church. He sat on the narrow platform, catching his breath while he looked around. He couldn't see a radio antenna. Too many people come up here? Apparently not, Starwind said. Dr. Van Housen says it isn't safe. She does. Uh, so go on, then. Eh? Tell me the story of this place. Tell me why you were reading about Napoleon. To win the heart of the woman I love, he said. Your turn. What's there to say? She asked. This is the island. People live here. Fuel is stored in the warehouse over there with the vehicles. Food is over there. Tools and other equipment there. She pointed east of the river. They're not stored on the island? Chester asked. Not enough room, Starwind said. There's not enough water, not enough soap, not even enough food. There isn't. How can there be? They won't go out to gather more. Everyone wants to stay here, stay safe. She leaned over the narrow railing and peered at a scaffolding now far below. Sounds a bit like Anglesey, he said. What about west of the river? Zombies and ruins, she said. No storehouses. She shrugged and leaned out further. How did you end up here? That's my mother's house, she said, pointing southward. You were here during the outbreak and you stayed. You didn't think of leaving. We don't run away. We're not cowards. And by we you mean your friends at the watchtowers? Our clan, she said. Her shoulders slumped. She sat on the cracked wooden planks. And now they're dead. All dead. Why call them watchtowers? Chester asked, skirting around what he really wanted to ask. There was a story, she said. People fighting evil. That's what life has become. Sure, I understand that. I've been reading a lot about emperors and kings, knights and soldiers. I suppose that's natural enough, seeing as we lived in a real castle. All of us are looking for stories that'll make sense of this nightmare. That is it. It is a nightmare. No one knows how or why it started. One minute everything was normal. The next planes crashed out of the sky. Zombies appeared in the street. It was the apocalypse. Armageddon, but praying, did no good. Evil is everywhere. Evil like Dernier? Chester asked. He was evil, yes, but he is not the only evil. He was the figurehead, the leader. He escaped from a prison? I think so. That's what they said while they held me captive. They escaped, him and his gang, escaped because he was told they would rule the world. A handful of them. He didn't think so. He thought there were more. Ah. Uh. You know how many? Chester asked. They didn't let me ask questions, Starwind said. 
They only wanted answers, but they couldn't stop talking. Men like that, they can't. And they wanted to know where the ammunition was. The ammunition? The food? My mother hid it after Dernier arrived. She didn't like him, didn't trust him. Wise woman, Chester said. Those two lads we found in the barn, they're part of your clan? Featherblade and Sunbright, she said. She sniffed. Enzio and Baptiste. Enzio and I went to the same school. He met Baptiste at university. A week after the outbreak, a column of refugees arrived at the airfield. The ghouls followed. Enzio saved my life. I saved Baptiste's. And he saved the general's. Hundreds died. That's when they finally abandoned the airfield, when everyone moved here, and when we started the clan. You started your clan before this had been built? No. Yes. The general wanted to protect the town, the entire town, and the airfield, and the countryside beyond. Too many ghouls. Too much, she snapped her fingers. Chaos. Too much chaos. He ordered everyone back here to the island. I could see what he was doing. My mother saw it too. It was obvious. What was? His Sixth Republic. He said it was a guardian of European democracy. It was nothing. It was words. It was a reason to work every day for little food and less safety. You think building this was easy? You think it was safe? People died, fell, crushed, drowned, bitten. Sure, I can imagine. You mean the general didn't believe in what he was saying? Of course not. It was what people needed to hear. But the general started believing it. That was when we left, preserving the old like that, like this. It isn't how we should live. It isn't how we will create a future, because that future is here. It's now, you see? I think so, he said. Though some days it's hard to even imagine there'll be a future. Enzio and Baptiste, they didn't run away from the watchtower, did they? They escaped. That was when Dernier told me about how he'd escaped from prison. He said he was an expert, an expert in escape, so he was an expert in finding them. He hunted them himself. I don't know. He didn't say they'd been caught or killed. If he had... It would have changed nothing. I would never help him. You were being held separately from them, weren't you? From the rest of your clan, Chester said. I think Enzio and Baptiste went looking for another truck with speakers. We crashed near where we found their bodies. Within an hour, the undead had appeared. The zombies had to have been within a few miles. It puzzled us how so many undead had gathered there. More so when the professor told us how few you'd seen nearby in the last months. So few, because we were killing them, Starwin said. That is why the general's plan was so foolish. We hunted them. That is how the general stayed safe. How many was that? Was what? How many zombies did you kill? Chester asked. At least one a day, sometimes more, sometimes a lot more. A lot less than in Britain. He didn't say it aloud. What about your bonfire? You built it, right? It wasn't Dernier, eh? A signal fire, she said. That was what we agreed. If we lit the fire, we needed help. Someone should have been here, up here, watching. No one was. No help came. Your mother did, he said. She came looking for help for herself, not to help us, Starwind said. You know what's been puzzling me? A lot. True. But this is a puzzle to which I've found an answer. Dernier collected the undead using that trick with trucks and music. He collected them for the surrounding countryside to the east and west. He trapped everyone here on the island, but he'd also cut off his access to fuel and food. That's one of the reasons he went to your watchtower. He'd have known where it was and known it had fuel. We took a tanker each when we started the watchtowers, Starwin said. We found the tankers. It was our fuel. Right, but Dernier needed that fuel for the next part of his plan, 
Now I don't know what that was, but your friends Enzio and Baptiste must have overheard the guards talking. They escaped so they could deal with the undead, steal the trucks and their speakers, and, in my opinion, drive them back to the watchtower to kill Dernier, and rescue the rest of you. They died. What does it matter why? The story of our lives, our deaths, is all that we leave behind, so ultimately it's the only thing that matters. They died as heroes, and that's how they should be remembered. I think you understand that better than most. She stood. It's getting dark. They'll be serving dinner soon. You don't want to be late. There's never enough for everyone. She crossed to the ladder. One last thing, Chester said. When Dernier told you he escaped, he meant he'd escaped after the outbreak. During, I think. Why? And he was told he'd rule the world. By whom? Who told him? I don't know. Men like that, they think they have a right to rule. She climbed down. Chester let it go. Starwind was unlikely to know the answer, but Soraka Locke might. He still wasn't entirely sure of the question. But the shape of it, the nature of his suspicion, stemmed from how he and McKinnery had survived the outbreak back in London. How quickly had engineered for so many career crooks to remain in the city, there to die. Had something similar happened in a prison in France? If so, had something similar happened elsewhere in the world? Had a mass escape been the price Quigley's cabal paid for the Rosewood cartel's assistance? Locke might know, but if she did, it wouldn't change the past, and would barely influence the future. Tomorrow they would return home. Tonight they would eat. Part 5. The Last Watchtower. Day 257, the 25th of November. Chapter 25. A 10,000-seater farm. Cray. Chester lay in the dark, eyes wide open, staring at the faded pillowcase curtaining the window as he waited for dawn. He'd slept well. Surprisingly well. Better than he had since he'd left London. He'd woken in a good mood and refreshed, while night still rained outside. There'd been more than enough for everyone to eat the previous evening, and the surprise on many of the French survivors' faces, extra rations had been issued, which partly confirmed Starwind's warning. The eighty-nine people who'd died since the first attack on the armory were named before the meal began, and, because of that, few questions had been thrown in the newcomer's direction. Bill had been asked to tell them about life in Britain in the aftermath of the outbreak. He hadn't. Instead, he told the story of Siobhan and Colm, and how he and Kim had met them in Ireland. Bill had finished by prompting Tam to fill in the events of which he was a part. He'd kept that brief, since the audience's indifference made it clear that those who were interested already knew. Tam had finished by asking Soraka to recount how she'd escaped Ireland. Instead, Chester had stood. Taking his prompt from Bill, he told of how he'd rescued the children from Kent. In an attempt to avoid all mention of Quigley, he'd not realised his mistake until he was too far into the tale to stop. The children had survived by virtue of successive individuals leaving, leading the undead westward, away from Kent. Their unwitting sacrifice had saved the children, but it had led to a quiet debate among the French survivors over the fates of those who'd left the island. No more questions had been asked, nor stories asked for. The newcomers were given a pair of tow-behind caravans, both on street level, both recently emptied of all trace of their previous inhabitants. Together, alone, they'd had a brief conference where they'd agreed to keep the cause of the outbreak to themselves for now. They'd shared what they'd seen and learned, surmised and suspected, and then turned in. Chester hadn't expected to sleep with so many worries and fears washing around his skull, but he'd woken to find those concerns neatly packaged in a box, labelled Not His Problem, from which dangled a post-it reading, At Least Not For Now. 
They knew where they'd find boats. Scott had been confident in his ability to repair one with the right tools. By all accounts, they were being given a vehicle with enough fuel to reach Ireland and enough space to carry food, ammo, tools, and whatever else they could scrounge. Ahead of them were many opportunities for disaster to rear its malicious head, but they'd all made tougher journeys with fewer supplies. He watched the curtain, but dawn wouldn't be rushed. As quietly as he could, he eased his way to his feet, but knocked into the table that separated his bench bed from Bill's. Mm, Bill muttered. At the rear of the caravan, Scott snored. Sorry, Chester whispered, picked up his boots, belt and coat, and tiptoed outside. The air was stale, smoky, but warm. It was still coat weather, but it felt like summer compared to the snow of a few days before. His thoughts were interrupted by a child's cry, which was muted by a lullaby, then silence with the closing of a door. Mentally, he opened the box in which he'd placed the island's difficulties, though nothing could be done until they reached Belfast. They would have to do something. From what he'd seen, what Starwind had said and what she hadn't, and what the others had learned, the general had been the force knitting the island together. After his death, it was the undead who trapped the survivors here. The prospect of more storms might prevent an exodus until spring, but not beyond. It was still unclear precisely how they'd farmed so much food, but even with tractors, it would be a labour-intensive chore. Could they replace the departing French survivors with people from Ireland, or would that be viewed as an invasion and only heighten the speed at which Cray was abandoned? Perhaps they could offer travel to Ireland for anyone here who wanted it, though that would require more helicopters. A plane? Maybe a train? Maybe that was the answer. They could run a diesel locomotive from the town to the coast, bringing people and supplies back and forth. It would make the world seem bigger, safer. As long as the railway line remained passable, and only after they'd found a train. It might solve Ireland's food crisis, assuming Kay really had any food to spare. It wouldn't solve Kay's real problem, but Delnier's people might lurk inside their walls as well as without. Perhaps, now their leader was dead and contact had been made with the wider world, they'd put all schemes for murder and conquest on hold. Perhaps. Ahead, a woman lowered a sealed bucket through a gap in a scaffolding. Below, his arms outstretched, his head tilted far out of the way, a man steadied the rope. That was one half of another puzzle solved. After a brief question, which was fortunately understood, the other half was solved with directions to continue along the alley and climb the next ladder to reach the latrine. An early breakfast was easier to find. He went to the kitchens and smiled, pretending he didn't understand the obvious commands to go away, until one of the cooks gave him a near-full bowl. Afterward, he wandered back to the bridge to wait for the dawn. As it arrived, his eyes were fixed, unseeing on the riverbank opposite, his mind on the recent past, on Nilda, on Jay, on the children and friends whom he'd see again soon, and so he wasn't paying attention to his ears. A shout came from the guard platform on top of the gates. Another came from somewhere high up on the scaffolding. There was a third shout, a fourth, and then he heard it for himself. A brief moment of confusion was replaced with blessed relief as he realized that the buzzing drone came from a helicopter. Nilda had found them. Raising the half-moon glasses, he tilted his head back, peering between the infrequent gaps in the scaffolding, trying to spy the machine. The sound of its engine grew louder. So did a number of people around him, as survivors clambered down from the walkways and came out into the open air. English, is this you? A woman in a red scarf asked. My people, it must be, Chester said. Above, the sentry on the gates barked an urgent order. Before Chester could ask for a translation, metal rasped. Wheels creaked, and the giant gate groaned open. Ali! 
As people ran through, Chester followed. It was a small group, twenty strong, less than half those who'd gathered near the bridge. As soon as they were through, the gate was closed once more. Chester craned his head up in time to see the helicopter fly towards them from the north, following the line of the river. It was a bubble cab machine, with room for pilot and passenger. As it approached the bridge, it rose, turned, twisted, until it was a dozen feet above the fast-flowing river. They're looking for some way to land, Chester called, but could barely hear himself, so he knew that no one else would be able to. The machine rose, twisted again, and then headed toward the eastern bank of the river. Without hesitation, the survivors sprinted towards the bridge's other gate. Chester ran after them. They were stopped by a stern-faced sentry who yelled and shouted, sending those without weapons back to the island. What's going on? Chester asked. Mort vivant, the woman in a red scarf said, as she drew a long and ancient sabre from a sheath at her back. Ah, got it, Chester said. Chester Carson, he added. My name. What's yours? Anouk. She pointed at the machete at his belt. Understood. He grinned as he drew the blade. She gave it a professionally approving nod. A shout came from above. The sentry barked a string of commands. The guards on the gantry opened fire, shooting at targets on the eastern side of the gate. Chester raised a hand to his glasses, tilting them up as he tilted his head back. The guards had their weapons angled almost vertically. The undead were far closer than he'd realized. The sound of gunfire had drowned out the sound of the helicopter. In turn, it was lost beneath the grinding creak of the gates shuddering open. The French survivors sprinted forward. When in France, Chester muttered, and ran after them. The gap was only two meters wide when the gate stopped. Gunfire stopped a moment later. Chester was the ninth through the gate. Scores of bodies littered the bridge. So many that the corpse clearance work of the night before must have been halted before the task was complete. Among them, a handful of freshly killed zombies oozed dark black pus. Beyond those were at least two dozen of the moving undead, strung out along the bridge. Before the helicopter's arrival, they must have been close to the gate. As the machine buzzed overhead, they turned on their heels, slouching into the town after it. The sentry and four others armed with rifles fired. The zombies danced as bullets thudded into their undead flesh while those survivors armed with blunt or blade fanned out, following some oft-practiced maneuver. A broken-fingered hand curled around Chester's ankle. He slashed the machete down, severing the arm, and lashed out with his foot, kicking teeth from the creature's opening mouth before bringing his heel down on its bare, scalped skull. Practiced but not preached, he muttered. How much fighting have you lot actually done? No one replied. No one had heard him. But who would be awake before dawn, those who'd spent the previous day in battle, or those who'd been on lighter duties? The sentry issued a new string of commands as the firing line reloaded. The undead were falling, but far too slowly. The helicopter hovered over the city to the southeast. When it landed, it would be surrounded. His friends needed help. Chester charged. He jumped over corpses, skipped over broken limbs, raising the machete as he overtook the French survivors. Further from the gate, the bridgeway was clearer of corpses, but pocked and potholed, slick with dew and gory slime. He slipped, almost fell, righted himself, and ran on, raising the machete above his head, and marked his first foe. The creature wore black, so covered in moss it appeared green. The plant had already spread to its skin after months spent idle in some rain-soaked ditch. It wasn't dying, though. Not even close. Its arms thrust forward as its mouth fell open. Its head bucked forward right into the path of Chester's blade. As the blow landed, he pivoted, spinning to the right, dragging the machete free. As the corpse fell, 
He was already skipping past, marking his next target, five feet ahead. He ignored the ruined faces and wrecked bodies as he hacked low at legs, then high at their heads, carving a path through the undead now all lurching towards him. One thought cut through all the others. Nilda and George had found them. Nilda! he yelled as he swung the blade at a zombie's legs. The blade stuck as the creature toppled. Momentarily unarmed, he ducked underneath a fingerless hand sailing towards his face. He reached out, grabbed two fists of rotting cloth, and hurled the walking corpse up and over the side of the bridge before spinning around, stamping his boot down on the downed zombie's skull and dragging his blade free. It had to be Nilda and George. Of course it was. George had taken fuel to London, and when they knew a rescue had to be effected, they would have taken it with them. But who was the pilot? Leon, he muttered, as he swung the blade high, slicing through an upraised arm and into the zombie's temple. Tuck? Did Tuck know how to fly? A colonel of special forces surely did. They'd found a helicopter on a ship, or on shore and flown it inland. Of course they had. They were the help that came to others. Nothing would stop Nilda, nor George. Nilda, he said, swinging the machete to the right. George, he yelled as he hacked to the left. Ah, oh, hell, he added, when the blade slipped from his grip and skittered across the roadway. The zombie lurched onward, mouth open. Chester raised his fists, but the zombie's skull disintegrated as a bullet slammed through its temple. The gunfire had been there all along. Three shot bursts angled along the bridge as the French survivors marched forward in formation. Chester stepped back as they overtook him. Anouk paused, picked up Chester's machete, and handed it to him. George? She said, Shakespeare, yes? Harry, England, and St. George? Uh, right, no, Chester said. George is a mate of mine. I think he's in the helicopter. The woman gave him a quizzical look, either not understanding or not quite believing. Les Anglais. I'm hearing that a lot, he said. She joined the line marching slowly but purposefully across the bridge, adding her sabre to the blades cutting down the undead. Chester fell in at the rear, uncertain whether his charge had achieved anything, uncertain of everything, except that the helicopter had been sent by Nilda and George. Their help had come. At the end of the bridge, the number of the undead thinned, and the sentry leading their group picked up the pace. By Chester's count, they'd killed thirty, not including those shot by the guards on the platform. Another five walking ghouls were dispatched before they reached the fuel store. Chester didn't attempt to count the corpses outside the warehouse. Over twenty guards stood by the gates, with dozens more perched on the roof. The sentry exchanged a few brief words with their commander before leading the patrol deeper into the city. None of the guards from the warehouse joined them. It appeared that at least one lesson had been learned from the recent crisis. There was a shot, but it came from above. On the flat roof of an apartment building to their left, a guard waved her rifle, pointing southeast. Chester spotted other sentries on other rooftops, but soon turned his attention groundward. The barricade ceiling and alleyway had been repaired, though from behind. He heard a rattle suggesting a zombie was trapped inside. The patrol ignored the noise, and so did Chester following a nook through the streets until they came to a ragged halt outside a stadium. From inside came the low buzz of the helicopter. Outside were the undead. Hundreds of bodies had been piled and pushed to the edge of a mostly empty car park. From the deep gouges in the tarmac and ruts in the mud, this was where they'd moved the corpses after the previous day's battle. The handful of abandoned cars were rusting wrecks, Tires, doors, even some seats had been removed. Only one vehicle looked in reasonable repair, a delivery truck with blue and gold livery. The paintwork was scarred, the bodywork dented, 
the light smashed, one tire was deflated, but the vehicle had to have arrived relatively recently. Mental cogs slowly clicked into gear, but hadn't found their place before a figure staggered out from the side of the vehicle. She was dressed like a harlequin. One trouser leg was green, the other red. The sleeves of her coat were grey cloth, while the body was of brown leather. Martine? Anouk asked. The woman seemed to flinch at the word. Her shoulders jerked as she limped a pace forward. She snarled, twisting her head forward, revealing the bloody gash on her neck. The sentry fired a three-shot burst. The first two shots hit the undead woman in the chest, but the third found her skull. She fell. Anouk slowly shook her head, while the rest of the patrol let out a collective sigh of anger and loss. The helicopter, Chester said. Don't forget the helicopter. He jogged forward, machete raised, but found no undead hiding behind the vehicle. He took a brief detour to confirm his suspicions. In the truck's rear were a forest of speakers, a generator and an amplifier. He jogged onward to the stadium's entrance. To either side of the main gates were dozens of garden sheds. They were padlocked closed, but the wheelbarrows next to them gave him a clue as to what was kept inside. The presence of the truck, and that Delnier thought this a target as important as the fuel store, completed the picture. A clatter came from his left. Heading towards them, across the battered car park, shambled a figure in a shaggy overcoat. A jagged scar ran along its bare head, its hair just a tattered wisp, blowing in the morning's light breeze. Hey, he called. Zombies. What do you call them? Ghouls. More vivants. He raised his machete, then lowered it as a shot was fired, and the zombie fell. In the near-empty car park the shot seemed louder than among the denser, packed streets, but it was the sound of the helicopter luring the undead and living alike. The low burr saturated the air, seemingly directionless, until Anouk undid the last of the heavy padlocks. The chains were pulled back, and the gates were opened. The sentry began issuing orders, deploying some people to stand guard outside. Chester ignored his pointing finger and the accompanying angry words and jogged inside, but came to a halt almost immediately. Eight ticket gates were arranged in back-to-back -back pairs and covered in corrugated steel, padlocked together. Anouk walked past him, a large bundle of keys in her hand. She gave him a half-smile, half-glare, and unlocked the nearest padlock. She motioned for him to help. Together, they pulled the steel gate apart, and then headed into the stadium. When the professor and Starwind had talked about farming and hydroponics, he'd clearly misunderstood. He pictured rolling fields surrounded by rolls of barbed wire, but that was old-world thinking. It wasn't a large stadium, a ten-thousand-seater at best, but those seats had been removed. In their place were plastic troughs, window boxes, tubs, plant pots and trays of every colour and battered shape. Most still had soil in them, and a few had bean poles, car aerials or stair rods wired to the seat frames, creating a crude trellis. On the ground, snaking down the steps and along the stands, were a mass of garden hoses that traced back to a row of water barrels lining the rear of the stadium. More hoses snaked from those up to the roof, but Chester turned his attention to the field where the pitch had been. It had been ploughed in the autumn, and was now a mix of muddy rises and waterlogged troughs, and it was there that the helicopter had landed. The rotors still turned, the pilot still inside. Chester had to walk slowly down the steps to avoid the hydra of hoses snaking back and forth but by the time he'd reached the sidelines, the doors still hadn't opened. He waved. From behind him came a shout. He turned around to see Claire and the Professor pushing their way through the patrol, a larger squad behind them, with Tam at the rear. He waited for them, but by the time they reached him, the helicopter's cab still hadn't opened. Your people came sooner than we expected, the Professor said. 
a tone angry, almost accusing. Must have found the helicopter close to where they came ashore, Chester said. Then let us greet them, Claire said. Chester? She turned to the guards, ordering them to stay in place. Right, sure. Let me introduce you, he said, clambering over the field. I suspect it's Leon who's flying. He's French Special Forces. It'll be him or one of his people. Must have flown through the night, though. He slipped and ended ankle-deep in mud. Makes sense, though. Easier to spot lights at night, and it's not like there's any other traffic. The helicopter's rotors slowed and then stopped. Chester did the same, the Professor, Claire and Tam stopping next to him. Chester raised his hand in greeting as the door opened, but his smile froze when the pilot stepped out. I don't know her, he said. I don't think I do. She removed her helmet, and he was sure. About five-ten, she had a near-shaved head that was more grey than blonde. Her face was lined beneath a thin pattern of oil stains and engine grease, but it was closer to sixty than fifty. The jumpsuit was bright orange, but the only part that wasn't as stained as her face was a flag badge sewn to her arm. Bonjour, Claire said, and began a brief back and forth before the conversation switched to a language with which Chester was utterly unfamiliar. Polish, I think, Tam murmured. Yes, that's the Polish flag on her arm. You don't know her? Not even a bit, Chester said. The helicopter was a small machine, with room for a pilot and three passengers, but no one else was on board. He tried not to draw any conclusions from that, because his mind had jumped to the radio set in the bell tower. Surely not, though. Surely if Dernier's people had a helicopter, they'd have used it as a weapon. Surely but not definitely. He turned his attention back to the conversation in time to see Claire's face drop. The pilot repeated something, then gestured at the helicopter. Claire waved her assent, turned to the professor, and spoke in French. The professor's expression collapsed. I don't believe it, Tam muttered. What? Chester asked. But Tam didn't hear him. The pilot brought a small tablet out of the helicopter and came over. She pressed the power button and tapped at the screen before passing it to the professor. Then she reached into her coat and pulled out a letter. She passed that to Claire. The professor stared at the screen. Claire opened the letter. Then they swapped. Chester stepped forward, peering over Claire's shoulder at the screen. It's a horde. He hissed. Chapter 26 News from Above Cray Half the guards remained at the stadium to protect the helicopter. The rest escorted the pilot, the professor, and Claire to the island. Questions flew thick and fast, and only grew in number when they reached the bridge's gate, but the professor ignored them. On the island, people were thickly clustered around the gate, with even more on the scaffolding above. The professor curtly dismissed their questions, and gestured for Bill and Soraka to follow her inside. Chester, ignored by everyone, drifted over to Kessler, Kahn, and Scott. It's a helicopter, isn't it? Scott asked. That's what everyone's saying. A helicopter, one pilot, no passengers, Chester said. Pilot's a woman in her late fifties. She landed in a stadium to the southeast. Everyone thinks it's our helicopter, Kessler said. It's not, Chester said. He looked around, but the French survivors had already moved out of earshot, heading to the town hall. She had photographs of a horde, he said. A horde? Seriously? Kessler said. What size? Sergeant Khan asked. Where are they? I don't know, Chester said. The conversation was in Polish and French, but it was definitely a horde. The pictures were taken from a helicopter. They looked a bit like the ones you took over Birmingham, Scott. So it might not be close, then? Kessler asked. It might be somewhere far away. Even England, maybe. I don't think so, Chester said. There was a letter as well. Not sure what was in that, but it convinced Claire and the Professor. They took one look at that and the photo and hightailed it back here. 
Describe the helicopter, Scott said. Small, single rotor, a sort of bubble cab, civilian paint job, pilot and co-pilot seats with two passenger seats behind. And the seats were still there? They'd not been removed? Scott asked. Oh, right, Chester said. They were trying to work out the range. Uh, the seats were still there. No spare fuel cans that I could see. Did you see a cradle for a camera? Scott asked. Nope. How far do you think it's travelled? Khan asked. Couple of hundred miles at most, Scott said. Half that, if there's no spare fuel. Not from England, then, Kessler said dejectedly. How dangerous is night flying? Chester asked. These days, not in the slightest, Scott said, but then added, well, as long as you stay above tree and cable height and know where the hills, mountains and any tall buildings might be. You think they were looking for lights? They arrived just after dawn, Chester said. Why else fly at night unless you were looking for lights? There's another reason you fly at night, Sergeant Khan said. When time is so pressing, you have no choice. The seconds ticked by. A few people left the crowd, but a greater number drifted in from the island's depths, swelling their ranks, increasing the volume of the chatter, until a hush spread from the doorway. Chester couldn't see her, but he heard the professor speak. He didn't follow what she said, and she didn't speak for long. Almost as one, people hurried away, while from the town hall, Claire, the pilot, and a dozen guards headed back towards the gate. Bill and Soraka followed them out, but then headed over to Chester, Scott, Sergeant Khan and Private Kessler. It's not good, Bill said, though it could be worse. There's a horde, possibly fifty million strong, heading south. It's probably not crossed the border and could still be in Germany. Germany? That's where the photographs were taken, Chester asked. And who's she? Where did she fly from? Good questions, Bill said, but as her answers weren't in English... Ms. Locke? The conversation was held in a mix of Polish and French with a smattering of German, Locke said. Factor in that the entire conference lasted barely twenty minutes, and you'll understand that there are more questions than answers. She said that she's part of a convoy that began its journey near the Dnieper River in Ukraine. I've come that far? Scott asked. Further, since they didn't travel in a straight line, Locke said. The convoy either is twenty thousand strong, or those were the numbers when they left. Either way, it's at least as many people as in Belfast. They had a redoubt on the Dnieper, in an industrial town. At its height, it was a sanctuary to four million people. They sent out scouts by helicopter and bike, and messages by radio, summoning people to their refuge. The undead followed the living. They were overrun, and so the ranks of the undead grew. They had other redoubts, other battles, other collapses, which led them towards the mountains. Which mountains? Hickson asked. The Carpathians? I'm not sure, Locke said. Based on the verb form she used, I got the impression they were attacked by people, not the undead. They headed west. Sometimes they travelled north, sometimes south, but always west, and with a vast and growing number of the undead following them. This journey has taken them months. Obviously, there are as many gaps as there are questions. But the key point is that their final destination was a ski resort in the Alps. Someone in their group either worked there or owned it. Again, I was confused by the verb form. The resort is accessed over a narrow bridge. They plan to destroy the bridge and wait for spring. Apparently, this resort, or the bridge, is famous. The general had sent an expedition there at the beginning of the summer to investigate whether it could be a sanctuary for the people of Kai. The bridge is already gone, the resort inaccessible. A sanctuary? Kessler asked. But they've got this town. Yes, precisely, Locke said. As I say, this brief conference has thrown up a good many questions. The professor suggested, as an alternative to the Alps, that the convoy should go to the Pyrenees. Spain? Chester asked. The border between France and Spain, yes, Locke said. I've some questions, Chester said, and I'm not sure where to start, though. How about with why we should trust anything this pilot says? She had a letter, 
Bill said, written by the professor. People have been leaving here seeking other refuges. One such group was found by the pilot's people. They died before a rescue could be completed. On the body of one was a letter signed by the professor. The letter didn't mention Kay by name, but was obviously written after the outbreak. I got the impression the pilot was part of a scouting column that goes ahead of the main group. That was the impression she wanted to give, yes, Locke said. You don't believe her? Chester asked. On the whole, I'm disinclined to believe either the pilot or the professor, Locke said. Well, Bill said, the impression I got was that the scouts returned to the convoy with the letter. Someone there recognized the professor's name, an old colleague of some kind. Finding the professor because of her academic background became a priority. I wouldn't go that far, Locke said. They were looking for people. Apparently they hoped to find the professor, but were looking for any survivors they could locate, assuming you believe what they say. And what's this about the Pyrenees? Khan asked. It's a military redoubt, Locke said, part of the plan that began with securing the airfields and which became redundant when the nuclear bombs fell. Apparently the general knew of its location. Gaston travelled there earlier this year and confirmed the supplies were still there. The professor did not tell the pilot the exact location, however, so read into that what you will. They're leaving as well? Kessler asked. Everyone is leaving Cray? They are, Locke said. They're joining this convoy and will lead them to the refuge in the Pyrenees, that's what they say. I don't like a single thing about this, Chester said. So where does it leave us? We're back to our original plan, Bill said. Head to the coast. Meet up with Nilda or find a boat at Dunkirk and make our own way to Ireland. Why are they leaving, though? Kessler asked. Even a fifty million strong horde would be lost in a country the size of France. Why not stay and hope it passes them by? Because they were ready to leave, Locke said. I'm not certain of this, but I think that they were going to leave before Dernier launched his attack. In fact... I think the reason Dernier destroyed the armory, destroyed the scaffolding bridge and summoned the undead was to keep people here. A king needs serfs, after all. I think you're right, Chester said. They'd made up their minds before we turned up. The helicopter landed in a stadium. They'd ploughed the pitch, turned the stands into trellises. It's a good idea. An enclosed space, easy to protect. They must have done the same with parks and pitches across the town, but none would be as easily defended as that place. Thing is, though, those corpses they'd moved by tractor, they'd taken them to the stadium's car park. You wouldn't do that if you planned to plant a crop there next spring. Exactly, Locke said. They've been planning an exodus for months. She told you that? Kessler asked. She didn't have to, Locke said. Look around you. Look at the people. When the professor announced it was time to leave, everyone scurried off to gather their possessions without a second thought. Do you know what she said to them? She told them this wasn't a drill. There were drills, Amber. They knew this day might come, and they've prepared for it. And that's their business, their problem, Scott said. I want to know if the horde is going to be a problem for us. It's in Germany? No, Bill said. It was near the border when they took the photographs, but that was before the storm, long before. At least a week, right? He looked to Locke. A week, she agreed. The column split up, Bill said. While the main group cut southeast towards the Alps, the helicopter was part of a group trying to lure the undead to the west. They lured them towards Calais. The storm stopped them. It stopped the undead, too. The entire horde stopped. Apparently... The survivors were only a dozen miles away. Then our plane woke the undead. We went directly overhead, but the undead started moving, and so the people had no choice but to do the same. They followed the direction our plane flew, not looking for Kay, but for the plane, hoping they could find out where it came from. I'm drawing a trajectory in my head, Scott said. I'd say it's less than slim the horde ends up here. It's academic, Bill said. The professor's leaving and we'll have to do the same. But even if the zombies aren't coming here, Kessler said, they are to the north, between us and Calais, right? I don't see that we have a choice, Bill said. 
The Pyrenees are nearly a thousand kilometers away. Gaston's dead, and I got the impression he returned alone from that mission. Assuming that he actually went there, Locke said. Exactly, he might not have, Bill said. It might be just another place on one of those military maps. It may be gone. The food consumed, or it might never have existed at all. It hardly matters, since I doubt they'll ever reach it. This redoubt is a will-o'-the-wisp, and I've chased too many of those not to recognize it. Why did George ever have to tell me that we're the help that comes to others? Chester said. We are, aren't we? We're the only help that can possibly come. How, though? Sergeant Khan asked. No idea, Bill said. Anyone? Well, we won't figure it out here. A thousand lives, maybe twenty-one thousand are at stake. We have to get back to Belfast before they all die. Chapter 27 The Breaking of the Fellowship Cray. Come on, open them! Bill yelled up at the guards above the gate. You're wasting time, and time is lives. I can translate for you, Locke said. No, Bill said more quietly. If there's a time and place for the monolingual Englishman, this is it. A barrage of French came from above. Bill ignored it. Finally, the gate slid aside. There we go. He led the small group through the gate and out into the town beyond. A small patrol stood at the far end of the bridge, with another patrol at the next barricaded junction. It was half an hour since Claire had led the pilot back through the gate towards the stadium. Bill fumed at the delay, but they'd needed to scavenge food and water. Once they got the vehicle and fuel, he didn't want to delay and thus risk someone stopping them. He'd taken a guess that Claire, after escorting the pilot to her helicopter, would head to the warehouse in which the vehicles were stored. He confirmed that, and got past the sentries by telling them they'd been told to report to her. The gate was opened, revealing a curving spiral ramp, illuminated by a string of Christmas lights newly taped to the wall. Seeing those, and the slapdash way they were held in place, Bill grew apprehensive about what they'd find at the bottom. When they reached it, he was shocked. I was expecting a few trucks and tractors, Chester said. Maybe a few motorbikes, Khan added. There was a station's worth of buses, coaches and lorries, as well as a smattering of police cars, and at least two dozen tankers of the same make and style as the vehicle at Starwind's watchtower. Beyond those, but lost in the deep shadows, were the outlines of scores of smaller vehicles. To their left, the warehouse basement had been knocked through and expanded into a restaurant's kitchen. Beyond that were below-ground offices and a storage space shrouded in shadows. To the right, it had been extended under the road and into the basement of someone's home. In front, it ran into a building site, with tankers parked on duckboards among the exposed foundations. They had built up and dug down, but had neglected to install a pump. The footing was as muddy and sodden as the streets on the island. This proves it, Locke said. If Dernier had kept them surrounded for another month, maybe less, these vehicles would be nothing but rust. Claire stood next to a coach, arguing with Dr. Britta van Housen, the engineer. She caught sight of them and hurried over, almost looking relieved at the distraction. Is there something wrong? Claire asked. Plenty. Bill said, but we can't fix any of it until we get back to Belfast. If we get on the road now, we might reach the coast before dark. I'm sorry, no. Yesterday we agreed, Bill said. We're getting an armoured car to take us to the coast. We can't spare any vehicles, Claire said. We have a plan, you see, a, a plan for an evacuation? Bill interrupted. Each citizen is assigned to a specific vehicle. I can guess how this would work but the plan was devised before Dernier's betrayal and the deaths it wrought. Because of those deaths, you have spare capacity. She laughed. We do not. Dernier took eight of our trucks. That is capacity for one hundred and twenty, gone. Since we serviced these vehicles, we have had a month of rain and snow and a gunfight to clear the garage. If half work, it will be a miracle. 
as if to prove her point, from the engine of the coach came a sharp bang, then a dull pop, followed by a thick plume of smoke. Those are your mechanics? Scott asked. They are engineers, Claire said. Good at building platforms and excavating basements, but not at jury rigging a flooded motor, right? Scott said, and he didn't wait for a reply. Private, I'll need your hands. A Miss Locke, can you translate? He limped over to the coach, Kessler and Locke in his wake. Does he know what he's doing? Claire asked. He got a plane aloft in a few hours, Bill said. He can fix your vehicles. Look, I didn't follow everything that helicopter pilot told you, but you're planning on driving out of here and down to the Pyrenees, yes? A thousand kilometer trek across an unknown wasteland to a destination that may not exist. Gaston said it did, she said. When did you say he went? August? That's a long time these days. It'll be a constant battle with the undead summoned by your engines across countryside flooded by snow and rain, with no chance of scavenging to supplement what food you take with you. All because you're putting your faith in the supplies still being there. Enough supplies for you and this convoy, however big it is. That is not where I place my faith, she said. Bill raised an apologetic hand. Then don't place it in the word of this helicopter pilot. Not so soon after you were betrayed by Dernier. A friend of the professor's is with them. I trust Victoria. She trusts the letter she received. You say I shouldn't trust the pilot? But why should I trust you? Our actions over the last few days give you that answer, he said. What if this is a trap? Those people in the bell tower were communicating with someone. A few hours later this helicopter arrives? They say they saw our plane. But did they? You can summon as many fearful suppositions as there are stars in the sky, she said. None of them explain the possession of the letter the professor sent. A colleague of hers recognized her name. They've been hoping to find her. Wouldn't you? She was a world expert on hybrid strains used to combat desertification. That is as close to a real expert on living after the end of the world as ever existed. I understand your concern. I have concerns of my own. But we have no choice. We plan to leave when the cold weather hardens the ground. But this, this horde, it means we must leave now. If we don't leave together, everyone will leave on their own. They will die. That's exactly my point, Bill said. Okay, let's say the pilot was entirely truthful. It's still a thousand kilometers. How many rivers do you have to cross? How many bridges? What will you do if they've been washed away? What will you do if the snows return? We both know the answer, and know there is absolutely no way you can prepare for it. The only escape, the only possible rescue will come from us, from Belfast. That is why we must go. And if we are trapped by a blizzard, what would you do? How would you do it? By air, Bill said, and I've got a long journey ahead of me to work out the details. And our journey is just as long, she said. Yes, you are correct. The dangers before us are many. But that is why we need every vehicle and every strong arm if we are to reach the mountains. She has a point. Chester said, laying a hand on Bill's arm. You and I do exactly the same. We put our people first, and place our trust in them before strangers. No, she's right. We've got to go with her. But Claire, your daughter told me that some of her people are in a watchtower twenty miles to the west. I promised to go with her to make sure they're okay. I don't know your daughter very well, but she strikes me as someone who'll make that journey on her own. On foot. I promised we'd go with her. Let me keep that promise. Claire hesitated. We don't leave people behind, Bill said. I don't think you do either. You're right, Chester added. We'll need everyone, every strong arm if we're going to make it to the mountains. We'll need her friends. This is an utter nightmare, Scott said, limping over, Kessler at his side. You'll get most of these vehicles outside, but half will break down before nightfall. Can you fix them? Claire asked. Of course, Scott said, but it'll be running repairs all the way, 
and we'll have to cannibalise half the vehicles to keep the others on the road. If you know of a car plant or truck factory en route, we should take the detour. But we can reach the mountains? Claire asked. It's a long shot, Scott said, assuming the weather stays calm. But this other convoy has enough vehicles and fuel they don't take ours. Maybe. What is the alternative? Claire asked, turning from Scott to Bill, then Chester, then Sergeant Khan. Is there one? I cannot see it. Either we all leave together, or people will come and steal these vehicles, fighting, killing if necessary. If the general was still alive, things might be different. But he is not. The professor is loved, but she is not a leader, and people will not follow me. You can only lead where people want to go, Bill said. I take it that everyone knows about the Pyrenees. That Gaston found supplies at a military compound near the border? Yes. Then you're correct, Bill said. You don't have a choice. We've decided? Scott asked. Then I'll need a lot more help than that bunch of architects, and I'm going to need time. The rest of today and most of tonight. We can leave at dawn, but we'll have some people hanging from the roofs. All right with you? You're volunteering to get them to Spain? Bill asked. I guess I am, Scott said. I've never been to Spain. Kessler said, I guess it's true what they say. Join the Marines and see the world. Bill closed his eyes, kicking himself that they'd not come up with some prearranged code. This is what happens when you recruit on a battlefield, Khan said. The most vital lesson of soldiering gets forgotten. Never volunteer, Private. But I'll keep them safe, sir, until you come back. Bill nodded only half certain that Khan was aware how distant a time and place that might be. Good luck to you, he said. We'll be back as soon as we can. Where are you going? Scott asked, but there was another loud bang. Can't leave him for a moment. Amber, find something heavy to beat them with next time they touch anything with their permission. He limped off. Kessler at his side. Khan gave a salute and followed. Chester and I and Starwind will go to the watchtower and collect the people there, Bill said to Claire. Like you said, you'll need every strong arm you can get. Claire glanced towards Scott, Kessler, and Khan, then back at Bill. Find my daughter, bring her here, and I will ask Mr. Ixon to get a vehicle ready. As Chester and Bill headed back to the ramp, Locke fell in step next to them. I am coming with you, Mr. Wright. Locke said. Won't Scott need you to translate? He'll manage. Sergeant Khan thinks you'll need help, and he can't be in two places at once. She lowered her voice. I take it we're going to the coast. And then beyond, Bill said. But we've one stop to make first. Chapter 28 The Last Viking Cré de clermont en beauvaisis Northern France I'll say this for the French military. They know how to make a comfortable APC, Chester said, relaxing into his seat. It's British, Locke said, not looking up from her notebook. She'd been writing in it since they'd set off. Starwind was in the navigator's seat, with Bill driving. It is? Chester asked. Oh, well, there you go, then. Well, it's an Anglo-Swedish design, Locke said, and it's an ATV not an APC, an all-terrain vehicle. Your army called them Vikings, though I suspect that was the Swedish influence. No doubt the French changed the name, but I don't know what it is. Right, it's more like an armoured tractor with an armoured trailer, Chester said. Bet there's a few farmers in Lincolnshire who wouldn't mind something like this. No one said anything. Chester shrugged. He wouldn't say he was enjoying himself, but he was enjoying the simplicity of the immediate future. Find Starwind's people, and if they were still alive, make sure they could reach Cray, then steal the Viking and go north. Precisely how they'd take it without a fight was a problem he was happy to let solve itself when the time came. The ATV had a small cab with a machine gun mount on the roof, though the weapon had been removed. The front car had space for a driver and four passengers. Behind, attached like a train carriage, 
was a detachable passenger car with seating for eight soldiers and their equipment. Beneath both cars were sets of treads rather than wheels. The armor was thick, and so were the small windows. The sturdy grille covering them reduced the view even further. He leaned forward, peering at the screen between the driver and navigator's seat, which displayed images from the cameras installed at the sides and at the rear of the passenger car. With a violent jolt, the Viking jounced over an obstacle hidden beneath the foot of water covering the partially submerged road. "You happy driving this, Bill?" Chester asked. "Like you said, it's a tractor," Bill said through gritted teeth. "And you know how to drive one of those?" Bill didn't reply. "When you say all terrain, do you really mean all types of terrain?" Chester asked, turning to Lock. "I don't." But I believe the manufacturers did," Locke said. "So we don't need to worry about bridges. That'll be handy. Yep,、yeah, this is the way to travel." Again, he got no response. Opting for a more direct approach to kick-starting the conversation, he turned to Locke. "What are you writing?" "Everything the pilot told us during that short meeting," Locke said. "Some details are unclear." Starwind briefly turned around. Then returned her eyes forward to the narrow, reinforced window. Don't you trust the pilot? Your English is very good, Locke said. So is your French, Starwind said. Why don't you trust her? I used to work for Lisa Kempton, Locke said. Do you know the name? She had many admirable qualities, but an infuriating way of answering a question with another question. I hated it then, and I hate doing it now. But are you saying that you trust this pilot? After all, you don't entirely trust us. I do trust you," Starwind said, this time without turning around. Every time a blocked road has forced Mister Wright to take a detour, you have paid particular attention to your map, following the route, making sure we are still heading in the correct direction. You don't trust us yet, and that is as it should be. All four of us have been cruelly betrayed by people we thought allies, if not friends. All of us still alive on this spinning rock have been utterly betrayed by members of our own species. Perhaps one of the lessons we should take with us into this new era is to trust others less. She doesn't speak for all of us, Bill said. Perhaps if we trusted one another a little more, had a little more faith in our fellows, this nightmare would never have happened. That was met with absolute silence. Finally, broken by Starwind. Why don't you trust the pilot? Because of the radio set in the bell tower, Locke said. Her helicopter has a range of two hundred miles, leaving a small margin for emergencies. That implies a search radius of one hundred miles. She didn't carry a navigator, spotter. Or bodyguard suggesting that weight and thus fuel economy was a consideration when she took off. When she sat down in the stadium, she didn't immediately switch off the engine, suggesting that she wasn't at the far limit of the machine's range. In finding the town, she'd found what she sought, and on departure would return to her people. I surmise they are around eighty miles away. I don't know precisely what type of radio was in the bell tower. Nor the kind of antenna, but based on the height of the tower and the hill on which it was built, eighty miles is plausibly within range. So your fears stem from natural suspicion and paranoia, Chester asked. They stem from a distrust of coincidence, Locke said. The emergence of a large horde in northeastern Europe at roughly the same time as one in Britain could have a mathematical explanation. The arrival of their helicopter so soon after we crashed could be, as they said, because they saw our plane fly overhead. This doesn't explain the letter. You think the letter is suspicious? Chester asked. I was skeptical when they arrived so soon after the failed assault and the death of the radio team in the bell tower. The letter made me trust them more. Exactly, Locke said. It's clearly not a forgery. Thus, it was taken from a corpse, which is more likely that the original recipient died within sight of this group of twenty thousand, or that Dernier followed the man and killed him when he was just out of sight of Cray. Hence, 
why I'm writing down what the pilot said. I want to replace hypothesis with facts. I was employed to eliminate the threat to humanity. I do not consider my contract terminated simply because there has been a nuclear war. Starwind turned around to look at Locke. That was really your job? It was, she said. Really? she asked, turning to Chester. Yep, yeah, he said. So why don't you trust the pilot, Starwind? Because everyone I trusted died in the watchtower, Starwind said. Silence descended once more. Chester turned his attention to the glimpses of flooded homes and ruined roads, visible through the reinforced window. The section of clay on the western bank of the river was in far worse repair than that to the east. A fire had ravaged the quarter closest to the bridge, partially explaining why they had established the vehicle warehouse and food store on that bank. He turned that thought on its head and realized it might have an entirely different explanation. Starwind, can I ask you something? Chester said. When did you start excavating that underground lair where the vehicles were stored? I didn't, she said. I was hunting ghouls. Sure. The general, then. When did he start digging out the warehouse? Soon after you'd moved from the airfield, right? Within a few days, yes. Everyone was either on patrol, farming, or building. Right. So the excavations began before Gaston went to the Pyrenees? Yes. Why? she asked. Because of the river, Chester said. Before excavations began, the general must have decided that any escape would take you south or east, not north or west. The general said we should avoid going near Britain, Starwin said, that they were shooting down planes, sinking ships. He thought they would become pirates raiding the French coast. A reasonable concern, Chester said. Why not go north? I don't know. What are you saying? Nothing, really, Chester said. Hopefully I'm saying that the general knew about the redoubt in the Pyrenees. I mean, that he really knew, like with the airfields. He knew its location right from the beginning, and was absolutely certain that was where safety lay. What worries me is that he might not. He had to choose one side of the river or the other for the underground vehicle park. What if he picked at random and made up the story about the Pyrenees because people want certainty and hope from their leaders. Gaston went there, Starwin said. Did Gaston say that? Chester asked. No, not to me, Starwin said. But I know he left. I know he came back. Good enough, Chester said. Privately he wondered whether Gaston had found supplies, or even made it to the Pyrenees. Perhaps he'd made it up. Perhaps the professor had. What bugged him was that the general had excavated the warehouse. He'd planned an escape at the same time as he'd been building up the defences. Sure, that had turned out to be prescient, but it also suggested that the general knew the town was only a temporary refuge. At the same time, if he knew about a redoubt at the Pyrenees, why had so much effort been expended on the defences and farms in clay? Why hadn't they set out for the mountains as soon as the airfield was compromised? The more he thought about it, the more certain he became that there was no safety to be found in the Pyrenees. The railway line is up ahead, Bill said. I saw it through those trees. Can we join it here? Not yet, Starwin said. Not here. The tracks were washed away. After half a kilometre, we turn. Five hundred metres? Fine. But there are zombies ahead. Everyone hold on. It's going to get bumpy again. The undead had been their constant companions almost as soon as they crossed the river. As with the east, patrols had been sent over the bridge to the west to dispatch those undead that had been summoned to the island. As the town to the west had no warehouses or other significant assets, those patrols had been smaller, with no attempt made to move the corpses from where they'd fallen. After a few false starts, Bill had abandoned any attempt at driving around them and driven over the twice-dead. The military vehicle had no difficulty managing such fragile obstacles, but the engine noise had summoned the undead 
lurking among the ruins. Within minutes, zombies had flooded the streets before and behind. Further from the island, the road became less clogged with the gory remains of the recent battle, and their speed had picked up. Forty kilometers an hour. Thirty. Twenty, Bill said. And that's slow enough. A thump, a bump, and a rhythmic drum roll of cracking bone. The ATV rocked as it ploughed through and over the undead. Too fast, Bill muttered, but he didn't slow. Gobbets of rotten flesh splattered the window, followed by a dismembered arm. The only mercy was that the sound of the engine drowned out the sound of crushed bones. Now, Starwin said, à la droite, the right. There's a wall in the way, Bill said. Go, Starwin said. Bill aimed the Viking straight at the low brick wall. Bricks and fragments of cement clanged off the vehicle's armor and crunched into the window as they drove through the wall and into an empty expanse of concrete. Where? Bill said. Straight, go straight, Starwin said. Still can't see any train tracks, Bill muttered. Zombies on the left, Locke said. Get ready to jump out and run, Bill said. There's another wall ahead. And the trees, Starwin said. The alder and the juniper, the gap between. Go through there. I wouldn't call that a gap, Bill said, but steered towards the trees, picking up speed as they went. The wall crumbled on impact. Bricks tumbled as mortar erupted in a fine cloud. The front of the ATV tilted downward, then up, as they traversed a ditch and slammed into the damp mud on the other side. The tracks bit deep into the sodden dirt. The engine roared, screaming as its speed halved, drowning out the sound of breaking branches as Bill ploughed up the incline between the two trees. I knew it, Starwin said, as the ground levelled out and they reached the train tracks. As promised, a railway. As Bill loudly breathed out, Chester realised he'd been holding his own breath. Let's not do that again, he said. Is the passenger car still attached? Starwind tapped the CCTV console between her and Bill. Yes. It looks clear ahead, Bill said. Thirty-five kilometres an hour. We'll stick at this speed for now. How far do we have? Eighteen kilometres, Starwind said. So about half an hour, Bill said. The undead won't be far behind. When we get there, we won't have much time before they catch up. We'll have to get in and get out. They'll be ready to go, Starwin said. We always were. We just weren't ready for danger from people we knew. Tell us about this watchtower, Locke said. The location was not my choice, Starwin said. It is a chateau, not a castle, a rich noble's house. A stately home, Bill suggested. Perhaps, Starwin said. There are gardens for growing fruit in glass houses. A botanical gardens, Chester said. Sounds like a decent refuge to me. It isn't, Starwind said dismissively. There are too many trees, too much cover, not enough clear lines of sight because of the houses nearby. Adriana disagreed with my view of this new world. She's the leader there, Chester asked. She agreed we needed watchtowers to keep the town safe and that the Republic is an old idea that would wither and die. She didn't agree with what should replace it, but when I asked for help, she said yes. That is more than anyone else. Takes all sorts to make a world, Chester said. Reading between the lines, he took it that Adriana hadn't based her new world view on a Japanese anime about teenage vampires. And you said there are vehicles there, fuel, Bill said. We won't need them, Starwin said. We might, Bill said. We can't take the same route back. I thought we'd head north to that footbridge where we were ambushed. This ATV is too wide, the bridge too narrow. I'd be happier if we take at least one more vehicle, just in case. Better that than end up on foot. Jester turned his face to the window. It was too obvious a ploy, but they would need diesel. He and Bill had each been given a shotgun and ammunition from the armory, but they were the only supplies they'd been given. The ATV's fuel tank had been filled, and Chester had no idea of its range, but he doubted it would get them to Dunkirk.
and certainly not with enough to spare for the boat ride to Ireland. They had a fuel tanker, Starwin said. We both did. We found the tankers. That is as big as this vehicle. No, we will drive through the river if we have to. There is a road ahead to the right. Soon it will run parallel to the railway. We need to get on the road. Now? Bill asked, glancing to the right. We've got a clear run ahead of us. Rue de Marais to Rue de Moulin, Rue des Charpentiers to the watchtower. You're the navigator, Bill said. Zombies, Luck said, on the road to the right. That's the road we should be on, Starwin said. Where? Bill asked. Too many trees. Ah, got it. Okay. And... And we're past the undead. Here we go. The ATV slid down the incline. Gravel pinged against the armor. Mud joined the gore, coating the windscreen. With a loud crack, they slammed through the crash barrier and onto the road. Damn! Bill slammed his palm against the screen between the driver and navigator's seat. We lost the cameras. A cable must have come loose. Someone open the hatch. Check the passenger car is attached. Locke opened the hatch that led to the machine gun mount. She dropped down a moment later. Everything looks fine. Zombies behind about a dozen. We won't have long when we get there. Bill leaned forward, peering through the dirty patina, coating the windscreen, as he drove around a burned-out car. Let's hope they've been killing the undead closer to the watchtower. Speaking of which... How much further? Minutes, Starwin said. How many? I don't know. Five? With the view so restricted, Chester climbed up to the turret. The first few seconds were exhilarating, but the wind bit cold. The houses grew closer together. Though they had broken open doors in common, there was little uniformity in design. A thick forest of trees on either side abruptly truncated the view, and so he was about to climb back down when he saw a thick rut gouged out of the mud on the road's verge. Left, left, Starwin called. Get back inside, Bill added. Chester peered again at the verge, but the rut had disappeared. Unsure what he'd seen, or whether he'd seen anything, he climbed back inside. Seated, he rested a hand on his new shotgun. They turned onto a wider road, narrower than a motorway, but wider than an A road. The trees turned to bare fields, which morphed into a squad of houses to the west. Beyond a junction, houses filled both sides, as they reached the true beginning of a town. We're getting close, Starwin said. I thought you said it was a country estate, Chester said. Exactly, Starwin said. It's a terrible place for a watchtower. Corpses on the road, Bill said. That's a good sign. Your people have been killing the undead. Hang on. Barricade, got to slow. Two vans and a car nearly filled the road. A fourth car had completed the barricade, but it had been pushed aside creating a gap five feet wide, not nearly wide enough for the ATV. The Viking shouldered the car and van out of the way with a creaking crash of metal. The sharp tinkling of broken shards falling from the shattered windshields was lost beneath the grinding screech of the bodywork being crushed. In turn, that was drowned out by a sudden, loud bang. What was that? Chester asked. Hopefully not us, Bill said as the ATV barged its way to the other side of the barricade. Do they usually guard this checkpoint? Locke asked. I don't know, Starwin said. I only came here once just after we left Cray. It's beyond the church. Do you see the spire? Slow down, Locke said. She opened the hatch and stood with head and shoulders outside. She dropped down into the vehicle. There's nothing. No people in the spire and no living zombies outside. Plenty of dead zombies, recently dead. Their bodies are lying on top of the mud. How far away are we? It's over there, Starwin said, behind those houses. The road goes past the church, then we reach the wall surrounding the watchtower. Go slowly. Be ready to reverse, Locke said, and climbed back up to the turret, this time taking her rifle. Jester curled his left hand around the shotgun's barrel, but kept his right on the grab bar. Zombies could be killed in defense or retreat. So which had happened here? That's the wall, Starwin said. 
It was unprepossessing, barely ten feet high of old stone, and down a road that was only wide enough for two vehicles if one drove on the pavement. Where's the entrance? Bill asked. This looks like a cul-de-sac. There, at the end, Starwin said. That's a house, Bill said. No, just to the side, to the left. I see it, Bill said. And I can see the undead. Two were moving. Many more corpses lay on the ground about them. Bill slowed the vehicle, bringing it to a stop. Over the sound of the idling engine, Chester barely heard the soft pop of Locke's suppressed rifle. Stay here, Locke called, before clambering outside. Rifle raised, she jogged to the gates, and almost immediately turned around and sprinted back. Starwind opened her door. Zombies, Locke said, they're surrounding the house. Are they heading for the gate? Bill asked. Some, not all, Locke said. Then there are people alive inside, Bill said. Get in. We'll use the engine noise to lure them away. No, Locke said. Starwin, is there another way in? Over the wall behind those houses, she said, pointing back the way they'd come. That'll have to do, Locke said. She and I will make our way into the grounds and to the rear of the building. The people inside can't have any ammunition left. If they did, they'd have shot the undead. You and Chester lure away as many as you can with the noise from the ATV's engine. Starwind and I will deal with any that are left. We'll use the watchtower's vehicles to get back to Cray, or we'll run. We'll see you there. Bill paused, but only for a fraction of a second. Understood. Safe journey. Bon chance, Locke said. Starwind? Come on. The teenager went outside. Chester climbed up into the turret, watching as Starwind gestured to a house behind them. Locke took point and entered the broken open door, Starwind three paces behind. Chester dropped back inside. After we lure the undead away, will we keep on driving? he asked. Bill gave the dashboard a glance before answering. I'm considering it. We'd have to come back here and refuel once they're gone. And if we can't? Chester asked. In my opinion, we should siphon the diesel and find ourselves a small car. The two of us won't make much difference in Cray, and we may not get another chance to leave until we're a lot further south. Agreed, Bill said. We'll give them a moment more. Keep watch for the undead. Chester climbed up to the turret. Locke and Starwind were already out of sight, but a zombie had emerged from a house four doors further down the street. The ghouls staggered outside, along the path, and then slipped in the mud, falling face first into the dirt. Zombie, Chester called through the hatch. Only one, but there's no suppressor on the shotgun. We'll give it a minute more, Bill said. He wasn't looking at the road, but leaping through a notebook. Is that Locks? She left it behind. Right at the beginning, she's written out the locations of all of Kempton's warehouses and retreats, just like she said. Are any of them useful to us? Not here and now, and probably not for the next month, Bill said. No, hopefully not until spring. Having thrashed its way to its knees, the zombie crawled along the flooded pavement. They had three minutes, maybe four before it reached them. Chester had no qualms about leaving Locke behind, simply because she'd made it clear in Birmingham that she was following her own path. That had intersected with theirs for a time, but that she'd left her notebook told him she'd thought that time had passed. On balance, that was for the best. After Birmingham, he trusted her. After the last week, he thought even Bill did too. When they reached Belfast, however, the people there would be as suspicious as ever. He'd no qualms about leaving Sergeant Khan behind either. The man was a career Marine. He understood that the mission had to come first, and had volunteered to stay behind. Chester weighed up their parting. The sergeant probably knew he'd volunteered to stay behind, and if he didn't, he'd realise soon enough and understand it then. Scott hadn't realised what he'd volunteered for, but he was old enough, had seen enough, that he would understand. That left Private Kessler. Had she known? Probably not. 
Nothing could be done except get to the coast, get to Belfast and come back for them in a helicopter. As for how they would then rescue the French survivors and the people of the convoy, he had no idea. The zombie was only twelve feet away. Chester dropped down into the cab. Either we move, or I'll have to kill it. Then we move, Bill said. Hold on. Chapter 29 The Enemy Within Clermont en Beauvaisis, Northern France The gate was made of modern steel, fashioned in an ancient style, wide enough for a small service vehicle with another five feet of ornamental railing on either side. The ATV was far too big. Bill swung the vehicle towards the gate, stopped, reversed to line up, then drove forward, smashing the entrance from its hinges. Briefly, the gate was propped in front of the Viking, acting as a plow, pushing the corpses out of the way. After ten feet, the gate lodged in the broken limbs of the dead and undying, and clattered to the ground. Bill kept his foot down, driving over the gate and the bodies beneath, slowing only when they were ten meters inside the property. Chester clambered up into the turret. It's more of a house than a castle, he called out. It's got two wings, about forty zombies between them, mostly clustered near the main doors, broken ladder hanging from a window. Looks like that's what the people were using as an entrance. Five zombies heading around the building to the south, none to the north, another couple of buildings there, one story against the main buildings, three. He rested his shotgun on the empty machine gun mount. I'd say servants' quarters in the eaves. Probably fifteen bedrooms below that, and from the size of the windows the ground floor is big enough for a ballroom in each wing. Bonfire to the south, long dead. Bill, movement, the south wing, first floor. Someone's removing the boards covering the window. And what about the zombies? We've got at least a minute, Chester said. Ten are heading towards us, plus those at the side of the house. And behind? Chester gave it a quick glance. Clear. Some movement behind the gate. I don't think those zombies were entirely dead. No immediate danger from there. He turned back to the house in time to see a man open the window. Definitely a man, judging by the beard, that reached halfway down his neck. Stragglers are getting close, he said, lining up the shotgun with the nearest of the creatures. Ten seconds and I'll open fire, but you need to get ready to reverse. Got it, Bill said. Chester waved at the man in the window. Do you hear that? He called down to Bill. It's gunfire. Must be Starwind. You ready? And then he realized. He looked at the window, at the man with a beard. He was no teenager. Then again, Starwind hadn't said that Adriana's people were all teenagers. The man ducked out of sight, reappearing a second later with an assault rifle. Chester ducked back into the ATV, just as the man opened fire. Reverse! He bellowed. The vehicle flew backwards as bullets pinged into the armor. Who's shooting? Bill called. A man, about forty, in that window with an assault rifle, Chester said. One of Dernier's people, I guess. The gate clanged beneath them as the treads pushed it further into the dirt. Bullets pinged against the armor. A loud metallic crunch was followed by a tumult of brick raining like shrapnel as the ATV's passenger car mowed through the wall ripping out five feet of stonework. Hang on, Bill muttered, keeping the vehicle in reverse until they were outside. Gunfire stop, right? Chester said. Without waiting for a reply, and hoping it had, he pulled himself up into the turret. A dozen zombies staggered across the fallen gate, tripping when their feet lodged in the gaps between the steel uprights. As the undead fell, more bricks tumbled from the fractured masonry around the edges of the wall. Can you see the shooter? Bill asked. Can't even see the window, Chester said. He pushed himself further out of the turret. Yeah, I can see the other wing of the house, just the eaves and the roof. There's a flag. Someone's waving a flag. Damn. He dropped inside, drive forward, crush the zombies around the gate, then take the vehicle to the northern side of the house. When the window was open to hang out that flag, I heard gunfire. Are you sure? Your hearing isn't the best. I'm positive. 
Chester said. It came from inside. I heard something similar when that first window was opened. People are shooting at targets inside. There's a flag, Bill. Someone's signalling or surrendering. My money's on them being Starwind's people. They're in there along with Dernier's thugs. The zombies stop them from escaping, and since they can't escape, they can't burn each other out. Who knows what kind of truce they had going on. But it ended when we arrived. Bill gunned the engine. Behind the northern wing, here we go. I hope you're right. Eight zombies had lurched onto the pavement outside the estate. The ATV roared forward, crushing six and knocking the other two flying. Beyond them were a dozen more. The fallen gate had acted as a cattle grid, trapping the living dead in place. Chester made a mental note to remember that trick for the months ahead, as the vehicle bounced, rocked and skidded over the ghouls, churning brain, bone and gore over the windscreen. I can't see, Bill said. On it, Chester said. A half-remembered anecdote from a war film watched with his father came back to him, but a chest wound was as lethal as a headshot in their world. He ducked his head up, only long enough to check the route, and then dropped back down again. Ten degrees to the right, then straight on for sixty yards. There's a lot of gunfire coming from inside the building. Don't think any of it's aimed at us. Starwind's people must have recognised the ATV. Bill grunted, turned the wheel, and drove forward, blind, as the vehicle filled with the sound of bullets smacking against the armour and bones crunching beneath its treads. I'm taking a look, Chester said, this time thrusting head and shoulders outside. They were heading straight toward the northern wing of the house. Right, 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 he bellowed. Bill braked. Right, twenty degrees, Chester called. There, now, straight. The sound of gunfire grew, but it was still muffled, the shots aimed at targets inside the house. One hand gripping the edge of the turret, the other holding the half-moon glasses in place, Chester scanned the windows. Starting with a southern wing, he tracked along and then up. Three windows on the first floor were open, but empty of people. Up in the eaves, only the window with the flag was open, and a person stood there. A woman. She waved until an explosion inside caused her to duck out of sight. Ducked or fell. Chester couldn't tell. Smoke began seeping around a window in the eaves and from a larger window on the floor below. The battle had grown so loud that the undead gathered between the two wings couldn't decide whether that or the ATV represented the nearest prey. Twenty of them remained on their feet, with at least four bodies lying on the ground. Behind the Viking, another two zombies had appeared in the gateway. They tripped, falling on the mound of crushed flesh. The danger came from the undead who had been to the south of the house. Seven zombies, slouching nearly shoulder to shoulder, were only twenty feet away. Chester braced the shotgun on the turret's edge, and then he waited. 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 Fired. A slug tore through the closest zombie's threadbare jacket. He ratcheted in another shell, changed angle, fired again as the ATV bounced over a corpse. The round smashed through an exposed knee. The zombie fell, tripping the two behind. Taking that as inspiration, he pumped another round and lowered his aim. This shell was buckshot, and it scattered a wall of lead into calf and ankle, as the zombies lurched on, putting weight onto shredded limbs, three fell, tripping the zombies behind. Where now? Directions! Bill called. Chester spun around. Straight on! He ducked inside the vehicle. Straight on! Twenty yards and stop! He reached for the turret's edge, just as a bullet pinged against the hatch's rim an inch from his hand. He pulled it down, using the opportunity to reload. Keep going! We've travelled twenty yards, Bill said. Keep going. Until when? Bill replied. Until they stop shooting, Chester said. He fixed Nilda's face in his mind and stood up outside of the vehicle. He couldn't see the southern wing. The undead had followed them, some on their feet, others crawling across the mud. Stop, he yelled. Bill did. The engine idled. Hold it here a mo, 
Chester said. Are we clear? Not sure, Chester said. They were between the northern wing and a cluster of one-story buildings, with the bulk of the main house now shielding them from any shooter in the southern wing. He quickly scanned the windows, but none were open. With no immediate threat from above, he looked for the undead. Based on the doors and paved entrance, two of the smaller buildings were side-to-side -side garages. Next to those was a prefab tool shed, with a far older red roof stone building beyond. All were covered in trailing roses and withered climbers, as well as a good measure of recently installed barbed wire. Crucially, he saw no zombies either around the buildings or in the narrow vista of flooded grassland between the house and the tree line. He looked back at the main house. The ground floor windows on this side of the building were narrow and blocked. The first floor windows were closed, but the one immediately above them was uncurtained and unbarricaded. Above that was the roof. Nowhere could he see signs of life. Now what? Bill called. Good question, Chester said. Near the rear of this wing, about as far from the main entrance as you could get, there's a door. Small, set down three steps. It might be a kitchen entrance. That's where they'll escape the house. He was wrong. Glass shattered above them, raining down from a window in the eaves. A gun barrel swept the shards from the broken frame. Chester raised the shotgun. Get ready to reverse. Reverse straight, on my word. A woman, hair cropped in a scruffy mohawk, stuck her head through the window. She waved, called out. Chester only heard half the words and didn't understand a single one. Was she a friend of Starwind's? A foe? Had he utterly misread the situation inside? Life's a gamble, but she didn't shoot, he muttered. We're stopping here, he yelled to Bill, and jumped out. The cab door opened, and Bill followed, sweeping his sleeve over the windscreen to remove the worst of the gore. What's happening? Bill asked. Zombies coming from around the front of the house. None coming from behind. People up in the eaves, hopefully friendly. Hostiles on the first floor. Door on the ground floor at the rear. Chester spoke quickly, patting his coat pockets, checking he had spare cartridges. Got it, Bill said, grabbing his shotgun from next to the driver's seat. Chester took up position by the rear of the ATV, keeping the bulk of the armored vehicle between himself and the house. No movement at the door, Bill called from the front of the vehicle. No movement at the rear, nothing above. Wait, yes, from the eaves. They're throwing down a rope ladder. It's not quite long enough. I'm going to bring the Viking alongside. The first of the walking undead had reached the side of the house. Chester fired. The slug ripped through the zombie's neck, tearing its head from its shoulders. Go! I've got you covered out here, Chester said. Bill ducked back inside. The ATV juddered forward. Chester stepped away from the vehicle, firing at the undead. The shotgun was too inaccurate, even from such a short distance, with accuracy reduced further by the mix of slug and shot. One by one, the undead fell, not always dead, but a crawling zombie was a problem that could wait. The hammer clicked on an empty chamber. He reached into his pocket, hastily reloading as he looked to his right and up at the building. Bill had stopped the vehicle closer to the house. The ladder was three feet too short, but a woman was already climbing down. She wasn't the woman he'd seen at the window before, but someone far older. Keep going, he called. Not far to safety, just keep climbing down. We've got you. The woman glanced down. Her expression was puzzled. Starwind sent us, Chester called. We've come from Cray, the professor. He doubted she understood but he hoped the English words would convince her that they weren't a threat. A window on the first floor just to the left of the ladder opened. A gun barrel appeared. Chester raised the shotgun, fired. Mercifully, it was a slug, not buckshot. The round smashed into the window's frame, raining splinters and glass over the woman climbing down the ladder. Hurry! he yelled. I've got them covered! Bill called as he climbed out of the turret. Watch for the undead! Chester did. One of the more mobile living dead tripped on the clawing hands of a crawling zombie. 
Chester forced himself to take his time. A startling burst of automatic gunfire came from behind him, making him miss the shot. His shell slammed into the dirt, spraying a fountain of mud onto the crawling zombies flayed back. Chester stepped forward, kicked the zombie's grasping hand clear, and stamped on its skull. Only then did he look around. Bill was in the ATV's turret, his weapon aimed upward at the house. The old woman had reached the vehicle. She stood on the roof, arms outstretched, gripping the ladder's lowermost rung, while a young man awkwardly descended, a rucksack on his front and another on his back, making it a perilous climb. Automatic gunfire filled the air, drowning the moaning hiss of the undead. Chester couldn't place where the shots came from until he realized they were coming from outside as well as inside. Were Dernier's people making a break for the rear of the house? If so, they had one less problem to worry about. What's the rear, Bill? Chester called, as he turned back to the undead lurching towards them. He reached in his pocket for shells and found he was already running low. On it! Bill called back. It's lock, it's lock and Starwind! The two women ran around the rear of the house and over to the ATV. Starwind yelled up at the old woman anchoring the ladder, at the young man climbing down, and at the window above. Locke ran over to Chester. Any idea what's going on? he asked. Other than Starwind knows them, not really, Locke said with utter calm. Oh, and there are hostiles inside the house. On the first floor, though I suspect you've realized. Hard not to when someone's shooting at you. How much ammunition do you have left? Locke asked. Two shells? Then I'll deal with these zombies, help the others, get them down. As Chester spun around, he saw Starwind sprinting for the rose-covered garage. The man with the backpacks had reached the bottom of the ladder. At the window, a woman dressed in red dungarees and a red ski jacket, with a red scarf tied around her head, began her descent. The old woman's arms trembled as she held the ladder steady, but her face was a study in determination. Bill and the young man had the building covered. The rear looked clear. Chester jogged after Starwind to see what new threat she'd spied. Starwind reached the garage's eastern edge, next to a forest of sand-colored, five-inch diameter vines, and then disappeared through a door hidden behind the leafless growth. Chester jogged to the garage. The decades-old vines in front of the door were so densely packed they left a gap barely a foot wide through which to squeeze. He pushed and pulled in an attempt to force a gap, but their roots were deep, their branches suckered to the building more strongly than the crumbling mortar holding the bricks in place. He moved his head closer, trying to see inside. From the forest of folding tables and broken display cases, it had been an exhibition room before the outbreak, but it was a garage now. Lined up beneath the fractured skylights were a trio of quad bikes, a squad of dirt bikes, and a fuel tanker. Next to that was a yellow minibus covered in barbed wire with a sheet metal ramp welded to the front, more metal covering the windows, and a wooden-sided platform on the roof. Starwind, you okay? he called. Always, she replied, stepping out from behind the tanker. I can't squeeze in he said. It's too narrow. I'll open the main doors, she said. He stepped back, scanning the grounds to the rear of the house. The once manicured lawn ended at a regimented row of spindly aspens, standing sentry in front of a dozen wide beeches, whose branches moved unnaturally. Zombies. Three lurched out of the tree line. They had a few minutes, but no more than that. Locke walked backwards towards the Viking, but not in retreat. The immediate threat at the front of the house had been eliminated. Five people had already reached the ATV, with a sixth clambering down the rungs. The older woman still stalwartly held the ladder steady. The woman in red knelt next to her, her weapon trained at the first floor windows. Bill had returned to the driver's seat. A muffled shot came from inside, but the volume of gunfire had distinctly slackened. That didn't explain why no one was firing at them from the windows. Despite the ATV's armor, 
they presented a perfect target. Since the Viking represented an obvious means of escape, he doubted Dernier's people would simply give up. His eyes fell on the door toward the building's rear. He'd taken two steps towards it when metal screeched behind him. Reflexively, he turned around. The garage doors were opening. When he turned his gaze back to the small door at the side of the house, he saw it flung ajar. Chester was already running before the man darted outside. Long beard, shaved head, tactical vest, black trousers, heavy boots, rifle whose barrel was swiveling towards the ATV. Oi! Chester called, not daring to risk a shot at such a range. The man turned his head, saw Chester, and began shifting aim until blood found him from the side of his head. He collapsed to the ground. The woman in red turned her gaze, and rifle, back to the first floor window. Chester reached the corpse, just as another shadow appeared in the now open doorway. He fired into the cavernous darkness beyond the door, pumped in his last round, and fired that too. He snatched up the assault rifle from the corpse, ran the last few feet to the door, and slammed it closed, leaning against it. What a day! The door thudded into his shoulder as someone tried to get outside. He shoved back. The young man, who'd been second to climb down the ladder, ran over, gesticulating at the door, yelling in French. Sorry, mate, you don't speak English, do you? Chester asked as the door was pushed again. Adriana, inside, the man said. She's inside? He doubted she was pushing against the door. How many others? People? Friends? Uh, huit. He raised five fingers, then three. Eight still inside? Chester asked. No. Adriana inside. Eight here. All. He made a circling motion, pointing at the ATV. Eight in total. Only Adriana left inside. She stayed behind, covering your rear. A distraction? He gave a nod and a shrug. How many of them? Chester asked, pointing at the corpse. Again the young man shrugged. Again the person on the other side of the door shoved. Then the pressure stopped. Down! Chester bellowed, diving forward, knocking the young man from his feet, just before bullets slammed into the door. None penetrated the thick wood, but without Chester holding it closed, the fusillade threw the door open. Chester rolled onto his back, bringing up the scavenged rifle, firing into the shadows inside. The young man sprawled to his feet, and made to run inside. Chester grabbed his arm. No, I've got this. Tell Bill five minutes, got it? Five minutes. You'll understand. Five? Yes? Go. Chester ran down the steps into the door. On a hinge, it had swung closed. Crouching down, he pulled it open and caught a quick glimpse of the interior as he rolled into the room. A kitchen, sinks, cupboards, cookers, table in the middle. Not old-fashioned, not entirely modern. A long room. Two doors at the far end, both in the corner. One on the left-hand wall, one on the wall opposite the door he'd entered. Both were open. Behind him, the door swung closed, leaving the room in near darkness. High up in the wall to the right, where they were barely above ground level, was a row of windows. They'd been covered by boards, which in turn had warped, but when coupled with the mud and leaves coating the exterior glass, barely a glimmer entered the kitchen. Cautiously, crouching, he edged forwards. His foot slipped. He stuck out a hand to catch himself, and found it touched something warm, wet. He stretched out a searching hand and found the body. He inched forwards, towards the doors. A shot came from deeper inside the house, then another, and then silence, broken by the heavy patter of feet running across the floor above. Now what? Since at least one friendly was inside the house, darkness gave him no advantage. Unable to think of anything better, he opted for the direct approach. Adriana! he called. Whenever you're ready! We're waiting to leave! He hoped she'd understand. More than that, he hoped she'd realize the safest way out was one of the first-floor windows. 
He was about to shout again when he heard a sound from beyond one of the doors. With both of them so close together, he couldn't tell from behind which it came. He crept forward, weighing up whether to shout again. The shadows around the doors moved, changed. Gunfire erupted. Bullets slammed into tables and doors, the walls, the ceiling, and then the boards covering the window. One of the boards came free. A ray of light speared into the room. Chester saw his assailant standing in the doorway. Chester fired. The man fell. Chester moved back, away from the corner of the room that was now illuminated. Adriana! he called. A muffled grunt came from the door on the left. Chester strode towards it, into the illuminated part of the room. Adriana! he called. A figure leaped from around the other door, colliding with Chester before he could bring the gun to bear. A fist slammed into his side, another into his neck. The gun fell from his grip as he stepped back, trying to get some distance. But the man stepped with him, raining a flurry of blows on Chester's arms, his chest, his head. Roaring in angry pain, Chester charged forward, arms swinging. The man was strong and fast, but not fast enough. Chester caught a fistful of hair, grabbed, pulled, twisted, and slammed the man's head towards the table. But his foe ducked and turned at the last second, slamming his palm into the side of Chester's head. His glasses flew off into the gloom, but Chester didn't need them with his opponent so close. He went for a headlock, and the two men fell to the floor, the enemy on top. Chester slammed his fist into the man's side, but he wore something heavy and thick beneath his sweat and dirt-stained shirt. The man reached out, his hands on Chester's neck, squeezing, pushing. As abruptly as the fight began, the man hissed and went limp, collapsing on top of Chester, warm liquid oozing from his chest onto Chester's. The dead weight was hauled off. The woman with a ragged mohawk reached her hand down. Adriana, I presume. Chester said. Are there any more to be rescued? Just you, she said, helping him to his feet. What about the enemy? he asked, but she ran to the door without answering. He looked around, hoping to spy his glasses or the rifle, but could see neither. Taking his cue from Adriana, he followed her outside. Adriana was sprinting for the garage. The Viking was waiting by the edge of the house. Locke stood in the turret, her rifle aimed upwards at the building. Deep gouges marred the mud from where the ATV had turned a wide 180. Outside the garage was the yellow minibus. The woman in red stood by the door. When she saw Chester, she yelled at the ATV. Locke looked around, raised a hand, then dropped down into the vehicle. A moment later, the Viking chugged forward. The minibus followed it driving towards the gates. Chester angled towards the minibus. The woman in red stood inside by the minibus's open side door. Legs braced, rifle barrel wavering as the vehicle churned across the mud and corpse-strewn grounds, she fired a shot at the house. Chester kept running, but stopped when he heard the roar of another heavy engine. The fuel tanker leaped out of the garage, and Chester had to dash forward to get out of the way. He spun around in time to see Adriana behind the wheel. Chester reached out her hand, aiming to catch hold of one of the grab bars at the rear of the tanker the moment the vehicle began its turn. When Adriana turned the tanker, she aimed it the other way, directly at the house. Chester lowered his arm as the vehicle drove straight at the building. A burst from an automatic weapon shattered the passenger side wing mirror, as Adriana finally spun the steering wheel and stamped on the brake, but she left it too late. The cab crunched into the building's sidewall. Oh, hell, Chester muttered and ran to the cab. Smoke billowed from the engine. From above, he heard the sound of glass breaking. He didn't look up, but reached for the cab's door. It wouldn't move. The impact had deformed the chassis. Inside, 
Adriana waved him away. He ignored her. She yelled at him in French. He ignored that, too, and climbed onto the smoking engine. When gunfire erupted above, he couldn't ignore that. He looked up. On the second floor, a man leaned half out of the window, a rifle in his hands, aiming it straight down at Chester. There was a volley of gunfire, and the man slumped onto the window sill, dead. Chester didn't look to see who'd fired, but turned his attention back to the cab. Adriana was still gesturing he should leave. Ignoring her, he kicked at the windscreen again, again. A bullet slammed into the cab's roof. This time, he didn't look up. As Locke and the French survivors returned fire, he kept kicking until the windscreen gave. He reached down and hauled Adriana outside. Her left arm hung limp as she jumped down from the cab. She slipped, falling to the mud. Chester reached down, helping her up, leading her towards the minibus, but she shook away his hand, angling to the rear of the tanker. About and above them, gunfire rose to a crescendo as Adriana's people shot at the house, and Dernier's people shot at everyone. At the rear of the tanker, Adriana attempted to turn the release wheel one-handed, but it barely moved. Dump the fuel, stop them from using it. Right, got it, Chester said. He grabbed the wheel, turned it, and jumped back as fuel spilled out, gushing over the ground. Okay, can we go now? Adriana pulled a flare from under her coat. Again, one-handed, she fumbled as she tried to ignite it. Chester snatched it from her. Not yet, not when we're so close. Run, go, he snapped. Go! He ignited the flare. She nodded and ran for the minibus as a bullet slammed into the tanker's nearest wheel arch. Chester stamped a divot out of the mud and slammed the lit flare into the ground. From the direction and speed that fuel poured from the tanker, he had about twenty seconds. He ran. The ATV was already driving towards the gate. Adriana had reached the minibus and was by the sliding side doors. Bullets flew from the house, pinging off the metal sheets covering the windows. Adriana ducked inside. The doors closed. The minibus drove off, accelerated, and swerved ninety degrees, aiming for the gates. Chester picked up his pace, refusing to believe he was being left behind. The rear of the minibus was as wrapped in barbed wire as the rest, with sheet metal covering the rear door. With no warning, the sheet metal fell, and he realized it was a ramp. The rear door swung open. The woman in red stood there, a hunting rifle in her hands. She fired. Chester sprinted. When he was five feet away, the flare finally ignited the fumes from the fuel truck. A whoomph, a whoosh, and Chester was thrown from his feet, arms and chest landing on the metal ramp. Allez, the woman in red called. Chester scratched at the smooth metal, trying to find purchase as his feet dragged against dirt, gravel, bones and bodies. The woman in red reached down, grabbing his collar just as a clawing hand curled around his foot. As the zombie's grip tightened, Chester sagged backwards, almost off the ramp, pulling the woman in red with him. She fell. Still gripping his collar, she raised her rifle, firing one-handed over Chester. The recoil knocked the weapon from her grasp, but the bullet dislodged the zombie clawing at Chester's leg. More hands appeared at the minibus's door, hauling both the woman and Chester inside. The door was pulled closed behind them. By tugging on a pair of chains, the ramp was retracted. The minibus rattled over the gate and out onto the road. Chester pushed himself to the corner. Except for the driver, the seats had all been removed. Part of the explanation had to be for maximizing space. The other part, and the reason for the ramp, was the wheelchair buckled to the floor. It was unoccupied. Epilogue Journey's End Journey's Beginning Northern France Chester kicked at a cracked sleeper. I think we broke that on our way to the watchtower, he said. He and Bill stood on the railway line, 
a little distance from the French survivors, while Starwind and Locke explained what had happened in Cray over the last few days. Can't have been the vehicle's weight, Chester said. Surely the ATV isn't heavier than a fully loaded train. Must have been the pressure of the treads applied directly to the sleeper. No train will ever travel this way now. Are you sure you don't need a bandage? Bill asked. It's not my blood, Chester said. He turned to look north. I suppose the horde would have destroyed the railway line anyway. Even if it didn't, Bill said, with Kay abandoned, no one will travel this way again for years. Which brings us to what we're going to do next, Chester said. I won't fight Starwind and Adriana so we can steal the ATV. No, Bill said. I like what they've done with the minibus. That armoured roof rack looks pretty secure. We could sleep there at night. But they won't give it to us, Chester said. I doubt it. Even if they did, I don't think it'd make it to the coast. Meaning it certainly won't reach the Pyrenees, Chester said. A growing plume of smoke rose in the north from the burning watchtower. That fire's really caught. It's Romero, isn't it? Chester said. I'm sorry? The minibus, Chester said. In the film it was a school bus, but that has to be their inspiration. I suppose it makes as much sense as a cartoon about vampires, Bill said, which makes as much sense as anything else. Yeah, you find sense and reason where you can. You think we should go back to Cray, then? We don't have enough fuel for the ATV to reach the coast, Bill said. Shame about that tanker. I think it contained petrol, not diesel, Chester said. Still, it's a shame. They'll have got out. Dernier's people, I mean. When the fire started, yes, Chester said. Or they'll have tried to. Still, I'm not going to worry about them. I'm going to worry about the long road ahead. You're going to the coast? Bill asked. Aren't you? I suppose so, Bill said. Let's see if they know where we can find some bicycles. They wandered back to the group, where the conversation was winding down. It was our plane, Bill, Locke said. Dernier's thugs had talked their way inside the watchtower. They had them all captive. But when our plane appeared overhead, the zombies in the town woke. Some came to the house. Dernier's people fired. The shots summoned more. The house became surrounded. With the thugs distracted, Adriana had the opportunity to fight back. They took control of the top floor. Dernier's people were below. And you agreed a truce? Bill asked. Adriana spat on the ground. Starwind shrugged. You don't make a truce with Cavalli. Cavalli? Dernier's captain, Starwind said. Ah. Uh. Bill looked across the group, and then to the vehicles. I take it that you filled them in on what's happened. Then, could you ask where around here we'll find some bicycles? Chester and I are heading to the coast. We've got to reach our people. Starwind laughed. What's funny? Chester asked. Starwind shook her head, then climbed up onto the roof of the minibus. She reached down into the shielded roof rack and pulled out a fuel can. Here. I brought these from the watchtower. Help, she added, lowering the can. Chester took it. Diesel? he asked. For the Viking, Starwind said, reaching for another can. I'm not stupid. I knew that you weren't coming back to Cray. I know what you have to do. I would do the same. You aren't going to stop us? Bill asked. Starwind reached for a third fuel can. Adriana only recognized Cavalli and three others. The rest of the killers were strangers to her. No one in Cray was watching for our signal fire. No one watched for Adriana's. She lit her bonfire before she was captured. No one came to her aid. There is evil in Cray, and evil outside. I don't trust the helicopter pilot. I don't trust the assembly. I don't trust strangers. But you... I think I can trust you. She reached for another fuel can. No, I can trust that you will return for your three friends. Yes, we will need help. From where else will it come? Bill, Chester and Locke stood on the railway line, watching the minibus drive away. 
Do we have enough fuel to reach Dunkirk? Chester asked. I don't know, Bill said. Maybe. We can get more diesel at Sheppey, Chester said, if we can reach it. We'll have to find a boat first, Bill said. We won't reach Dunkirk today. Tomorrow, certainly. Hopefully. I'm more worried about ammunition, Locke said. They only had two magazines for my rifle. How much for that AK-47? Bill asked. About a hundred rounds, Chester said. My vote is for us avoiding all fighting for a while. Let's hope the zombies will oblige, Bill said. Food will be an issue. It always is. That stuff we scavenged in Kay won't last long. Foraging, Mr. Wright, Locke said. We shall look and the earth shall provide. Zombies, she added, coming from the west. A few more approaching from the north. That fire really is spreading. I would suggest we continue the discussion as we drive. They climbed into the cab. The engine roared into life. Chester leaned back. John Kirk, Sheppy, Belfast, he said. And hope we'll bump into a ship or fishing boat along the way. And then what? Anyone got any ideas how we rescue a thousand people from somewhere in the middle of France? Perhaps twenty-one thousand, Bill said. And the best I can think of is an airlift. At least in Belfast we're not too far from the international airport. We can repair some more of those helicopters that were left near there. Of course, we'll then need to bring them to the French coast. Before then we'll need to secure a landing site. But there's no point worrying about that until we know precisely where the convoy grinds to a halt. Assuming the pilot wasn't lying, Locke said. Assuming that, Bill said. There's an easy way of finding out. We're driving towards where she said the horde was. If we find it, we know she was telling the truth. If we don't find it, we'll know it's a trap. And if it is a trap, will we turn around? Locke asked. I don't think so, Bill said. What can we three do that Sergeant Khan can't? Either way, we've lost Cray, Chester said. Either the Horde will destroy it, or this convoy will capture it. That's what I reckon the pilot is up to. Get the French survivors out of the town, so that some other group can claim it. More fool them, Locke said. Since the professor was already planning their departure, she clearly doesn't think much of the island's long-term prospects. Nor do I, Bill said. You don't? Chester asked. I'm glad I saw Cray, Bill said. I truly am. Had I not seen it, it's exactly the type of settlement we'd have constructed in Belfast. In the spring, we would be reluctant to leave after putting in so much effort, but we would have no choice. Then, wherever we went, we'd have constructed something similar. We would have learned from our mistakes, yet not how great a mistake that type of settlement is. I thought it was impressive, Chester said. But not sustainable, Bill said. Not in the long term, nor is Belfast, or even Elysium. I see that now. Do you know somewhere that is? Locke asked. Or at least somewhere that is better. I believe so, Bill said. Where we live isn't as important as how. But there's only one place left that we can reach. Only one place that theoretically has the resources and infrastructure that will enable us to build a truly sustainable future. We have to stop living on old world supplies. We have to start looking beyond the spring to the next decade. We need to stop fighting to start farming. Yes, I'm glad I saw Cray, because in its collapse I can see the shape of our future, a future for all of humanity. No, where we live isn't as important as how but I think I know the answer to both. Good to know, Chester said, closing his eyes. Wake me up when we get there. To him, there was little point planning so far ahead. Dunkirk, Sheppey, Belfast. Rescue Scott, Amber, and Salmon. What happened next might well be out of their hands. Bill could make all the plans he wanted, but the Admiral had wanted to return to America. A crew would insist. They wouldn't leave the two marines behind, 
but one rescue flight might be all they were prepared to make, or they could manage. After that, he didn't know what he'd do, or where he'd go. What he did know was that in a week or three, he'd be reunited with Nilda. Wherever they went, they would go together. A memory swam to the forefront of his mind of the night of the wedding, the moment just before George's boat had appeared on the Thames. He and Nilda had stood on the tower's walls, not quite saying everything, but saying enough. It was the perfect memory to take him to sleep. To be continued. This has been Surviving the Evacuation, Book 14, Mort Vivant, written by Frank Tail, narrated by Tim Bruce. Copyright 2018 by Frank Tail. Production Copyright 2018 by Frank Tail. Audible hopes you have enjoyed this program.